The story begins in the year 2035. Advancements in technology led to the creation of the world of Connect. It was as realistic as the real world, with perfectly natural AI NPCs, fancy swordsmanship, and magic that players could only experience in-game. All of these elements attracted over a hundred million people to the world of Connect. Later, a large group of people lay dead in front of the gate, and a man screamed in pain as daggers struck him in the body. Then, the man fell to the ground, lifeless, in front of other onlookers who were observing Bidoyan, with the in-game name Crash. The men called Doan a bastard, and one of them urged the others to charge at him since he was alone. The man also shouted that Doan was the enemy of the Empire, and the men charged at him together to attack. However, Doan calmly looked at them, and the system displayed his rank as 13th and his class as psychokinetic. One of the men aimed an arrow at him while shouting for him to die, but he simply raised his two fingers and deflected the arrow, decapitating the man. The leader ordered his knights to fire their arrows, which they did, and the arrows flew toward Doan. He raised his hand to stop the arrows from getting closer to him, leaving the knights astonished that the arrows had stopped. Then, he hurled the arrows back at the knights, prompting the leader to order his knights to dodge, but unfortunately for the others, they were hit before they could evade. Doan rolled the dagger in his hand and gripped it tightly. He swiftly attacked the leader with it, causing the leader's neck to bleed. Then, he approached the remaining knights, who cursed him for his psychokinetic abilities and asked about his overpowered skill. However, one of the knights was horrified when he saw something above them, noticing the weapons suspended in the air. Doan aimed the weapons at them, making the knight curse, knowing what would happen next. Then, he lowered his hand, releasing the weapons, which flew directly at the knights. Afterward, he walked away, leaving bloody footprints, and entered the castle, leaving a trail of dead knights outside. He easily dispatched the guards inside the castle, and as he looked around, he wondered what it was. Then, he heard someone coughing beside him, and the Pope revealed that it was the end. Doan simply stared at the Pope's pendant, realizing it was what he had been searching for. The Pope told him that God had foretold the coming of saviors to that world. Doan raised his hand to grasp the Pope's necklace, but the Pope tightly held his hand, asking him why there were only fighters there, why he had brought chaos to the world, why he had burned the cities, killed the innocents, and enslaved the people there. Doan just grabbed the Pope's necklace, calling the Pope an old man and telling him not to blame him but to blame the guild that had colluded with the Empire. Then, he heard footsteps outside, causing him to curse as he realized that the guild's latecomers had arrived. He ascended the stairs, with the Pope warning him not to forget that everything would unfold as God had intended, and all of them would pay for what they had done. He faced the huge box with a hole in the center and slowly placed the pendant in the hole. A magical light appeared, and when the box accepted the pendant, it revealed an underground passage. He walked down, recalling the information from the intel, but his thoughts were interrupted when he saw a book and other objects floating in the purple light. He thought these must be the very first mythical items in Connect. He knew that five years ago, major guilds had colluded with the Empire and destroyed the world. Everything he had done for the last six months had been for this, and an NPC lamenting was nothing. He understood that the major guilds now controlled Connect, and he was the only solo player left in the top 100. He placed the items inside his inventory, thinking he should take them before the others arrived, as the guilds would be very upset if they found out he had obtained them first. Then he decided to leave but noticed something on the table and wondered if it was a game cartridge. He picked it up, wondering why it was there. Suddenly, a strong pressure emanated from the game cartridge, causing him to bend his knee slightly in pain and panic. He wondered if it was a connection error and what it meant. Then, he logged out immediately. He woke up in his room and sat up abruptly when he saw a stab wound near his chest, while someone told him to stop moving. He cursed in his mind, realizing that things were going too well for him. The man, along with other suited men, asked him why he was moving so much and told him to die peacefully. This made him think that they had gone too far in the real world, and he called them pieces of trash. One of the men in the group informed their president that they had captured Doyon and asked if he wanted them to bring him alive. When their president replied, the man said they understood. Another man asked what their president had said, and the man replied that they should kill Doyon because their president only wanted Doyon's head. Then the men grabbed him, telling him that he should have played at his level and asked if he thought he had something going for him just because he was good at a game and if nothing scared him after he gained some fame. He begged them not to kill him, but one of the men covered his face and raised a sharp blade to kill him. Then, the man stabbed him repeatedly, making him think that those men were crazed for killing people over a game, and he wondered if he was going to die like this. Suddenly, someone continuously called him sir in a panic, urging him to wake up. He panickedly sat up immediately in surprise. He looked at his hand in confusion and glanced around, wondering what had just happened, as he recalled dying after being stabbed. Suddenly, he heard someone in pain beside him, and the maid asked him if he was okay while addressing him as Raoul. He wondered who Raoul was but was more surprised to see a level status above the maid named Anna at level 3. 
Anna asked him if she should call a doctor because he had broken into a cold sweat. He was confused about what was happening and felt like he was witnessing something he shouldn't have been able to. Then, the system popped up a notification, indicating that the soul had settled in, activating Connect's closed beta system, and he could now use the user interface. The current number of users was one. He asked in panic if they were kidding him and realized that it meant he was inside the world of Connect. He walked onto his room balcony and realized that he could feel the wind and everything around him, which was very different from when he was linked with Crash. He knew that synchronization, the level of connection they had with Connect, determined their strength in the game. Normal players had around 30% synchronization, but he had close to 90%. He had managed to maintain his rank 1 position for 10 years until the major guilds appeared, but he understood that he no longer possessed that body. He felt unlucky because he had spent so much time leveling up that body. However, he remembered that it was a closed beta, and currently, there was only one user, making him wonder if he was the only one using that system in that world at the moment. He raised his hand and realized that he could still access his inventory even in the closed beta. He used his scan user's information, and the system showed that it detected locked user information and updated his data. The system rushed to provide him with the information, and he planned to use his knowledge and powers from his past life to climb to the top again. He endured the pain and saw that his current name was Raoul Ashton. He was the youngest son of the Ashtons, the fifth count of the Reuben Kingdom. Ashton County was the first to fall and connect. He recalled that Ashton County was one of Reuben Kingdom's orthodox families. The count and his eldest son had suddenly died, and the second son had gone missing. A coup had occurred after the youngest son inherited the county. During those disasters, the Forbidden Area's barrier had broken, leading to a failed attempt to stop the monster invasion. Now, he realized that he was the youngest son of that family, Raoul Ashton. He looked ahead and knew that the beautiful city he was seeing would be ruined in the next three years. He entered his room, thinking that he couldn't let it happen because he no longer had Bidoyan or Crash's life, meaning it was his last chance. He clenched his fist, knowing that he had suffered when he lived as Bidoyan. If he missed the chance to live there again, it would be too sad. He looked at the sword on the table, understanding that there was only one way to prevent the fall. He had to get stronger. He knew that a month later, Ashton Count's traditional coming-of-age ceremony would begin, and if he made it to the semi-finals, he could enter the Kingdom Academy to become stronger and protect his life. However, he suddenly collapsed on the floor, wondering why he felt so tired after just a few swings. Then, he saw that he was only at level 5, realizing that he was two levels behind the maid, and he knew he had to start training immediately for the upcoming tournament. A month later, the day of the tournament arrived, and he was amazed to see that many people were participating. He looked around, knowing that he had to fight against them. Then he remembered his coach telling him that it had only been 10 minutes, but he was exhausted. He thought it was due to the pain he had endured during the past month to get past the qualifiers. He glanced at the system, remembering that the last time he checked, he was at level 13, and he knew that his stamina was ready. He also had a plan for the matches, so he was confident that he would make it to the semi-finals. Suddenly, he felt an attack from behind, so he quickly avoided it, causing the attack to hit the ground instead. He was surprised to see a fist behind him, and the man apologized, saying his hand had slipped. The man called him a precious noble and asked if he was there for the tournament. He remembered that the man's name was Dion, and those men behind him were his cousins. Dion told him that he thought he would be crying in his room, but Raoul remained silent. Raoul realized that Dion was his cousin and that Dion had bullied him during swordsmanship training in the past. The instructor and the Count had allowed it because of the family motto that trained like it was real, treating everyone as equals on the training ground, and holding no one responsible for injuries during training. This meant that Dion was just a scoundrel who bullied anyone weaker than him. Dion told him that he should withdraw while he still could and warned that it wouldn't be just one bone broken this time. He'd break every single one in Raoul's body. Dion teasingly instructed his cousins to let Raoul pass, predicting that Raoul would cry again. Then Dion walked away laughing, leaving Raoul with a determination to crush him in the finals. Later, in Ashton's castle, the butler reported to the man that he was holding the report for the tournament that day. The man ordered the butler to hand it over to him and asked if there was anyone useful. The butler was about to reply when the man was surprised by the list and asked the butler where Raoul was. The butler replied that Raoul had gone back to his room after finishing his meal, thinking that Raoul had used up all his strength during the qualifiers. Count Melvin Ashton, Raoul's father, told the butler that he could leave. When Melvin saw the butler come out, he laughed loudly and proudly, saying that Raoul was his son because Raoul had truly made it and reached the group stage. Melvin had never forced Raoul to learn how to wield a sword because Raoul was weaker than his brothers. However, Raoul had started training a month before the tournament. At first, Raoul would fall down after just 10 minutes, but he never gave up. Melvin knew that Raoul had been bullied during training due to his weak body, but he also realized that if he helped Raoul, he would be shamed for being unable to do anything without his help. 
So, he had waited until Raoul stood up for himself, but Raoul's progress had exceeded his expectations. He decided that after the finals were over, he should go see Raoul. The day of the finals arrived, and the audience urged them to make it fun and stop dragging it out, encouraging them to end the match. The man cursed while wondering why the weakling in front of him wasn't falling, observing Raoul who was panting from exhaustion. The man attacked him continuously, but he managed to block each of the attacks. He did his best to avoid getting hit by the man's strikes, and the man grew increasingly frustrated that none of his attacks connected. In a fit of anger, the man launched a powerful attack, shouting at him to go down. He quickly slid backward to create some distance between them, leaving the onlookers in the audience horrified. Someone from the audience shouted that Raoul had endured the man's attacks multiple times and asked how much more he could take. Another voice chimed in, noting that Raoul had held out for quite a while, and someone encouraged Raoul, saying he had their support, which only angered the man further. The man swung his sword furiously at Raoul, calling him a rat and tell him that he can't ran away forever, but he parried the man's attack. The man swungs back his sword but Raoul parried it again while the man asks him if he's not ashamed as a member of a count's family. Raoul blocks the man's strikes with his own sword while teasingly remarking that he couldn't hear the man very well. He blocked another one of the man's attacks and then slid backward, creating distance between them. With his sword aimed at the man, Raoul prepared for the next move. One of the spectators addressed the man as Edmund, urging him to finish Raoul because the match had gone on long enough and he had wagered his salary on Edmund. Edmund became more serious and declared that he was done playing around. He unleashed his power, forming a mana sword, and warned Raoul that he was going to end it. The audience gasped in shock at the sight of the mana sword and warned Raoul that he had to dodge it, as getting hit would mean certain defeat. Edmund swung his water-powered skill toward Raoul, instructing him to die, but to his surprise, Raoul remained standing. Edmund wondered why Raoul isn't dodging the attack. Then, Edmund attacked Raoul, creating a loud explosion erupted in the center of the arena, leaving the audience stunned. As the smoke slowly dissipated, the referee stood in the center, stopping them. The referee announced to everyone that the match was over and Raoul was the winner. Half of the audience cheered for Raoul, while the other half couldn't believe that he had won. Edmund tossed his sword aside and walked toward Raoul, expressing disbelief and questioning how Raoul could be the winner. Edmund was about to explain that if the match hadn't been stopped, he would have won, but the referee interrupted him, calling him foolish and pointing out that if the match had continued, Edmund would be dead by now. Edmund realized that Raoul had not been standing still but had been aiming for his neck. In fear, Edmund collapsed to the ground, and Raoul approached him, mentioning that they would need to have a discussion about his disrespect toward the county after the tournament. Later, when he arrived at their castle, Anna respectfully told him to rest well. However, as soon as he heard the door shut behind him, he couldn't contain his excitement and shouted in happiness because he had actually won. He opened his status with a smile, and the system showed him an update. The level of Ashton's swordsmanship mastery had increased to beginner level 9. Proudly, he thought to himself that his plan had worked. Utilizing the game's feature where he gained more experience points and mastery by battling stronger opponents, he understood that fighting against a stronger opponent for a longer duration would yield more experience points. He clenched his fist, acknowledging that his plan had succeeded because his game mode granted him an experience multiplier for removing the revive option, known as hardcore mode with high risk and high return. He examined his status, realizing that he had complained but now saw that he was currently level 19 hardcore, with classes in sword and psychokinetic. His affiliation was Ashton County, and his title was Ashton County's youngest son. His attributes were as follows, Strength 22, Agility 25, Stamina 19, Intelligence 15, Willpower 34, Mana 29, Spiritual Power 35, and Senses 30. He possessed unique traits such as Psychokinetic Meister S+, plus, Royal Lineage A, and other unknown traits. He acknowledged that he wouldn't have been able to level up that much in a month if he had been in normal mode, but most importantly, he had five unique traits. He understood that Psychokinetic Meister was a trait that Bidoyan had, and Royal Lineage was a trait that Raoul possessed. He anticipated that the rest of his traits would unlock as he continued to level up. He decided to test these traits in his upcoming tournament matches. The tournament days arrived, and he won every match fairly and cleanly. The audience couldn't believe that the youngest son of Ashton had made it to the grand finale, wondering how it could be possible. Some speculated that he might be lucky or using some kind of trick, but he knows that early stage connect civilians were unaware of the player's powers. Upon returning to their castle, he contemplated keeping his ability to use psychokinesis a secret until the players showed up. He confidently believed that he could conceal it with his acting skills. However, someone knocked on his door, introducing himself as Ivan. He invited Ivan inside, and Ivan expressed concern about his well-being, asking if he was injured. He assured Ivan that he was perfectly fine, mentioning the presence of a priest and healer on standby. 
Ivan placed a hand on his shoulder, advising him not to let his guard down and reminding him that there were wounds that couldn't be healed. He acknowledged Ivan's genuine worry but noted that he wasn't accustomed to such feelings in his past life. He then asked Ivan about the matter he had inquired about. Ivan handed him a document, confirming that he had fulfilled his request. Ivan inquired if he was sure about it and was about to mention Dion. But he interrupted Ivan, telling him not to worry because he was confident he would win. Ivan respectfully bowed to him, expressing his trust, and then left the room. Ivan walked away, reflecting that Raoul's confidence resembled Melvin's when he was younger. However, he knew that the final opponent would be Dion, who brutally wounded his opponents. Meanwhile, he examined the document, contemplating its value as it was related to Ashton County's betting system, which supported participants in the tournament. Placing the document on the table, he believed that it was enough to secure his place in the family, and all that remained was to defeat Dion. The host's voice echoed, announcing the beginning of the final match. He faces Dion and the audience. Half cheered for him, telling him to win with his skills, and he got it. But the other half tells him to be ready to get shit on by Dion. Dion calls him a weakling and tells him that he doesn't know how he made it that far, but he'll make sure that he considers it his worst decision to come up there. Dion also tells him that with people cheering, he will soon find out how worthless he is, and it'll be a nice view when he starts crawling with his limbs cut off. But he just yawns in response and asks Dion if he is done stretching his tongue. Raoul clenched his fist in anger and released a powerful violet aura while calling him an arrogant fucker, making the audience shout that it was overwhelming mana, and that Raoul is no match for Dion. But he thinks Dion is acting all tough because he saw that Dion's level is 42 with the class of Expert Knight, which is a sword user. His affiliation is Austin by County, his title is Ashton by County's star and sword genius. Dion's stats are Potential Talent Grade B, Strength 52, Agility 41, Stamina 43, Intelligence 18, Willpower 14, Mana 32, and Senses 21, making him think that Dion's potential talent is only B, and Dion may look impressive now, but it was Dion's limit. The host shouted that the match had begun, and Dion angrily told him that he'd kill him, calling him a coward. But he just jumped toward Dion and appeared above Dion, making Dion surprised. Then he swung his sword down to attack Dion, but Dion blocked it. They both tried their hardest not to let their swords down first, but then he forcefully swung it down, making Dion slide back to avoid it. Dion angrily tells him that he is showing off, but he just keeps quiet, thinking that Dion's elasticity is below his expectations. They attack each other and block each other continuously, making him notice that Dion's strength is whatever. Dion angrily swung his sword toward him, but he dodged it in time, making Dion ask him why he hadn't hit him. He blocks Dion's sword, realizing that he can see Dion's sword clearly. Then he trips Dion using his feet, making Dion fall to the ground face first while he is busy thinking that a sword skill without any practical experience is called a generic nobleman's sword. He knows that Raoul was bullied by that Dion, while Dion asks him if he tripped him and releases his powerful aura again, telling him that he'll fucking kill him. But he calmly swings his body to the left, wondering if the only thing Dion knows is a mana sword with all that mana flowing through his body. The audience is shocked to see that he simply disarmed Dion's sword. Then he aimed his sword at Dion while releasing his blue and black aura and tells Dion that it was boring. He also tells Dion that he is really nothing after all, which makes Dion fume in anger and run toward him to attack. But he simply walks to the side and trips Dion once again, while telling him that he has anger issues and repeatedly falls for the same trick. Dion rolled around on the ground while he was calmly telling Dion to look at himself, and he was ashamed of County Austin's name. Dion once again ran toward him to attack, but he just powerfully punched Dion's face. Dion slowly fell and collapsed on the ground, making the audience unable to believe that Dion was down. Just like that, by Raoul. He tells the referee that the opponent is down and asks if he is going to continue the match. The referee shouts to everyone that the winner of the Ashton Coming of Age tournament was Raoul Ashton. Then the audience begins to shout to him that they believed in him and continuously shouted his name in celebration. He stumbled while thinking that he was happy he won, but he has awful stamina, making his people worried about him and immediately call a healer. Suddenly, the system popped up in front of him, showing him that the coming of age tournament quest had been completed and his rewards were experience points, 300 coins, and a random skill book, which is grade E or lower. Also, his extra rewards are experience points, 5 grade D stat points, and a random skill book, which is grade D or lower. The healers began to heal him while he was busy thinking that now he can make it to the Kingdom Academy. Ivan told Melvin that he was so proud of their young master and that Raoul had grown that much in a month. But Melvin just kept quiet, noticing that Raoul had played around with Dion. And if Raoul really got that far in a month, Raoul was a genius. But then Melvin's thoughts were interrupted when Raoul saw him. He called his father and waved hi to his father, thinking that Melvin was watching and Melvin probably knew that he was good enough to go to the academy now. But Melvin just silently looked at him, 
Later, in the castle, Melvin tells him that he can't allow it, making him surprised and asking why. Then he tells Melvin that he thought he could go as long as he made it to the semi-finals, but Melvin tells him that it was situational and from what he saw, he needed to stay by his side longer. Melvin also tells him that he fell after the match, so he should stay there a little longer, but he continues by telling his father that he learned about the sword as a lifelong journey. Then he asks his father if he doesn't always say it. Then he confidently tells Melvin that he is trying to go to the academy to learn more, just like he said, so he can't stop him, making Melvin stunned in surprise. But then Melvin smiles, realizing that Raoul has really grown. Then Melvin stands up while telling him, okay, if you really want to go, you'll have to get past me. Then Melvin released his strong aura while aiming his sword at him and telling him that he won't go easy on him. Then he asks him, what are you going to do now? A month later, a lot of knights were behind the carriage, and inside the carriage. He was glad that he was finally out. Then he remembered that when his father stopped him, he accepted it and confidently told his father that it was his choice. He charged at Melvin, but Melvin teasingly asked him if it was all he had. Then Melvin swung his sword away and released a more powerful aura while telling him that he'll show him a real sword skill. He then passed out from Melvin's strike. Melvin told him that it was just a sneak peek of what he had but he knew that it was definitely Melvin's full strength. Then he remembered that Melvin's powerful fifth county lord died by the time the world of Connect started, and after that, the county fell quickly. So, in order to stop the fall, his father had to stay alive, and he would have to meet Melvin's expectations since he left him to leave. He swore that he would get stronger and protect his family because he couldn't lose it all. On the other hand, in the castle, Melvin was looking at him leaving and calling his name, remembering that in the training ground, he asked Raoul how many times he had tried and told him to give up. But Raoul replied that he'll never give up. He smiled while telling Raoul that he'll compliment his persistence because it was worthy of the Ashton family's dignity. Raoul raised his sword and ran toward him while he was telling Raoul to strike him, but as he was about to block it, he noticed that the trajectory of Raoul's sword changed midway, making him get hit a little in the face. Raoul was frustrated that he could only leave a small wound even with psychokinesis, but then Melvin smilingly told Raoul that he guessed it was about time to admit that Raoul was no longer a kid, and that Raoul was a proud swordsman, so he told Raoul to go, go and witness the world. Later, they stopped in the forest to rest, and he asked Philip how far they were from the destination. Philip, who was 42 years old at level 92 with a class of high knights and affiliations with Ashton County and the Golden Bear Order, with the title of Sword Breaker and potential talent grade S, Strength 82, Agility 76, Stamina 81, Intelligence 68, Willpower 77, Mana 76, and Senses 73, as well as unique traits including the strength of an ogre, skilled commander, and sword obsession, replied that at that speed, they would make it in five days and asked him if they should move faster. He replied that they needed to train the soldiers as well, so they should keep going at that speed, to which Philip replied that he understood. He thought that including him and his servants, his family had selected a total of 50 people. Of those, there were three regular knights, including Philip, six trainee knights, 15 trainees, and 20 cavalry. Also, all of them had grade B or higher potential talent. He knew that the number and skill levels weren't bad, and in order to stop the fall, they had to get stronger. A man named Jake told him that the maintenance for the carriage was done and they could get going whenever, to which he praised Jake for his good work. Jake asked them if they needed to bring that many people to that place for a month, but Philip told Jake to stop questioning their young master's order. Then he told Jake that he would know when they got there, leaving Jake more confused. But he knew the reason he was taking them to the free city, Mera, was because it was one of the first cities that players go to after finishing the tutorial. That city had many quests, hidden items, and mana usage limitations to prevent the unreasonable massacre of beginner players. Most of all, the resources were infinite, so the players went crazy about that place. God's Domain was a place full of monsters for players to grind. And God's Domain was the reason why Raoul brought everyone to that city. He brought the knights to the grinding zone to level them up faster. He thought it was a perfect plan when the system popped up, showing him that the system had been updated. A new feature, Connect Community, had been unlocked, a new category, Guild, had been unlocked, and a new quest starting line, Adventure, and Skill Collector had been registered, amazing him because a new quest appeared as soon as he entered Mira. He thought he wouldn't be able to use any other features until the official launch but he guessed maybe he could unlock more features if he met the requirements. Someone knocked on his carriage door, and Jake told him that he could meet the mayor right now. 
Then he was asked what he would like to do, and he replied that, of course, he'd meet the mayor. Meanwhile, in the main castle, the mayor of the free city, Mira, Reynaldo, asked who was there, and his butler replied that the youngest son of County Ashton, Raul Ashton, had come to visit with 50 of his people. Reynaldo asked his butler if he meant the third son who was known for being weak and asked what Raul was there for, suggesting it might be for the fresh air. Then he ordered his butler to let them in because Raul's family made good money off monster materials, and he'd extract some money from Raul. The butler replied that he understood. A moment later, someone opened the door and he gracefully greeted Reynaldo. Reynaldo warmly welcomed him and told him that he sincerely welcomed him to the free city, Mira. He shook Reynaldo's hand while thanking him, and Reynaldo told him to sit over there and talk. However, he thought Reynaldo was insincere and noticed an obvious fake smile on his face. Reynaldo asked him what had brought him to Mira, and he replied that he had heard there was an excellent place to train there. Reynaldo told him that, of course, there was, and he had come to the perfect place because Mira was the safest place to train. But he told Reynaldo that it couldn't be an ordinary place, and he would like to be permitted to enter the cursed forest, which shocked Reynaldo. Reynaldo told him that it was too dangerous, especially for a weakling but then clarified that he meant it was for younger people. He replied that it was as he expected, and he guessed he had no choice but to throw away the 500,000 gold that he was going to give Reynaldo as a gratuity in the river, which left Reynaldo even more shocked to see 500,000 gold in front of him. Reynaldo immediately grabbed the bag of gold in his hand and told him that he was joking, explaining that the cursed forest would indeed be easy for him and his knights. He would give him permission to enter the forest. He smiled and told Reynaldo that he knew a generous mayor like him would permit them. He knew that the only thing left for him to do was grind and take all the rewards, so he'd be at the top of Connect soon. The knight arrived at the free city, Mira, and he was walking in the street with Jake and Philip. He was thinking that Mira was a place built for Connect players to live in, but there were no players there since it was a closed beta, except for him, Raul Ashton, and because of it, the city was going through a crisis. He knew that there were many accommodations, large stores, larger guild buildings, and other facilities that were disproportionate to the number of people living there, and the land prices dropped because of all of it. But his real purpose for coming there was real estate. He thought that if he took over cheap lands in Mira, sooner or later, they'd be used to build luxury houses for nobles, guild houses for players, and apartments for normal players to live in. Also, in the future, those lands would cost more than 100 times what they are now. He also knew that once the players came in and war broke out as it did in the past that he remembered, Mira, the city blessed by the gods, would become a perfect shelter. He remembered that in the past, they could make money by just lending land. But he thought it was still not enough because considering the upcoming war and potential risks, he had to be even more prepared. Then he told the powerful major guilds that he couldn't do anything against their financial prowess in his past life, but this time would be different. Later, Jake, sweating, asked him if he just had to sign right there and called his name while he was looking at Jake pissed. Then he angrily told Jake that everyone had signed except him and ordered him to just sign it, but Jake told him that his mother told him to be careful when signing papers. In the end, the lady put the documents together and told them that including him, a total of 51 had registered for the guild first. He thought that he had created the first guild in a world without players and the very first and most advanced guild. He looked at his people, knowing that they would get assistance from the system as members of the guild, and he was excited to see the confused look on their faces, while Jake was on the side, thinking that his mother was going to kill him. Later, in the Battle Association Mira branch office, he shouted that he was next. The lady welcomed him and asked how she could help him. He replied that he was there to see some skill books and asked the lady what the highest rank they had was. A skill book is a book with different skills written in them, and if they read carefully, they can learn the skill. The skills rank from F to S. The lady replied that their branch office offered up to rank C skill books, but rank C skill books could only be purchased by VIP customers. He asked the lady what the requirements were to be a VIP, and she replied that it could be achieved either through contributions to the association through quests or by making significant purchases. However, for stacking up purchases, he'd have to spend a lot. He asked the lady how much it was, and she replied that it was 10,000 gold. He placed the bag of gold on the table while telling the lady that it was not much and asked if he could see the D-rank ones first. The lady happily asked him which line of skill books he would like to see first, whether it was sword, bow, magic, or shield. He smiled and replied that he wanted to see all of them. Later, Jake panted and said that it was too heavy, asking him if they really needed all those books, as they were all holding a swarm of books. He replied that he might think it was a bother now, but those books would advance them to a higher level. Jake told him that he guessed they were well descriptive skill books, but asked him if they couldn't only train through books at the beginner level. Philip agreed with Jake, saying they could have bought power armor with the money spent on those books, but he assured them not to worry and to be patient, as they would know tomorrow. 
A moment later, he arrived at his apartment room and looked at the swarm of books in front of him, realizing that maybe it was too much. He knew that there were limits on the number of skills players could use. So normally, players couldn't use various skills. Then he opened his quest window, remembering that when he woke up in Raoul's body, there were two unknown items in the inventory, making him wonder what those items were. He had tried to open them, but he couldn't click on them or use them. However, yesterday, when he got the quest, he was finally able to use those items. He opened his inventory and found out that one of them was the sealed skill decks, making him guess that maybe the reward for that quest was the activation of the skill decks. Looking at the system, he saw that the quest collector had an unknown grade and a description telling him to collect at least 10 skill books and register them in the skill decks, with extra rewards depending on the type of skill books. His reward for completing it was skill decks activation, and his extra reward was unlocking traits and acquiring skills. He immediately grabbed some of the books, realizing that he had to open the decks and hold the skill book. Then he saw the register and the decks book began to move on its own, surprising him. A strong purple light came out of it and flew directly into the other book. Words came out of the decks book, making him let go of the other book he was holding, unable to believe that it worked. Then he noticed that the sliver of mana in the book was gone, and it was going to take forever to do them all, wondering if there was a way to register them all at once. Suddenly, the books flew up in mid-air, shocking him. A strong purple light once again came out of the decks book and flew toward the books in mid-air. Then the books began to fall on the ground when it was done. He flipped the decks book's pages, wondering if it understood what he said, and couldn't believe that it actually worked. The system showed him that he had completed the quest, so his skill decks, which was rare, had been activated. For his extra reward, his trait skill collector, which was X, had been unlocked, and copycats, which were S, had been acquired. He clicked the skill collector and saw that its effect was to activate the skill decks, while the skill copycat slightly increased the chance of acquiring skills from the skill book. He then clicked on copycat and saw that its mastery was at beginner level 3. Its effect was to steal skills from the examined opponent, with examined skills being registered in the decks. As mastery went up, he could acquire higher ranked skills, and the power of the skill increased. He thought it was overpowered because he could steal and use someone else's skill. Then the system showed him that the skill dex was of a rare grade, and its status was upgradable and bounded. Its description stated that it was a replica of the mythic item skill dex that held records of ancient skills. These records would reset when crossing dimensions, and the dex would regain its true power after achieving special requirements. Currently, it recorded 525 skills. He knew it was the mythical item he had received right before he died. Some parts of his past life, like his psychokinesis trait and items, came with him, but his skills were reset, and this was a replica too. He also noticed that the only thing left in his inventory unknown was the three grade X traits and one item, making him wonder what kind of power it held. The next day, the knights were shocked to see the system and panically asked what the status window was and what the thing called guild chat was. They shouted that they needed to go see a priest. On the other hand, the butler welcomed him, and he stared at the butler with his sleepy eyes. He couldn't sleep all night because he was reading through the skill decks. He greeted Bernard and asked if he had explained it to them, to which Bernard replied that he had explained as instructed. He excitedly asked Bernard about the skill book and if he had tried it, to which Bernard nodded in agreement. He knew that Bernard was a servant of the Ashton family and Ivan's stepson. Bernard had been working for the county from a young age and was taught by Ivan himself. Bernard had a great memory and got things done quickly, but there was another reason why he had chosen Bernard. Then Bernard released wind from his hand, making him exclaim that it was amazing. He told Bernard that he knew he could do it, realizing that Bernard had the power to control the wind. Bernard gracefully replied that he was flattered. The system showed him that Bernard was 27 years old, at level 21, with classes in Servant, Beginner, and Windwalker. Bernard's affiliations were Ashton County and the First Guild. His talents included administration, management, and wind power. His potential talent was grade A, with stats including 17 for strength, 18 for agility, 24 for stamina, 53 for intelligence, 46 for willpower, 23 for spiritual power, and 41 for senses. His unique traits were sharp manager, cold-headed, and like the wind. He knew that Bernard might lack in certain stats, but he had great talent for being a servant or in a spur. He was done with his preparations, so he told Bernard to get ready. Bernard confusedly asked him for what, and he replied that they were leaving as soon as the knights were used to it, heading to God's Domain, the Cursed Forest. 
later, in the cursed forest, an ogre launched its axe to attack him, and it broke the ground in the process. However, he dodged it and told the ogre that it was too slow. Then he launched his fist, but before his fist hit the ogre's head, it exploded. He got down on the ground at the same time the ogre's body collapsed and told the others to come out already. Then a swarm of ogres came out from hiding and shouted that he was a strong human and they should kill him. The leader of the ogres called everyone and ordered them to charge, which the ogres did, running toward him to attack at the same time. But he just positioned himself and told them to bring it on. The cursed forest, God's domain, and, to be specific, God's domain isn't just a grinding zone. It stands for the entire city of Mira because if players get hurt, they get healed, and if players die, they revive in that blessed city, which is why that city is the best shelter. Also, in the forest, the blessing only applies to monsters, so the number of monsters stays the same even after they are killed. Humans can't be revived in the cursed forest and can't walk outside the forest with the items they get from hunting monsters because if they take them outside, the items turn into ashes and disappear. This means that they are not supposed to touch the property of the gods. However, it only applies to civilians. Players can take items they get from monsters outside the forest with the system's assistance. Philip asks Jake why he is talking when their young master is the one fighting them all. On the other hand, he was busy fighting the ogres, and when the leader was the only one left, it asks him what is that power. But he just raises the weapons on the ground with his power and asks the leader if it meant that power. The leader was shocked to see the weapons flying straight to him, and the leader got cut into pieces by them. Then he tells it that it was called psychokinesis, together with Jake. Jake tells him that it is a convenient ability, but Philip tells Jake to stop talking and keep skinning the ogres. Jake sighed and said that he didn't come all the way to Mira to do that, and explained that he guessed they had made good progress from that training. Jake calls him while he is busy collecting the blood of the ogres, and he laughingly thanks them and tells them that it was possible because of everyone's help. All of them could get stronger by studying the skill books, to which Philip thinks that Raoul was right and remembers that he was swinging his dagger forward and used the Hanjutsuzen skill to attack the ogre, making the ogre cut in half. Raoul asked him how is it and explained to him that it was why he brought skill books instead of power armor, to which he replied that it was amazing. Philip knows that he learned a skill so quickly and wonders how Raoul found out about that strange ability. But then the system showed him the guild chat, and he was surprised to read a chat from someone. Then he immediately tells Raoul to look at the guild chat, but when he looks at Raoul, he fumes in anger while telling him that he saw it too and they are going back to Mira now. Meanwhile, in Mira, at their apartment, someone pointed a sword at one of Raoul's men and said that he should have done it earlier. Then the man stabbed Raoul's man with the sword, saying that it was hard holding himself back after seeing Ashton's kids walking around. Another man, holding a bloody sword, called the man's brother, telling him that they should have listened to him earlier, then they could have done it way sooner while stabbing another of Raoul's men. One of Raoul's men asked the men why they were doing it, but another man just slashed Raoul's man with the sword while asking his brother if their great-grandfather didn't tell them to be mindful, and reminded them that they were all there because they had made a scene. The man named Ramon was Randall Viscounty's first son, the man named Jerry was Randall Viscounty's second son, and the man named Kale was Randall Viscounty's third son. Raoul's man, who was on the ground, told Ramon that they would regret it. But before the man could finish his words, Ramon stabbed him and pulled out the sword immediately, making the man shout in pain. Ramon continuously stabbed the man while laughing, telling him to tell Raoul to hurry up because they also had some business with their young master. Then Ramon said that it was strange that they kept reviving while looking at the man who was healing on the ground and calling them bastards. Jerry laughingly told his brothers that they should take care of that Raoul kid like that. But Kale told Jerry that he thought noble families weren't supposed to point swords at each other in the free city. Ramon just asked Kale what was the matter when they could just say they never did it and what were they going to do about it. Ramon also told his brothers that if they thought about it, it was good, and they could just crush the Ashton family. Then Ramon excitedly turned to his brothers, saying that maybe their great-grandfather would even compliment them. However, as Ashton's head exploded into pieces, Kale called his brothers in shock. They looked back and saw Raoul asking them how dare they, and telling them that it was an offense towards Ashton County, so they would have to pay back with more than just worthless deaths. The brothers looked at him in surprise, and Jerry asked him if he was crazy and how dare he touch a son of the Randall family. Then Kale asked what the knights were doing and how Raoul even got there. One of the knights, who had a sword pointed at his neck, fearfully replied that they thought they were the Ashton family's main force, while Philip and Jake pointed their swords at them. Philip reported to him that they had surrounded the Randall knights as he ordered and made sure there were no civilians nearby. Bernard and Jake stood silently, looking at the enemy. He praised them for their good work and used his psychokinesis to grab his injured men from the ground and slowly lifted them up in mid-air. Then he ordered Bernard to take them to the shrine, to which Bernard respectfully agreed. 
He then opened his inventory and pulled out his sword, telling them that he would clean up the garbage himself. He knew that Randall by County was similar to Ashton County, they were one of the five warrior families of the Reuben Kingdom. However, unlike the Ashton family, the Randall family didn't have a long history, and the four warrior families were reorganized into the five warrior families when the current lord of the family, Viscount Hudson D. Randall, reached the Swordmaster stage. As a family with a short history, they had to figure out various ways to ensure their place. They consistently produced great knights, made respectable contributions, and crushed their opponents. The opponent they had targeted was the Ashton County, which had lost its power since it hadn't produced a Swordmaster in a long time. There were no risks in agitating them since the Ashton family was the least politically inclined. Many conflicts between these two families across the kingdom were mostly started by the Randall family, and everyone expected Randall Viscounty to win, given their numerous sword masters. So, the people of Randall thought the same would happen here. Jerry, who was looking at him, wondered about that unusual strength and noticed that he had pulled a sword out of the air. The knight behind him, who had a sword pointed at him by Philip, looked at him and slowly grabbed the sword. However, he felt it in time and turned around, swinging his sword and hitting the knight, making the knight shout in pain. The Randall knights were shocked to see it, and Jake put his sword back in the sheath, saying that their young master said he would take care of them himself and ordered his men to put down their swords. One of Randall's strong knights noticed that they were really putting away their swords and wondered if they were insane because he thought it was better for them. Kale furiously ran toward him, asking if he was going to fight them by himself and swung his huge mace backward to gain force. He told him that it wasn't training, but then a sharp sword slash flew toward Kale, and Kale got cut in half before he could attack, making Kale shout in pain, and Jerry called Kale's name in worry. Jerry called their knights bastards and asked them why they were just standing there. The leader made a frustrated sound and slowly pulled his sword, saying that he guessed he had to act. He explained that he had hesitated because he didn't want to bully a 15-year-old kid, but when his comrades were going down, it wasn't right. The system displayed the man's name as Jeremy, a 37-year-old man, level 65 with the class of leader of guard knights and beginner sword expert. His affiliations were Randall Viscounty and Randall Knights. His potential talent was grade B, his strength was 66, his agility was 72, his stamina was 68, his intelligence was 48, his willpower was 63, his mana was 70, his senses were 55, and his unique trait was brutality, graded as C. Then the other knights also raised their swords at him. He knew that Jeremy was the Randall family's main weapon, called the rapier, and he guessed that the men were the elites. Jeremy and the knights were aiming their swords at him. He knew that Jeremy's level was 65, and the other elites were each at level 60. However, his current level was 45, so he couldn't win against them normally. One of the knights asked him why he didn't stop now because he thought he had done enough. The other knight told him that they had let him be, but no more. He didn't care even if he was a young master, but he suddenly appeared in front of the knight, surprising him. He then slashed the knight's body, tightly grabbing his sword and raising it backward to gain force. He uses his bear aura and attacked them with his bear strike skill. One of the knights asked him what he was doing, but he just slashed the man's stomach, making the man bleed and shout in pain. Then Jeremy jumped toward him, appearing right in front of him to attack, surprising him. However, he managed to block Jeremy's attack in time, getting pushed back because of it. Jeremy asked his man if he was okay, and the man fearfully replied that he was fine. Jeremy couldn't believe that two of his elites went down so easily. He remembered that he had heard Raoul was weak and didn't know how to wield a sword. Then Jeremy pulled out his other weapon and told him that he was different from the rumors, so he'd have to get serious now. He pointed his sword at Jeremy and told him to bring it on. He looked at Jeremy and noticed that Jeremy was holding a parrying dagger and a rapier, making him wonder if Jeremy was using Randall Viscounty's sword skill called Shooting Star. Jeremy smiled and told him that he liked his bravery and asked if he knew that every wound healed in Mira. Then he told him that he couldn't fight them all alone. However, he just told Jeremy that he thought he was the one confused and bet that he and his knights hadn't even trained since arriving in Mira, making Jeremy surprised and asking how he knew it. He told Jeremy that those soldiers over there, shaking in their boots even after their wounds had healed, were living proof that they were not used to death. Jeremy pointed his weapons toward him, thinking that he didn't just know about combat, but could see through everything, which meant he was a threat. He ordered his man to cover him from the back, and the man told Jeremy to leave it to him. Then Jeremy jumped and launched his sword toward him. He covered himself with his sword, and Jeremy, with his man, continuously attacked him, slashing his face, arm, and every part of his body. The man saw an opening and ran forward to attack him, making Jeremy surprised and shouting to his man to stop. But he swung his sword forward, and the man got cut in half. Jeremy called his man a fool, but he knew there was no time to waste, so he used his Randall sword vision skill and activated the shooting star skill, making him surprised for a second. 
but then he blocked himself with his sword, mentally telling Jeremy to bring it on. Jeremy continuously attacked him with Shooting Star, a powerful skill known for its 1v1 combat prowess. He noticed that he was struggling even with Psychokinesis, but he knew he had to keep up, wondering how when he was definitely dominating that fight. He planned to press Jeremy all the way back, glaring at Jeremy, making Jeremy pissed and shouting, asking him what was up with his arrogant eyes. But he just replied, 100%, making Jeremy confusedly ask him what he meant. Then he swung his sword forward, making Jeremy throw his weapons in the air, and Jeremy immediately looked up to see his weapons. He pierced his sword into the ground, and the system showed him that his opponent's skill examination had been 100% completed, and the copycat was ready for use. Then the system showed him to copy the exact moves using the copy cat to engrave the skill into the decks. He used his psychokinesis to grab Jeremy's weapons in the air, making Jeremy surprised. Then the weapons flew directly into his hands, while the system showed him to activate the copycat Randall Sword Skill Shooting Star, Grade B. He angrily activated it while pointing the weapons at Jeremy, and the Shooting Star skill attacked Jeremy in return, making Jeremy shockingly ask how he did it, knowing that it was definitely Shooting Star. Jeremy covered the attack with his arms in pain, shouting and asking who had betrayed them and taught Raoul that sword skill while being continuously hit by the Shooting Star skill. Suddenly, he appeared beneath Jeremy and told him that he taught him himself, making Jeremy confusedly ask what he meant. However, he just stabbed Jeremy in the side and pulled it out, making Jeremy kneel on the ground. The system showed him that he had received a rank S bonus called Randall Sword Skill Shooting Star Grade B Mastery, leveling up to Intermediate Level 1. He had successfully engraved Randall Sword Skill Shooting Star Grade B into the skill decks. It also told him to equip the skill in the skill deck selection slot to use Randall Sword Skill Shooting Star Grade B continuously. He looked at Jeremy, thinking that it was over and that using the rank S skill copycat was hard since it was overpowered. He knew that Copycat was a skill he learned with the skill decks that copied the opponent's skill, but it could only copy one skill at a time, and he couldn't lose sight of the target once the skill was activated. If he lost sight of the target, the examination rate would reset, which was why he didn't even blink when he was taking Jeremy's attacks. It was also impossible to steal a skill unless it was a one-on-one -on -one fight. He opened his display skill, and the system showed him that his default skill slots were 1. Ashton Vision Sword Skill Bear Crush, which was grade A plus at intermediate level 2. 2. Psychokinesis, which was grade S at intermediate level 2. 3. Ashton Mind Skill, which was grade A at intermediate level 1. 4. Copycat, which was grade S at beginner level 6 and 5. Basic Meditation, which was grade E at beginner level 8. Then his skill deck select slots were Flash and Shield, which were both grade C at beginner level 6. Finally, his skill deck's random slot was Iron Fist, grade D at intermediate level 1. He was grateful for his skill decks because he could use three more skills, and the selection slots allowed him to freely use two skills registered in the skill decks. He decided to use it there, but then he heard something by his side, making him look there in confusion. Jerry fearfully asked him who he was and how he used the Randall Sword skill. However, he just told Jerry that he was still there because he had forgotten about him. He ordered Philip to kill them every time they revived for an hour, to which Philip respectfully agreed and asked his men if they had heard their young master. He ordered them to kill them, to which his men immediately agreed. Jerry begged Philip for forgiveness in fear, but he just stared at them, thinking that it was blood for blood. Then the enemy screamed in pain while he was thinking that it wasn't Earth or a game, but the reality that had been presented to him. He knew that he had to do everything to not lose it again, even if that meant wading through a pool of blood. He was determined not to lose. On the other hand, Reynaldo, who was watching everything from a distance, wondered what in the world was going on right now. He remembered that according to the plan, when those Randall Viconis guys attacked that bastard Raul, he was supposed to get his share after mobilizing the guards to help. However, Raul beat up 15 knights on his own. Suddenly, Raul looked in his direction, making him bend down in panic, and he wondered how Raul found out he was there. Reynaldo also wondered if Raul wasn't just a rich and good-looking pushover. He contemplated if, by any chance, Raul had hidden a swordmaster of the county because if that were the case, Raul must have figured out all his plans as well. He calmed himself down and thought that he'd have to be friendly with the Ashton County in the future. A few minutes later, he was in his room, thinking that he had overdone it a bit. But those rewards were pretty good. While looking at the system showing him the results for his sudden quest, Rival Family Challenge, he saw that his rescue and punishment were complete. So, he received a reward of experience points, 30,000 coins, and a random B-grade skill book draw ticket. On top of that, 
he received about 5,000 gold, a space-expanding magic bag capable of holding a carriage's worth of luggage, and a unique grade rapier and main ghost set from those Randall County scoundrels. He grabbed the ticket, remarking that the B-grade skill book draw ticket was especially nice, and wondered if he had received all flunks from the tournament skill book rewards because even thinking about it now was ridiculous. He placed the ticket on the table and expressed that he didn't need something amazing but at least it should be a mid-tier one this time. Then, he broke the ticket in half while praying that it wasn't a flunk. The ticket released a bright light, and he was surprised to see that he had acquired a skill book called Rivera Spearmanship Grade B, which made him shout in happiness. He knew that spearmanship was a necessary skill in his next destination, the capital, and told himself that his luck was following him. Then he thought that there was only one more important thing he had to do in Miranal, and he had to invest one month there for it, but he swore that he would make sure to succeed. A week later, he was in the forest, launching his sword and attacking the ogre in front of him. He wiped his sweat while the system showed him that he had leveled up, reaching level 51. Additionally, he had achieved the level necessary for promotion, so he needed to decide on the possible promotion. Then the system showed him that it confirmed his job as a sword user and as a beginner psychokinetic. Also, his proficiency in job-related skills, including Ashton family hereditary swordsmanship, Randall swordmanship, and psychokinetic, had increased to mid-level 2. He had satisfied the promotion requirements, so his job sword user had changed into sword expert, and his beginner psychokinetic had changed into intermediate psychokinetic. Philip tells him that it's amazing, and Jake tells him that it's awesome because he became a sword expert at 15 years old. He raises his hand in the air, causing the stones on the ground to begin floating. Then he swings his hand forward while shouting, go, and the stones strike the huge tree in front of him, causing it to explode into pieces. Next, he pulls out his sword, leaps forward, and activates his bear strike, hitting the ground with it, causing the ground to shatter into pieces. He looks at the cracked, destroyed ground and asks his men if it should be like this. Philip tells him that it was wonderful, as he expected from their young master, and Jake playfully asks him if he can now do it without them. Then Jake suggests that they should take a breather and relax, but Philip tightly grabs Jake's ear and asks him what he means by relax. He tells Jake that he should think about how much he has to sleep to catch up with Raoul. Jake shouts that it was just a joke and laughs, telling Philip that since their young master has worked so hard, he was just suggesting that they can take it easy. Philip insists that Jake was all talk, making him awkwardly laugh. Then, he tells Jake that regardless of whether it was a joke or not, he doesn't plan on taking a break yet. Philip asks him what he would like to do, and Jake suggests they contact the family because Count Melvin would be thrilled. He replies that he'll tell his family himself later and suggests they keep it a secret between them for the time being, to which they both agree. He knows that he has hunted enough monsters and leveled up sufficiently. Meanwhile, Philip angrily tells Jake to watch his words, making Jake pout and ask Philip what he means. He also realizes that he has set all the bait, and now all that remains is for the prey to take it. He tells them that they should go back now, to which they both agree. Then, they walk away while urging the dogs of the Empire to hurry up and move, in his mind. Meanwhile, in the streets of Mira, bustling with people, a lady named Nakia, an alchemist, stretches her body, saying that it marks the end of today's work. She notices that the potions are very popular these days and wonders if it's all thanks to the Ashton County who brought them there. She knows that in order to produce potions, monster by products are needed, and as monsters rarely appear in the cursed forest, she wasn't able to easily obtain them all this time. But thanks to the Ashton County's people who started bringing the monster by products, she has been able to produce potions every day. Not only that, but the county's people stop by the village shop every morning, asking if anything had happened throughout the night, inquiring if she needed anything, and checking on her well-being in general. She steps out of the store and thinks that Raoul is a bit strange, but she is grateful to him, and Raoul is good-looking too. She slaps her face in shyness, asking herself what she is thinking, and tells herself to get it together because Raoul is just 15 years old and is 8 years younger than her. Also, Raoul is a noble, which makes the people around her look at her strangely. A moment later, she arrives at her house, happily opens the door, and calls out to someone named Nikki, telling her that her sister is back. However, no one answers, causing her to worry. She looks around and calls Nikki again but then notices something that fills her with fear. She sees a letter on the bed, pierced by a knife. She reads the letter, which tells her that they have taken her little sister and that if she wants to save her, she shouldn't tell anyone about it and should wait for further instructions. This makes her cry and worry while saying no. Then, she immediately ran out while crying, knowing that Nikki's life would be in danger if she went outside the city. She had heard about many reports of kidnappings, which the city government claimed to be investigating, 
but she never thought the rumors were true. She wondered where she should go when she couldn't go to the city government. She realized there was a chance that the kidnappers were watching her, and the guards wouldn't even bother going outside the city even if she told them. Also, if she asked the mercenaries of the Adventurer Guild, it would take a while for them to act, making her wonder what she should do. Then, she remembered Raoul telling her that if she ever found herself in trouble, she should come find him. She knew it was her only option, so she ran away quickly, determined to go see Raoul. Meanwhile, in an apartment, the system showed him that Nakia was heading toward him, making him think that it had come to this. He ordered everyone to get into their positions, stay on their targets, and report any changes, to which all his men replied with a swift yes. He opened his access to the Connect community and clicked the link to the cafe. He knew it was a premium member-only information cafe that he had run in his past life. Since he was a star player, he could get useful information from his fans and informants. As a result, the cafe became an information treasury that held almost every hidden piece of information in Connect. He thought he had hit the jackpot when he saw that the cafe still existed. He knew he could use it instead of relying on his uncertain memories to plan better. He searched for the link to the free city, Mira, and the system showed him that the search result was a quest starting point at South Mira NPC. He was confident that he had checked every quest he could possibly take, so now he had to hope everything went as planned. One of his men reported to him that Nakia was there, making him wonder if he could change Nakia's future. He shyly ordered his men to treat her politely. He knew that Nakia, the crazy alchemist, blood-hungry witch, and taboo destroyer, was a subject of fear for everyone. She didn't hesitate to conduct experiments on humans for her revenge against the Empire, and the Empire was the main target of her chemical weapons. However, many innocent civilians also got involved. But Nakia was now just a desperate girl asking him for help. He put his hand on her shoulder, telling her to calm down and assuring her that Nikki would be fine. He promised to help, so she should explain what had happened. Nakia told him that her sister had been kidnapped, and Nikki should have been home two hours ago since the lady next door was taking care of her. She begged him to find her sister because Nikki was just a poor kid, and it was all her fault. He told her not to worry and swore that he would make sure they found Nikki because he believed he knew where Nikki was, leaving her shocked and begging him to save Nikki. He assured her that he would let her know as soon as he found Nikki, so she should stay there, and Bernard would help her. Bernard gracefully told her to inform him if she needed anything, emphasizing that she had made an excellent choice because their young master always kept his promises. Then they began to head out, and Philip reported to him that Pierce was tracking them down and had obtained permission to operate from Mayor Reynaldo. He responded by saying that it was nice. The system showed them that the raid quest was Free City Mira with Grades D to be the objective was to defeat unknown rogues, and the additional objective was to rescue hostages and raid the hideouts in the forest. The description stated that an unknown group of rogues was active in the forest around Mira City, and Mayor Reynaldo had requested a raid on the rogues responsible for kidnapping and interfering with trade. The rewards for completing the quest included a large amount of experience points, coins, recognition from the mayor, and unknown items. He asked Philip if he had given Reynaldo the list of rogues, and Philip replied that Reynaldo had mentioned he would reward them for it later, expressing surprise at the information provided. He had given Reynaldo the list of rogues hidden in the city, using information from his informants and data from the cafe link. Knowing he had already used many resources, he ensured there were no holes in their plan. He then instructed his men to proceed, and Jake excitedly agreed, unaware that two people were hiding in the bushes, spying on them. One of the men communicated something to his comrade. Meanwhile, in the forest, someone walked, catching the attention of Pierce, Ashton County Golden Bear Knights, and Raoul's Guard Knights, along with the other Bear Knights men. Pierce believed he had found it based on the traces on the ground, and it was time to initiate their operation. He leaped high and landed on a tree branch, planning to use the new skill he had learned. Activating his detection skill, he began searching the forest. To his shock, he spotted men hiding nearby, armed with bows and arrows. He also observed phantom magic circles and barriers, recalling what Raoul had told them, and knew he had to report it. He read Raoul's message, indicating they would be there in five minutes, prompting him to think back to five months ago. He knew that Raoul was the youngest son and that Raoul was known for his perceived weakness and lack of talent compared to his brothers. Many servants and knights were initially reluctant to travel with Raoul, and even when Raoul was seeking volunteers, few seemed interested for a long time. However, Raoul visited the knight's training ground and personally spoke to the knights. During his conversation with Pierce, Raoul mentioned that he could help Pierce reach his limits because Pierce had expressed a desire to surpass his current capabilities. He remembered how Raoul had wielded Pierce's sword himself and started pointing out the issues. He recalled thinking that while Raoul had expressed a desire to surpass his limits, he wondered how a kid like Raoul could teach him anything. 
Nonetheless, he decided to give it a try. When he swung his sword, he was surprised to find that every move felt smoother. He remembered Raoul's advice about learning Bear Crush, emphasizing that his strength lay in agility, not power. Raoul had suggested that he polish his bow skills, as he had heard Pierce was a talented bowman. Few people knew about his bow skill, yet Raoul had noticed it. This made him wonder if Raoul was the one who could genuinely help him, so he chose to follow Raoul. He was sure it was the best decision he had made, and he believed that those who had declined Raoul's offer were probably regretting it now. He didn't understand why Raoul had been hiding his power, but with the skill books Raoul had provided, he had reached the high expert stage and was able to practice his other skills. It would have been impossible without Raoul's guidance. He speculated that today might be the glorious day when Raoul would reveal his true strength. However, he noticed someone approaching, so he immediately jumped off the tree branch and gracefully bowed, along with the other knights, respectfully calling out that he had arrived. He looked ahead, and the system indicated that it was an unknown rogue's hideout with an unknown grade and size. Its status showed a three-circle or higher magic circle interfering with vision, and a three-circle magic that interrupted anyone who approached. He had to decide whether to destroy the magic circle or find a way to enter to gather more information. He noted that hideouts looked the same even in different cities and that spies from the Kranen Empire were hiding in Mira. While most Kinect players receive quests from starting cities like Mira, offering rewards for killing monsters or rogues, there were unusual rogues in the mix. These included a slave trader who kidnapped people in the city and mercenaries aiming to make it big. However, the most dangerous of them all were the Kranen Empire's spies, known as the Imperial Hounds, who hunted players and blackmailed them to prevent them from gathering together. They were crucial in the late game, and he couldn't let them them be. He called Pierce, who immediately aimed his arrows and released them, hitting the men hiding behind the magic circle. They entered the barrier, and he noticed that there was no one near the entrance. He considered dispelling the magic circle with a scroll he had bought from the shop but hesitated when he saw the mana flow. He wondered if he could do it. He put the scroll back in his jacket, deciding to infuse mana into his weapon. He grabbed his dagger from his inventory and launched it toward the mana flow. It slowly cracked due to his attack, and then he stabbed the magic circle on the ground with his dagger, destroying it. He thought it was nice because, instead of buying scrolls, he could save money. Pierce expected this of their young master and called the men named Jackson and Nil to follow the plan and lure the enemies as they had discussed. He assured them that he would let them know when to enter, to which they both agreed. Pierce descended from the tree branch and walked with them, feeling confident because he had elite knights with him. He told himself that they should hunt them all in his mind. A moment later, they arrived at the huge door. He told everyone that they don't need captives, so they will hunt them all, and they shouldn't forget to use the rapier for the last blow. Jake tells him that he doesn't understand why they should use a stick, but he will follow his orders, even though it doesn't seem to be a task where they need to use weapons. He just orders Pierce to watch there for them and find where the kidnapped people are because they need to save Nakia's younger sister named Nikki, and he should prioritize Nikki, to which Pierce replied that he got it. Then he calls Philip, and Philip nods in agreement. Then he used his psychokinesis while telling them that they should go in and open the huge door in front of them. Then they proceed to walk in while Pierce is looking back. They just continued walking inside the tunnel, until he saw the hideout inside and looked at Pierce, which Pierce understood and slowly faded away. The system showed him that Pierce had successfully infiltrated the opponent's base, making him think that they should start hunting now. He looks up and notices that there is a high cave ceiling and wooden fences spread around. Then the rogues levels there are around 30 to 31, which is not much different from regular thieves, and since he has checked the base, he should give the orders. Then he raised his hand to Jake and Philip, which means he was giving the orders. Then he ordered Jake to go to the left, then Philip to go straight, and he will go to the right. Then he closed his fist, and they all ran toward their designated directions. He speedily ran upstairs, then jumped, making the men at the top wonder who it was, but he appeared above them in a flash before they could react and threw his knives at their heads. Then he landed on the stair handle, immediately grabbed his bow and arrow behind him, aimed it at the man, and released it to kill the man, while in the center, Philip was busy slashing the men, and on the left side, Jake was doing the same thing but someone on the top saw them and shouted that there were intruders. Then the man ordered the guards to protect the fences and ordered them to kill them. He attacked them with his arrows, realizing that their numbers were increasing and they were starting to block his arrows too. One of the rogues called his companion to aim at him and shoot him down, and he was surprised to see arrows heading toward him. But he just used his psychokinesis and stopped the arrows from flying toward him, making one of the rogues panicky, asking if he bounced off the arrows and his companion to get some backup from downstairs. The rogues ran toward the stairs to attack him, and one of the men shouted that arrows didn't work on him, so they should jump on him and attack. He put back the bow on his back, guessing that he'd have to use it now, then he grabbed the daggers on his chest and put them in his hands together. One of the rogues was in front of him and ready to attack him, 
but he just pushed the man away, and the man was thrown back to his comrade, making everyone surprised. Then he used his psychokinesis to lift the arrows on the ground, then raised them slowly on his side, and then he flew using his power while holding the daggers in his arms and arrows around him. One of the rogues asked if it was magic and shouted that it was impossible. He positioned the arrows around him and aimed all of them at the rogues beneath him. Then he released the arrows together, hitting a lot of rogues. He looks at them struggling while reaching into his inventory, thinking it is still not powerful enough, so he has to exert more force on it to pierce through the armor. Then he jumped off the stair handle and appeared above the man who was trying to run away. He stabbed the man with his rapier while wondering where the others were. Then he looked back and saw Philip and Jake killing the rogues, while the rogues shouted for their companions to run because there were monsters there. The man begged for help when he saw Jake holding the rapier, but Jake just angrily slashed the man with it, making him shocked and sigh, knowing that Jake was rebelling to show that he didn't want to use the rapier. Jake didn't have to make such movements that waste mana. Also, Ashton tells Jake several times not to do that to avoid leaving any traces of swordsmanship but he doesn't think he has to be too worried. Then he noticed someone sneaking an attack from behind without knowing that Pierce is hiding, and Pierce hits the man with his arrow in time before the man attacks Jake from behind, making him think that they are almost done taking care of the small fries. A few minutes later, Pierce apologizes to him because they searched the whole prison, but they couldn't find Nikki. He puts his hand on Pierce's shoulder while telling him that it is okay and asks him if he explained things to the captive villagers. Pierce replied yes, and they distributed the clothes and food and told them to wait in one place until the battle ended. Jake asks him if he thinks there are other enemies and if they aren't just thieves. He replies that they are thieves but asks Jake back if he thinks it was a little weird, making Jake ask him what he means by weird. He explained that first, Nikki, who was kidnapped, wasn't there, second, there were many of them, but none of them stood out among the rest, and lastly, there was a magic circle at the entrance, making him ask them if anyone saw a wizard there, but they all shake their heads no. He tells them that, in conclusion, the important people and captives are in another place. Jake tells them that it is true, but if they can't find that place, it'll all be useless, and asks Pierce if he thinks so. Pierce replied that he actually checked some suspicious-looking places, but he couldn't find anything with his abilities, and there could be a high-level magic circle or system. He proudly told Pierce that it hadn't even been a month since he became their guild member, but he was good, and soon, no one will be able to fool his eyes, to which Pierce thanked him. Then he smilingly tells them to follow him because he thinks he knows where they are hiding. Then he proceeded to walk, to which they followed him and ordered them to search that hut and report right away if they saw something suspicious. They all replied with an okay. A moment later, he opened the room door while Philip told him that they couldn't find anything suspicious, but he just asked them if it was the fourth hut. He pulled out the rapier from his inventory while telling his people to get ready because the real thing begins now. Then he kicked the table away, lifted his rapier with both hands, and pierced it into the floor hard. The floor shattered into pieces, showing the hidden door. He opened them with his psychokinesis and saw that it was a secret staircase leading to the basement. But then he heard something moving underground, so he told them that something was coming. Suddenly, a huge monster's hand came out of the underground and tried to grab Jake, making Jake panic and ask what it was. Then Jake jumped away in time before it could squeeze him, and the huge monsters came out of the hole, growling at them. The other monsters walked upstairs while Philip told them not to step away because it would be harder to fight them if they scattered. Then the monster launched forward to attack them, but he jumped forward to attack it with his rapier, and pierced it hard, making it scream in pain and push backward. Philip told them that those are the Imperial Demon Calvary and their vital points are different from humans, so they should aim for their heads. Then Jake attacked the Demon Calvary from behind while asking what they were doing in that place. On the other hand, he jumped at one of the Demon Calvary with his rapier, thinking that he should study their traits first, and pierced his rapier into the Demon Calvary's neck, making it slam on the ground hard and shout in pain. Then the system showed him that it was an incomplete Imperial Demon Calvary, level 41 with Type 1 Crane and Imperial Demon Calvary. It was what he'd expected, and he remembered that he had a hard time in the past because of those guys. He also remembered that in his past life, he, Bidoyan, attacked the Empire hideout in the starting city on his sixth month of playing the game. It was due to the mayor's request when the top players were about to graduate from the starting city. Tens of top players who had finished changing jobs for the second time formed a punitive force with hundreds of guild alliances and took over the fortress. But when the real Imperial Demon Calvaries who were hiding showed up, most of the players got wiped out immediately, and the rankers, including him, barely got away. No one was able to go near the Empire's hideout for six months after that. The Demon Calvary that showed up that time was complete, and their average level was near 50. Of course, it was hard for players who had barely reached level 50 to handle it. 
but now the demon cavalry is incomplete and they have lower levels. Also, his escorts are expert high class knights who are over level 80. More importantly, he can see the vital points of the demon cavalry that are randomly placed. Then he ran to meet the demon cavalry running toward him, jumped higher, and stabbed all of its vital points, knowing that all he had to do was stab at the vital points. A moment later, the imperial demon cavalry was wiped out. Jake angrily kicked the dead demon while Philip asked why the imperial demon cavalry was in a place that is akin to the kingdom's front yard and asked him what they should do. He told them that they would go in and they couldn't back out now. Pierce suggested they should at least get some backup, but he disagreed and explained that the captives would be in more danger the longer it takes. So, they have to take care of them before they get in touch with the others outside. Suddenly, Philip and Jake walked forward to him while holding shields and told him to stay behind them because they would handle the enemies, and he should just focus on searching with Pierce. He thought it was a shame, but he knew that it was not the time to be greedy. He would still get a part of the experience points even if he didn't kill them himself, so he saw it as his chance to get carried because he had worked hard until now. Then Philip and Jake walked down first, making him feel great to have such reliable subordinates. He followed behind them, and when Jake opened the door, he told them that they should kill them in frying stool water. They then saw a lot of dead people on the ground, small and huge tubes filled with green water, with parts of monsters and demon cavalry inside them. Pierce told them that they were fearless for conducting chimera research in another country's territory. He mentioned that the demon cavalry they fought must have been made from the citizens they kidnapped, but he didn't expect them to be that crazy. He looked around, thinking that he had seen these kinds of scenes several times in his past life. However, it still creeped him out. In fact, he had considered joining them when he reincarnated because they would seize supremacy over that continent in about 10 years from now. But their emperor was a madman, and becoming his subordinate would be the same as jumping into a fire with a bomb in hand. He knew that there were many baseless rumors about the emperor, but he was sure about one thing, the emperor didn't view humans as humans. All the humans who didn't carry royal blood were divided into classes depending on their worth, and they suffered all their lives doing labor. When they became useless, they were used as experimental subjects or food for the imperial demon cavalry. And of course, even high-class citizens, if they did something that bothered the emperor, were executed. There was a general who had complained about the emperor's tyranny, but while he was talking with the king, the tattoo on his shoulder glowed red, spreading, and then he exploded and died. He remembered it vividly as if he had been there. He had no plans of surviving by sticking beside someone like it, and he couldn't allow experiments on innocent civilians. Suddenly, Philip called him to look down, and when he looked, he was surprised to see magicians casting a spell, while a knight ordered them to activate it because they had to secure the exit route. Pierce used his skills and reported that there were four knights, three wizards, and ten imperial demon cavalry. Also, it seemed like the wizards were trying to activate the magic circle in front of the cave. Philip told them that he would take care of the knights, ordered Pierce to take care of the wizards, instructed Jake to deal with the imperial demon cavalry pursuing him, and told him to back them up. Jake poutingly told Philip that he wanted him to clean up the mess from behind. But when Philip glared at Jake in anger, Jake looked at his side in sweat. Then Pierce began by shooting his arrow at one of the wizards, and someone shouted that there were intruders. They all jumped down while he was ordering them to attack. Then he aimed his arrow at one of the wizards, noticing that they were fifth circle wizards, so they had to eliminate them first. However, he knew that ordinary arrows didn't work on the barrier wizards cast, so he decided to use some of his psychokinesis to create a pathway for the arrow's trajectory. After gathering some of his psychokinesis on the arrow, he released it and shot another one, breaking the barrier into pieces and hitting one of the wizards in the head. He was glad that they had stopped them from escaping through the teleport gate, while the knights saw their magic circle shattered. The leader of the knights told his men that their exit route was blocked and ordered them to release the seal and kill them all, to which they replied with a yes. Then the knights released the seal while shouting that it was for their emperor. He was shocked seeing them, then suddenly Philip ran forward, making him surprise. Philip tried to block them and he couldn't believe that Philip, the expert high-class knight who was over level 90, wasn't enough to hold back their opponents. He activated his detection skills and saw that the leader of the knights was named McDowell, level 71, with the job of knight sword expert middle class, belonging to the Cranon Empire, and serving as the Imperial Hound in the Mira Branch Manager. Also, McDowell's potential was Class B, Strength was 75 plus 5, Agility was 71 plus 5, Stamina was 73 plus 5, Intelligence was 55 minus 10, Mentality was 68 minus 5, Magic was 68 plus 7, Sense was 73 plus 5, and his unique traits were Blind Loyalty, which was Grade B, and Fear Resistance, which was Grade C. He noticed that McDowell's stats had increased and wondered if it was due to the red tattoos effect. 
On the other hand, Jake, who was fighting with the demon cavalry, asked what was going on and if they were all on drugs. Then Jake asked him in the system chat box if he could just kill them with swords because he thought it would be hard with just that little stick. He replied to Jake that Philip and Pierce were doing fine, but it seemed like it was too hard for him. The plan was made because he trusted their capabilities, but he guessed they didn't have any other choice. Jake shyly attacked the demon cavalry in front of him while asking him if he had said it was hard. He explained that he had just said it because he thought Pierce was having a hard time, making Pierce look at Jake in silence. Then Jake angrily attacked the knights, telling them to look at what had happened because of them and that they all should die. He pulled out his rapier from his inventory, thinking that he should do something too. He attacked one of the knights, and he easily attacked its weak point and cut its arm off. Jake, who saw him, thought it was weird and wondered how he figured out the monster's weak points so easily. McDowell shouted that he didn't expect that they'd be overpowered and asked them who they were, thinking that since they used rapiers, they should be from the Randall Viscounty. But somehow, their swordsmanship looked awkward, so based on his instincts, they weren't from the Randall Viscount. Jake asked McDowell why someone who would die soon needed to know, and he told McDowell that if he was done talking, they should start again, calling them dogs of the Empire. McDowell angrily asked Jake how dare he insult the Imperial Hounds, but then McDowell noticed him in the center, making McDowell wonder if he was the leader. Then McDowell smiled, thinking that he had found a way for them to survive. McDowell ordered his people to give their lives for the Emperor, for the honor of the Emperor, to which the knights transformed into demons. One of the knights launched an attack toward them, and he was stunned, knowing that it was the Black Sacrifice. Jake blocked the knight's attack with his shield, but his shield was squeezed, and Jake exclaimed that it was so strong. He knew that it was a skill that sacrificed oneself by burning life energy and mana to obtain incredible strength for a very short time. He thought they must be planning something, judging by the fact that they were using that skill. The system then showed Jake telling him to be careful. He saw McDowell running toward them and noticed that McDowell was using the Empire KE-type power armor. It was ranked E, with an output of 0.8 CP, an uptime of 2 hours, an operation mode of mana stone consumption, and a defense skill of 3 circles. Philip ran forward to meet McDowell in the center while telling him that they were after him. Philip slashed McDowell, but he noticed that the attack was cancelled out by the force field. Then McDowell ran straight towards him, making Philip call out to him in panic. McDowell launched his fist at him while telling him that it was over. McDowell attacked him with strong power that broke the ground into pieces, but then McDowell shouted, asking what it was and if he was a power armor user while he blocked his attack. McDowell wondered if it was a power armor with shifting parts and thought that judging by its appearance, it should be F-class, but his instinct told him that it would be dangerous if the shifting ended. Then McDowell launched his other fist to attack him while telling him to die, but he just looked at the huge hand of McDowell, wondering what had happened. He knew that he was going to dodge the attack by using the C-rank skill Flash, but a message popped up, and he couldn't move. The system showed him that he had encountered a hostile power armor, so Rignator, who was asleep, had woken up. Then a light wrapped around his hand, and an armor appeared on his arm. The system showed him that it had a unique trait of an unknown grade, X, and attainments in sword expertise and middle-class psychokinesis. Also, he had fulfilled the minimum qualification which activated Rignator, but he didn't have enough mana for complete activation. So, the system searched for other energy and found intermediate grade psychokinesis, successfully fixing the shape using his psychokinesis. Rignator had partially activated, leaving him amazed as he looked at his power armor. He knew that it was a barrier that blocked all physical attacks weaker than a mana blade and a defense skill that cancelled out at least three circle magic. A mysterious core increased the mana and physical abilities of the user. Even if they had a higher level and experience, they couldn't win against someone with power armor, that's how great the effects of the power armor were. However, power armor was for NPCs, so if they weren't a connected villager, it couldn't be worn. For players, power armor became a dream piece of equipment they could never have, and for NPCs, it was the only way they could fight against the player's outbursts. And he was wearing that power armor. McDowell continuously attacked him, angrily asking what was happening and why his attacks weren't working. He jumped away from McDowell to avoid his attacks and slowly dispelled his power armor while looking at the exhausted McDowell. He used his psychokinesis to grab his rapier nearby pulled out his sword, and activated his shooting star skill, making McDowell swear in fear. Then he jumped forward and attacked McDowell with his shooting stars, causing McDowell to curse because he even broke his barrier. McDowell wondered if it was the end. McDowell coughed out blood, and the crystal in his chest slowly cracked into pieces, but McDowell thought that even if it was his end, he wouldn't die alone. Then McDowell released his power while shouting honor to the Empire, and McDowell shouted in pain as the crystal slowly crawled inside his body and changed him. 
he noticed that McDowell's body was fusing with the power armor, and he guessed it was almost over. Then the system showed him that Rignator had detected a forbidden piece of power, making him wonder what it meant. Then the system showed him that it was releasing part of the seal due to an oath, and a bright light came out of his body, surprising him. The bright light surrounded him, and the power armor slowly wrapped around him until it fully consumed him. Then the system showed him that Rignator would show his true self temporarily. A foot with shining armor emerged, and he came out of the bright light in complete armor. Then, he faced McDowell, who had also undergone a complete transformation. McDowell growled at him and leaped forward to attack, but he merely expressed his disgust, which further infuriated McDowell. While McDowell launching his fist towards him, he raised one arm to block McDowell's attack. This action caused both of their people to cease their fighting and look at them. When McDowell's attack connected, it resulted in a massive explosion, throwing McDowell's people aside. Jake and Philip struggled to shield themselves, but he remained firmly in his position, unflinching, glaring at McDowell. Suddenly, McDowell's power armor began to slowly crack into pieces, surprising him. He raised his hand and used psychokinesis to lift McDowell. He then squeezed McDowell, causing McDowell to cry out in pain. He then fully squeezes McDowell, telling him to piss off, and McDowell's power armor gradually disintegrated into pieces, causing him to scream in agony before falling lifeless to the ground, and the Rignator effect slowly fades. He couldn't believe he had done it and knew he had barely met the time limit. Suddenly, he coughed up blood, causing Philip and Jake to panic as they rushed to his side, asking if he was okay. He raised his hand to reassure them that he was fine, all the while contemplating that he had never experienced such a sensation before. It was unlike anything he had felt as a player, it was as if he had glimpsed eternal power. He understood that he had borrowed the item's power this time, but he swore that one day, he would attain such strength on his own. A moment later, the magic circle shattered into pieces, revealing a pocket teleportation device and a mana stone. He decided to figure out how to use them later. Then, Pierce informed him that they had located Nikki and the other hostages, but unfortunately, some of them were deceased. He told Pierce that there was nothing more they could do and instructed him to collect their belongings to return to their families. Pierce agreed and reported that Nikki was not in good condition right now, so he urged Pierce to hurry, and they should leave. Several minutes later, as they walked towards the cave exit, Jake asked him if they were truly leaving valuable items behind. In response, he asked Jake if he wanted to take them, to which Jake replied affirmatively, emphasizing their usefulness and incalculable value. He acknowledged Jake's point regarding McDowell's power armor and its potential use as evidence against the Empire's spies. He also recognized that dealing with the Imperial Hounds was no easy task, as they posed a significant threat to small nobles. Many users had given up because of them, but he believed it was wiser to focus on their growth and expanding his influence rather than provoking the Imperial Hounds at this time. He reassured Jake that it was all part of the plan, so he should forget about it, and also he was the one who finished it. Jake replied saying that's because he instructed them to stay away. He promised Jake a bonus for his hard work that day, instructing him to go back and rest. Jake excitedly asked if he was truly giving him a bonus and a vacation, and jokingly told him that he couldn't take it back. Jake walked away happily, leaving him to wonder whether Jake was foolish or clever. He then ordered Pierce to provide a report, and Pierce informed him that they had successfully lured their adversaries as planned, with no setbacks to report. He smiled as he looked at Pierce, thinking that he should observe their reactions, although he knew it would be quite evident. Still, he was curious about the expressions they would make after falling for that trick. Meanwhile, somewhere in the forest, someone inquired about how far they had traveled, and Ramon shouted at their guide, asking if they were heading in the right direction. Ramon believed they had tracked Raul to that forest, but they couldn't find any traces of him. They had also needed time to recover mentally from the shrine and had lost money and swords due to Raul. Ramon thought they had lost to Raul because they couldn't use mana skills in the city, despite having 12 knights and their guard leader, Jeremy, equipped with power armor. Ramon looked up, thinking it was their chance now that Raul was outside the city. The man in the row pointed in a direction and informed Ramon that it was right there. They proceeded forward and stopped in front of a cave. Kale expressed concern, remarking that it looked kind of dangerous, but he guessed they had to go inside to find out. Ramon insisted that they should go in because they had come outside the city to find Raul. A moment later, they all laughed joyfully upon seeing a pile of gold on the ground. Ramon happily informed his brothers that they couldn't find Raul, but this discovery was pretty nice. Jerry added that magic items, artifacts, and even the bodies of wanted individuals were present, with the power armor being the most significant find. Meanwhile, in the city, the knights guarding it observed people on horseback approaching and were surprised to see their young master. One of the knights thanked him for the trouble and reported that they had raided a hideout in the East Forest and successfully rescued the hostages. 
he praised their efforts and inquired about the whereabouts of the others. They responded that they had arrived there after completing their mission. These were his trainee knights and first guild members. Six of them had progressed to experts through training, while the rest were ready to become experts. Additionally, all of them could use mana and have learned Ashton County's sword skills. He instructed them to retrieve supplies from the north and west hideouts, thinking that with over 100 members now, normal rogues wouldn't be able to stand against them. He then ordered everyone that they should go now, to which they agreed. Later, they reached their destination, and the knight guarding the area was astounded, asking if they were from Ashton County and why there were so many of them, observing them holding and carrying hostages. He inquired of the knight on the ground if he was the captain, and the knight confirmed it. The captain explained that they had guided the civilians there as per his request, earning praise from him. The worried civilians asked if Raoul was the one who had rescued the hostages and hoped to finally reunite with their children. At the front, Nakia was relieved to see Nikki in Raoul's arms, and Raoul kindly assured her that Nikki was right there, causing Nakia to express her gratitude repeatedly. He informed Nakia that Nikki was currently in poor condition and that they would need to provide her with treatment at the mansion. He then called Bernard, who informed him that a priest was already at the mansion. He glanced at Nakia, contemplating how he had saved the lives of many who were destined to die and had altered the future of an alchemist consumed by vengeance. He wondered if Nakia's path to becoming a grand alchemist might be different now, and the items and potions she had created might not come to exist in this world. However, he recognized that he still needed Nakia for the county's future and noticed that everything had started to change when he returned to the past. He didn't mind if history was altered. He vowed not to hesitate to shape someone's future as he was no longer a kind-hearted person. Even today, he believed he could have saved many more lives if he had acted more swiftly. Instead, he had focused on completing quests and gaining Nakia's interest. While he knew he had completed the quest overnight and ensured the safety of the city, he couldn't shake his unease. Then, he noticed an elderly woman holding gloves, crying in pain, lamenting that her son had not returned. He recognized that these were lower-class individuals who couldn't afford commissions and that some people hadn't even been given a chance. Upon reflection, he realized that his actions had been solely driven by quests and leveling up. He had never engaged in conversations with people unrelated to his quests. He recalled his initial intention to live in the present when he was reincarnated, but he had continued to treat life like a game. He acknowledged that living a life in accordance with the system wasn't necessarily wrong. But he began to question whether simply following the system determined quests was truly the right path. He realized that he had been making plans based on the perspective of the player base, Doyon, but wondered if this approach limited his horizons and options. He felt that if he didn't discover something unique that only Raoul, as a nobleman of Connect, could do, something beyond what a player could achieve, he might repeat the failures of his past. He turned to Philip and asked if he could see the disheartened people standing there and provide him with their personal information and circumstances. Philip inquired if he meant all of them, to which Raoul replied in the affirmative. He then instructed Philip to offer consolation money to those who had lost their families or had their families kidnapped, as well as to help them find jobs. Raoul felt sorry for adding more work to Philip's plate when Philip had originally come to fight. Philip commented that it was unexpected, remarking that Raoul usually only got involved when it benefited him. However, he reassured Raoul that the others wouldn't refuse the request, so there was no need to worry. Philip then shifted his gaze toward toward Jake, implying that there might be someone who would decline. This remark annoyed Jake, who asked Philip why he was looking at him when he didn't mind doing good deeds either. Jake then asked Raoul if he was going to give him some time off. After providing financial support to the grieving individuals, they walked away, expressing their gratitude and wishing Raoul a long life. Raoul patted his horse, considering that the support from Mira's citizens would be valuable when dealing with other guilds. While it had all been calculated, it felt like killing two birds with one stone since the citizens appreciated it. He also thought it would be a good idea to stay in the area a bit longer to level up and gain practical experience. They conversed with the civilians, unaware of a man behind them who was observing Raoul with a smile. The following day, in the main castle in Mira, Reynaldo expressed his gratitude, acknowledging that Raoul had alleviated many of his concerns. Raoul humbly replied that even without him, he would have resolved the situation. But Reynaldo disagreed, explaining that he couldn't even sleep after hearing the news of Mira being targeted by the Empire's evil forces. Reynaldo believed that without Raoul's report, they would have been in significant trouble. Raoul agreed that he had been surprised by the situation and added that it was unexpected that the Empire's evil forces had infiltrated Mira, which was clearly within the territory of the Kingdom of Reuben. He went on to mention that, judging by their hideout, it appeared they had been working secretly for quite some time, training demonic soldiers. Reynaldo confessed that there had been missing cases in the past, 
but they couldn't take action due to the treaty. According to the treaty, Mera wasn't allowed to maintain an army and could only operate guards, and even those guards couldn't fully utilize their capabilities outside the city. Reynaldo also tells him that someone from Randall Viscounty came as he said, and they claim to have destroyed the spy's hideout while vigorously demanding compensation. If it weren't for his request, they would have simply expelled them. He tells Reynaldo that he expected this, but as he has mentioned before, it matters. However, Reynaldo interrupts him by suggesting that they should make it look like Randall Viscounty was responsible and ask if he doesn't think it would be beneficial. Not only would he gain a great reputation, but he might also receive rewards from the royal court. He thanked Reynaldo for his concern but asked him to proceed as he had instructed. Reynaldo tells him that he is being overly cautious and not having fun for his age but assures him that he will handle the matter well. He knows that taking care of the Empire's hideout will be the Randall Bastard's contribution, and it will be their responsibility to attract the Empire's attention as well. Then Reynaldo tells him that he doesn't know what he should give him as a reward, and he doesn't think money will be enough. He asks him what he wants because he is willing to grant him anything making Reynaldo think that he's finally hearing something he wants to hear. He tells Reynaldo that he'd like to ask him for a favor. Then he mentions that he heard about Reynaldo's mansion having a study with a collection of valuable books. He asks if it would be alright for him to take a look at those books. Reynaldo tells him that it's no trouble and he should feel free to explore. He even offers to let him take one of the books with him. However, it seems like it won't be enough, so he tells him he'll show him the secret treasury and allow him to choose one item as a gift. He thanks Reynaldo for his generosity and notes that, as expected, he is very cool. Reynaldo excitedly mentions that he gives generously when necessary, but some people call him stingy, leaving him wondering why Reynaldo is showing off when he has to give him a reward anyway. A moment later, he arrives at Reynaldo's library, and the butler tells him that he will leave him be, encouraging him to explore at his leisure. He wonders if this is the place and decides to pick one of the books thinking that they may appear to be miscellaneous books but are actually a marvelous treasury of skill books. He opens one of the books, and the system asks him if he would like to acquire the B-rank skill book, Thunder Pierce. As he looks around, he can't believe that all the books in the library are skill books, and he feels satisfied just by looking at them. He realizes that there's no guarantee he can come here again, so he carefully searches for the book he wants. Then he notices a subtle light coming from a book on the top shelf, so he knows he must take a look at it. The system shows him that it's a study of ancient rituals, spells, and instructional methods for mental cultivation. He grabs it from the center, noting its lengthy title, and when he opens it, the system reveals that it's the Quarkus Meditation Art, Grade S. This meditation art is exclusively for psychic ability users, providing a 24-hour automatic meditation effect and enabling mental training. The description explains that it was used by ancient psychics to cultivate spiritual power and allows purification of the soul through communion with nature and mental imagery space. There is also a popular belief that meditating near an oak tree increases efficiency. He was excited that he had found a meditation method exclusively for S-level psychics, and was happy that he could finally get his hands on it now. He remembered that in his previous life, even with only a B-rank meditation art, he, Bidoan, had managed to reach the top rank in the early stages. However, later on, he was pushed out of the rank position due to insufficient spiritual power capacity. By the time he tried to find a better meditation art, the path to obtaining skill books had already been blocked by large guilds and other rankers. Originally, skill books related to superpowers had the worst drop rates, and related information was also very limited. But after some time, information about the Quarkus meditation art was revealed. According to a flame magician ranker in Japan, Sakata Shijisa, the mayors of the starting cities were hiding one S-rank skill each. Among them, the superpowered skill he had acquired was in Mira's library. He also remembered that he had obtained an S-rank skill book in the starting city, Ignit, in his past life. It was a magician-only skill, so it was useless to him. However, this time was different, and the effects of the meditation method stacked up, so he wouldn't run out of spiritual power this time. Additionally, psychic abilities might not seem significant in the beginning, but as the level increased, the power and range of use greatly expanded. With sufficient spiritual power support, it would be much easier to increase his proficiency. If he could return to the level he had reached in his previous life before a full-scale war with the Empire began, he would be in an excellent position. He excitedly looked forward to that day. Later, in the underground of Reynaldo's castle, he looked at the moderate mana ring he had chosen from Reynaldo's treasury and thought that there were much better items in his hometown. He asked himself if he should undertake some personal reorganization that he had been putting off until now. 
He knew that he had completed all 70 quests he had gathered in one night and obtained skill books below C rank, as well as rare grade items. Additionally, he had amassed 50,000 player-only coins. He opened his status window and saw that he was currently at level 55 with strength of 66, agility of 67, stamina of 65, intelligence of 58, willpower of 71, mana of 70, spiritual power of 72, and senses of 71. His unique traits were Skill Collector Grade X, Developers Analyzing I Grade X, Psychokinetic Meister Grade S+, plus, Royal Lineage Grade A, and an Unknown Trait Grade X. He noticed that all of his body's stats had surpassed 65 in just one month, and even his mana and spiritual power had exceeded 70, indicating that he was now quite skilled. He knew that superhumans, known as sword masters or high-tier psychokinetics, typically had stats around 90. In his previous life, he had even reached 90 in willpower and senses. So, he made a vow that in his current life, he would raise all his stats to 90, and if the opportunity arose, he would strive to become the first player to achieve 100 in stats. It might sound like a dream, but he believed he had many opportunities in his current life. For instance, his Rignator power armor was currently in grade B. Its stats were bound to him, partially open and sealed, with an output of 1.5 core power, an operating time of 5 minutes, and a self-charging operating mode. Its defense techniques included 6 circles, a mid-tier mana blade attribute force field, and a 50% reduction in attribute effects. According to its description, it was a replica of mythical power armor that had traversed time and space. Most of its functions were sealed, and some special functions had transformed. However, the seal would be undone once specific requirements were met. It had two special functions, Condemnation, which had an effect amplified by 200% against the target of the oath, and Covert Satiation, which allowed it to absorb lower-grade power armor and imitate their functions. One of the two items that had followed him when he reincarnated was his skill dex, which had been unlocked through quests. He could also awaken his Regnator power armor this time. Regarding the skill dex, he had received a quest to unlock the next seal. To do so, he needed to complete 50 quests related to the proficiency of random slot skills. However, in relation to the Regnator, he had no clue how to proceed. It was likely because the current output was challenging to handle. Then he realized that he had unlocked a new unique trait, Developers Analyzing I Grade X. Its effect allowed him to borrow the developer's vision and steal information related to the system. It also facilitated the analysis of the flow of special energies. He thought that this must be why he had been able to see NPC information and mana flow all that time. It had been just his assumption, but he believed he must have gained it when he subdued the Imperial Hound's demonic energy. He knew that he would find out more once he saw the quest that appeared along with the trade unlocking. Normally, it should have appeared around the time of leaving the starting city, but it seemed like an error due to attacking the Imperial Hound hideout too early. He also knew that if he followed the same path he did in his previous life, he would have to keep crossing paths with the Empire to obtain the Black Magic Stone Fragments. He'd have to navigate the scenario amidst their extreme interference. However, for now, he was a player and a citizen of Connect, so whatever scenario he chose and whichever quest he cleared was up to him. He swore that he would no longer be a puppet following the developer's wishes. If the ending they decided on differed from what he wanted, he would act as he saw fit, even if it meant disrupting the scenario and the quest itself. The next day, he was in the library when someone knocked and asked if he was inside. Then Bernard reported to him that Nikki had regained consciousness, and Nakia would like to meet him. He told Bernard that they should meet Nakia and go see her. A moment later, he asked Nakia about her little sister's condition, and the maid informed her that their young master was there. Nakia kneeled on the ground in tears, thanking him and expressing her gratitude for his kindness. He reassured her not to worry about it and told her that, for now, she needed to be strong for her sister. He looked up at Nikki, wondering if he should check on her condition as well. Nikki thanked him for saving her, then looked to the side, making Nakia apologize because Nikki was very shy. He reassured Nakia that it was fine because Nikki was still young. He looked at Nikki with concern, noticing that she was still unwell, and wondered if he should examine her more closely. He approached Nikki and saw intense waves in her eyes, which surprised him. He couldn't help but wonder what was going on and if the others had not noticed it while Nikki and Nakia were looking at him with confusion. He thought that his eyes might be playing tricks on him, but he would have to examine them again using the developer's analysis. He was shocked to see something unusual in Nikki's eyes, and he couldn't believe what he was witnessing. He thought Nikki was just a kid, but the system showed him that Nikki was level 5 with an unknown class. Her affiliation was Free City Mira, her talent was unknown and her potential talent was grade SS. Her strength was 5, agility 3, stamina 3, intelligence 60 minus 30, willpower 65 minus 25, mana 62 minus 61, senses 52 minus 45. 
her three unique traits were unknown, and he couldn't believe that Nikki's potential talent was SS. Also, he noticed that Nikki's illness was bringing her stats down. But he wondered what if he could cure her illness and bring out her true stats, making him say that he couldn't even imagine how powerful she'd be. Nakia worriedly asked him what was wrong, making him snap back to reality and reply that it was nothing. However, he knew that he'd have to look more into it for Nikki. A few days later, he was in the library and looking at the documents while thinking that he had all the papers he needed, and he was almost done with Mira. Also, everything was going well because they found more rogues and slave traders and rescued 50 more people. So now, Mira was the safest place, and the guildhouse construction was done, with some members living there now. Many civilians they rescued were willing to work for them, and there were many talented workers, so he was confident in every aspect. The only thing left was Nakia. Then Bernard informed him that he was opening the door and Nakia entered shyly. After they were seated, he asked her how Nikki was doing, and she replied that Nikki was doing much better thanks to the priests, who were working hard and thanked him again. He told her that it was nice, but he knew that Nakia was just saying it. Nikki's condition had not improved, and it was something they couldn't heal with divine power in the first place. Then he explained to her that he asked to see her because he wanted to talk to her. She replied that she understood and asked him if it was true that he was leaving today because she hadn't been able to properly thank him yet. He replied, yes, and told her that he had stayed longer than he was supposed to, so he was on a tight schedule now. She told him to ask her anything and asked him how she may help him, while thinking that there must be a reason why he helped her and Nikki so much. Also, Nakia really wants to be of help, but every noble she has met so far has been very greedy, and they are people who are only nice on the surface. So she is scared Raoul might be the same, and she doesn't want to disappoint Raoul. Then he told her that it was not what she was thinking and she should read that first while giving her the documents. She accepted it in confusion and was shocked to see what was written on them. She accidentally let go of them while looking at the pardon letter, saying that he forgave all sins committed by Nakia in the past and released all charges on Nakia. She shockingly asked him if it was real and how did he do it. He replied that luckily, it was something that could easily be settled with money. He knew that the paper he just gave Nakia pardoned her of her sins, and he had to use quite a lot of money to get permission from the Alliance, but it was nothing compared to Nakia's worth. She was teary while thinking that she had to suffer through five years of pain because of the mana restriction, and it was a problem she thought she could never escape. But Raoul solved it so easily, making her think that she was stupid to have compared Raoul with other nobles and she was so arrogant. He asked her if she could tell him how she got her mana restricted, if it was okay with her, and she replied that when she was a kid, she left her hometown. Her alchemy teacher saw her talent as an alchemist and helped her get into the alchemist association. She made a name for herself as a young, talented alchemist and even mastered three-circle magic at the age of 13. But then, misfortune struck all of a sudden, and there was a disease outbreak in her hometown, which took the lives of her family. There was only Nikki left when she got there, and she tried to bring Nikki to the association and live with her, but misfortune didn't stop. When Nikki turned six, she got an incurable disease, and it was probably because of her. There were many hazardous substances around her, and she focused on finding a cure for two years. She made it to the fifth circle at the age of 18 during the process, but it meant nothing to her. When Nikki's death was approaching, she couldn't think of any solutions. So she broke the taboo by using alchemy on a person and kept Nikki alive by using materials she stole from the association. But Nikki couldn't even stay awake without medicine. Then she was caught breaking the taboo and got kicked out of the association with constraints. Then they stayed there after wandering around for a while, and the city was safe, and God's blessing there helped with Nikki's illness. But Mana restrictions and a sick sister didn't look good to the people there. He told her that she had been through a lot and gave her the potion while telling her to drink it, explaining that it would free her. She was shocked. She slowly took the potion from him and drank it straight away. Then a powerful power came out of her body. She closed her eyes, thinking that it had been five years, but she felt it still relaxing, and she missed it so much. He was smilingly looking at her, showing that Nakia's level was 68 with Intermediate Alchemist 5th Circle Class. Her affiliation is Free City Mira, her potential talent grade is S, her strength is 43, her agility is 48, her stamina is 55, her intelligence is 80, her willpower is 77, her mana is 78, and her senses are 81. Also, her unique traits are Master of Alchemy Grade S, Precise Tuner Grade A, Genius Absurdity Grade A-, minus, and an unknown trait. She opened her eyes and understood what Raoul really wanted from her. Then she knelt in front of him while telling him that she, Nakia, would be loyal to him. She was eager to see him save many others, just like how he saved her and Nikki. He reached out to her and patted her head while telling her that he accepted her loyalty and that he wouldn't forget what she said. Then he gave her another document and told her that he would give it to her as well, making her ask him what it was. He replied that it was for Nikki's illness, a monofilaria, leaving her stunned in shock. 
He explained to her that a great alchemist who was no longer in that world had left it, and there was a missing part that needed more research. However, she would make the perfect cure using it, and it was the first order he gave her as her lord. She cried in happiness and told him that she would make the perfect cure with her life, thinking that she had decided to live for Raoul for the rest of her life. Afterward, Nakia left, and he stretched his body while thinking that talking and acting like this was still awkward for him. But he knew that he had to practice because it was the place he lived in, and the people he faced were citizens of Connect. He knew that today was a great success because the first member who wasn't handed to him was an alchemist who would leave a mark in history. He also knew that Nakia would make the cure because the great alchemist who was no longer in that world was Nakia herself. He remembered that in the past, Nakia had also fought the incurable disease called monofilaria. After researching for a long time, she finally made a cure, but during the process, she sacrificed many people. He thought it didn't matter now because he was lucky that data about Nakia's cure was still in Cafe Link. He knew that he had given Nakia the defective version on purpose so she could grow, and he hoped she would no longer feel burdened by Nikki when she made the cure. But even if she couldn't make it in time, he could give her the rest of the data. He smiled, thinking that everything he had planned to do in Mira was done, so now he had to prepare for his next destination. His next destination was the capital of the Rubin Kingdom, also known as the Tomb of Sword Metropolis Turium, and he was getting excited about what would happen in the vast city, so he should get going. Days later, someone saw people appear at the gate, and Jake excitedly told them to look at all those people. The capital sure was different. He thought they were there in the capital of the Rubin Kingdom, Tyrium. He told his people that there was no need for them to get in line since they were from the county, so they could go in, to which they excitedly replied, yes. Then they walked directly in. He thought he left most of the guild members in Mira and brought the minimum amount, so it should be easier for them. But he was surprised to see nothing in front of him and wondered why there were no carriages or escorts. He asked Bernard if he had sent the message that they were coming, and Bernard replied that he was sure he did. Then Bernard told him that there must be a mistake, and he'd head to the mansion first to bring people. He asked Bernard if he knew where the mansion was and told him that they should just move together. Bernard asked one of the people if she knew where the Ashton County mansion was, but the woman replied that she had no idea. Then Bernard tried asking other people, but a man asked him if Ashton County was the warrior family and if there was an Ashton mansion in Turium. He told Bernard to try looking for it in the Noble District. When they arrived at the Noble District gate, the Noble District patrol apologized to him because they had never heard of an Ashton County mansion in the Noble District, so they couldn't enter. He didn't expect his family to be popular, but he wasn't expecting this. Suddenly, Jake shouted at the patrol that soldiers were dying while stopping monsters at Ashton County, and they were asking where Ashton was. He asked them if they didn't even know who was maintaining that peace. He knew that civilians not knowing about their family made sense because it was far, and his father rarely visited the capital but he wondered if there was no one who even knew of the mansion's existence. He remembered that he had heard there was a huge mansion there for exchanges with nobles and royals. He thought it was inconvenient and asked Bernard if he could head to the office and find the address, to which Bernard told him to leave it to him. A moment later, one of the patrol asked him if he was sure it was the paper because he was sure that the address written on it was for Baron Jendar, making them surprised. He asked the patrol if it was really Baron Jendar and not Count Ashton. To which the patrol replied, yes, and explained to him that Baron Jendar had been living there for over 10 years now, but they could head there for now. He called Bernard, and Bernard reported to him that Baron Jendar was a 50-year-old male, and Baron was his distant cousin. Also, Baron was in charge of foreign affairs. He replied that he understood and told everyone that they should go to the mansion because he'd have to see it himself. A few minutes later, they arrived at the mansion, and the guard asked them who they were again. Philip replied that they were with Ashton County's youngest son, Raoul, and asked the guard where the foreign affairs officer was. However, the guard just asked them who Ashton County was and if they had an invitation. Philip asked the guard what he meant by an invitation, but the guard asked him back if they had come to a party without an invitation and pointed to the side, telling them to wait over there because he would be back. He was pissed to hear that there was a party, and Jake shook in anger upon hearing this. Then Jake jumped off his horse and grabbed one of the guards, asking, What the heck is happening here? Are they asking the owner to wait outside? He told them that he didn't care who Baron Jendar was, but they should tell Baron to come out. The other guards shouted that there were intruders and whistled their instruments. However, the guards let go of their spears and ran away in fear, leaving Jake shocked. Jake asked them what had just happened and if they were running away. He then told his people that they should go inside. But as they were about to move forward, someone shouted at them to stop and asked who they were. Philip introduced himself as Philip of the Golden Bear Knights of Ashton County and asked the man where Baron Jendar was. The man asked Philip why intruders were looking for the Baron, but then he realized something and immediately apologized, explaining that he had heard they were coming. 
but it was late. He said he would let the Baron know right away and ordered the guards to bring them to the reception room, leaving them wondering what was happening. Later, they entered the mansion, and he noticed that it was as big as he had heard. It would take forever to go around, even with a carriage. He was surprised to see a building that only the direct lineage of Ashton County could use. He wondered why he heard music from that building and noticed strangers strolling in the front yard. Jake asked the guard if there was an event today because someone had mentioned a party. The guard replied that today was Baron Jendar's third son, Aaron's birthday party. Parties happened too often there, so they were confused as well. Jake was shocked and angrily asked the guard whose party it was. Then someone told Raoul that he was finally there, and a man walked down the stairs, asking if he was Raoul and commenting that he had grown a lot. He noticed that the man seemed strong, but Baron Jendar was only level 50, not even an expert. He understood why other families looked down on Ashton and why his father had put that Baron in charge of foreign affairs, but he couldn't accept it. Baron Jendar was even looking down at him. He asked Baron if he knew him, and Baron replied that he must have forgotten since it had been a long time. But he was basically his uncle and was like a brother to his father. However, he told Baron that he had never heard his name mentioned as his uncle. Baron laughed, calling him clever and told him that it must be hard for him to understand since the Ashton family tree was a bit complicated, but he could just call him uncle. He knew that Baron thought he was stupid, but he swore that he wouldn't let Baron take advantage of him. He asked Bernard if he could re-explain what that guy had to do with him. Then Bernard, who was looking straight at Baron, replied that Baron Jendar was Count Ashton's second cousin, and Baron was his third cousin and was in charge of foreign affairs at the capital. Baron, shouting, asked him what he was doing in front of an adult and if his father had not taught him to respect his elders. But he just told Baron that he must be very comfortable with his father and asked him if he wasn't scared of the Ashton County. He asked Philip how many people could talk comfortably with him, except for direct descendants of his family, and Philip replied that only the Count's younger brother, Viscount Austin, could. He asked Philip why that was, and Philip replied that it was to show respect to Count Ashton and clearly establish a hierarchy. He then told them that when a Count's child comes of age, they inherit the title of Viscount and some land, so he also inherited some land with a population of 10,000. He asked Baron if there was a reason why he should be looked down on by a cousin he had never known. Baron replied that it was his fault, and he had forgotten that he was now an adult. He promised to show respect and asked if Raoul was satisfied. Raoul replied with a nonchalant whatever and thought that there was a lot for Baron to explain. He also asked Baron why he didn't explain to them what was going on there, but Baron replied that he wasn't sure what he was talking about. Philip asked Baron why there was no one to escort them when they had sent many messages about their arrival, and Baron replied that he had told them to send a carriage, but there must have been a mistake, and there were many guests today. Then he apologized to Raoul, but Philip asked Baron one more question. He asked why Baron was holding a birthday party for his son at the main building. Baron explained that they needed to have a huge party to show who they were, and it was all part of foreign affairs, so they shouldn't worry about it. He sarcastically asked what the guard knew about nobility, but Philip sighed, deciding to let it go for now because Raoul was there as well. Pierce handed a paper to Raoul, telling him that it was the invitation he found in the yard. Raoul showed it to Baron, pointing out that the party seemed to have no correlation with Ashton County, and all he could see on the invitation were the names and the symbol of the Jendar family. Baron fearfully replied that it was just an invitation and it was definitely a formal Ashton County's. Then Baron seriously reminded him that, as he had said, it was just an invitation, and he would like to stop arguing about the party because it was past his authority, even if Raoul was the young master. He suggested that Raoul could could go argue about it at home. Raoul asked Baron if he really thought the party was appropriate, and Baron confidently replied, of course, explaining that it was a long tradition to use the party hall when the mansion was empty. He reached for something in his coat, knowing that Baron was not entirely wrong because it was common to lend a mansion to other nobles, but only if Baron had permission from Count Ashton himself. Then he showed the documents and told Baron that as a temporary Count Deputy, he ordered him to end that party within an hour and report the details of the funds spent on the party. Baron angrily shouted that it was nonsense and that Raoul was being ridiculous. He couldn't just send the guests back and ask who gave Raoul that authority. Raoul made it clear that he was not following the order and asked Baron why he wasn't worrying about his family, as he didn't think there were any guests he should worry about. He told Baron that he was giving him an hour out of generosity and asked if he should go to the party hall himself and inform the guests. Baron replied that he would wrap up the party but warned that Raoul would regret it. Raoul put the documents back in his coat, knowing that the worst that could happen was his father yelling at him a little. 
he was curious about what gave Baron the confidence to do all of this. Also, there wasn't any concrete evidence about the collapse of Ashton County, making him wonder if maybe he could find something about it there because who knows, maybe he'll hit the jackpot. A moment later, he felt frustrated, knowing that the place they had escorted him to wasn't the main building but the mansion's annex. The man explained to him that the Baron had said, since the main building was crowded, he wanted them to prepare a quiet place for him. However, he knew that it was nonsense and turned his horse to begin riding while shouting that he didn't wish to hear it and that he was going to the main building. His people agreed and followed him. Later, in the main building, he furiously opened the door and asked if they were in their right minds. He clenched his fist in anger when he saw the Baron and the Baron's family inside, realizing that in the three-story main building and office, only the Count and his family were supposed to stay. The entire Baron's family living there angered him. He asked Baron how he planned to explain this and if it was a Count family tradition for ministers and the like to dare occupy the Count's office. Baron fearfully replied that they were just borrowing it for a while, and he didn't even come there once a year anyway, so it was a waste to keep it empty. He pulled out his rapier while angrily shouting at Baron to get lost at once. He threatened that if they didn't empty the mansion by today, he would deal with them all, even if they were close family. Furthermore, he decided to strip the Baron of his position as the foreign affairs minister, which shocked Baron. He angrily told Baron that if he wanted to raise an objection, he should come to him by tomorrow with documentation showing that he had properly performed his duties as a minister. Baron fumed in anger but silently walked away with his family. He watched them through the window, thinking that they were wrapping up with the preparations. He realized that he needed to find the materials he needed and worried they might have been discarded due to the mansion's condition. Fortunately, they were still there. Then he looked around, noticing that all documents related to the management and finances of the mansion were left in the office. He thought they must have been very complacent to think that nothing much would happen overnight. However, in his previous life, he had studied business administration and worked at a trading company. Bernard could be considered the best expert on mansion-related matters. Philip informed him that the Baron had left the mansion with his family. He asked Philip for confirmation because he couldn't believe it and if they had left quietly. Philip replied that it was a bit unexpected, but they had quietly left with only the necessary clothes. He told Philip to forget about it and asked if it wasn't obvious what they were thinking. He mentioned that they would return anyway, so there was no need to take all their baggage out. Philip asked if it would really be alright and if it wouldn't be better to give them time to slowly organize. He replied that it was better to quickly weed out the rotten parts and that it would be more efficient to confront Baron when he was looking down on them. He also knew that he must use that place as a branch of the first guild unit once he found a suitable location in the capital, and since it was his house, he couldn't have random individuals causing trouble inside it. Pierce told him that it seemed like the Baron had other backing, and he wondered if something strange would happen. He told them not to worry because it didn't matter what trick the Baron had up his sleeves, and they should have a bit more faith in their county. Then Jake grabbed Philip and Pierce, asking them why they were so worried and telling them to stop with the gloomy talk. He suggested they take a look around the mansion and follow their young master's instructions. He laughed and replied that Jake was right and that they might need to use some force tomorrow, so they should all rest. Except for Bernard, they were all dismissed. Then Jake told Philip and Pierce to go while winking at Raoul in the back. When they were alone, he told Bernard that he knew what they had to look for. Bernard replied that it was his expertise. He then told Bernard that they didn't have much time, so they should start right away. The next day, two daggers clashed with each other. Then he raised two more daggers with his psychokinesis while shouting for one more. He threw it directly at the daggers in the air, but before his daggers collided with them, the two daggers shook and fell in front of Bernard, who was controlling them. He told Bernard that he had gotten a lot better and that he never thought he'd already be able to handle two daggers like that. Bernard told him that he still had a long way to go. He knew that it had been a month and a half since Bernard awakened his superpowers with the skill book. He couldn't believe that Bernard was already that skilled, making him realize that Bernard was no ordinary talent. It was not easy for a wind mage to handle a weapon so precisely, and at that rate, Bernard would reach an intermediate level in about six months, becoming a multi-talented psychic that was hard to find anywhere. Then he asked Bernard if they should do some martial arts training next and reminded Bernard that he had told him back then too that it was difficult to demonstrate power with just one superpower. It was easy and efficient to increase proficiency by combining various skills in the beginning. He asked Bernard if he was ready, and Bernard replied that he was. However, Bernard felt something and told him that it seemed like they had a guest. He couldn't catch up with the long-distance sensing ability of Bernard. He told Bernard that they should go and, as a host, he had to greet guests properly. Bernard replied that he understood and asked him if he would bring the things they had prepared yesterday, to which he agreed. He told Bernard to bring them all because he deserved to be rewarded for his hard work last night. 
Bernard wore his jacket, knowing that something always happened every time their young master made that face, and he hoped Baron wouldn't do anything foolish. On the floor of the building, Jake was surprised to see a lot of people and asked Raoul if he had buried a treasure trove or something because he didn't understand why there were so many people gathered there. Then Jake noticed that among the escort knights, some were exuding formidable vigor, and there were even soldiers outside the mansion too. No matter how he looked at it, it didn't seem like something their party could handle alone. He wondered if their young master Raoul had something else in mind. On the other hand, Baron was smiling arrogantly, thinking that things were going well for him and that the young master had taken the bait just like he had expected. Baron also believed that all the work must be completed now that Melvin was away, and that way, he could secure a position for himself. Then he noticed the blood relatives of the Ashton County residing in the capital, guessing that they must have gathered because of what happened last night. He thought that losing his position as the foreign affairs minister and being kicked out of the mansion weren't just his problems because the blood relatives in the capital also used to hold banquets in the mansion hall at the county's expense. Even the management fees for the mansion had been flowing to them through his pocket, so there was no way those who had their benefits taken away overnight would remain silent. Baron admitted to himself that it was a mistake on his part to hold the party in his name and use the office, but they didn't know about it. Raoul must only know how to act like a noble, but he considered Raoul an idiot who didn't understand the situation. Then he told Melvin in his head that he didn't know why he entrusted the seal to his young son, but he would use it well. Raoul walked forward with his knights, causing the people around them to wonder if that pretty face was really a blood relative of theirs, if he was the young man who had been causing trouble for Baron Jendar, and if it was really true that Raoul had won the swordsmanship competition. He looked at everyone and told them that he had unexpectedly ended up standing in front of so many people. Then he asked if everyone was there because of the issues with Baron Jendar. Baron shouted in reply that it was right and that his blood relatives were angry at his unreasonable behavior and had gathered there. Baron suggested that Raoul could apologize to the adults and fix the mess now, but he calmly told everyone that he could assume Baron represented everyone there. As he had promised, he would try to sort out the rights and wrongs. However, Baron interrupted him, finding humor in the idea of discussing rights and wrongs. He told Raoul that the mansion had been managed alternately by blood relatives living in the capital for decades, and that it was not a playground for a young brat from the main family who didn't even know anything. Then the people began to shout that Baron was right and asked if the main family was looking down on them. They also shouted that Count Melvin was too much to think that he had given the authority to represent him to a child. On top of it, Melvin had even provided fewer subsidies when opening additional mansions, and improving methods weren't enough. He knew that at that point, he wouldn't have time to tell them what Baron Jendar had done and why Baron was fired. He thought it was not important right now, and as he expected, things might get more complicated while activating his eyesight skills. He saw that a total of five forces had gathered there. First were Ashton County's blood relatives, who had participated without much thought. Second were the spies of the Imperial Hounds, the intelligence bureau of the Crane and Empire. He thought it was not even shocking because it was obvious that the Empire was behind the conflicts across the continent. But the third category was unexpected because they were knights of the Delamian family, one of the five great families of the Brennan Republic. The man in the front was named Graham, 45 years old, on level 88, with a job of knight advanced sword expert. He belonged to the Reuben Kingdom, Baron Hahn of the Brennan Republic, and the Delamian family. Graham's nickname was the Red Executor, his potential ability was a. His strength was 82, his agility was 72, his stamina was 84, his intelligence was 62, his willpower was 68, his mana was 71, and his senses were 76. Also, his unique traits were tireless body grade A and melee specialist grade B. He saw several mid-tier expert knights other than Graham, but he had no idea why families much stronger than Ashton were flocking there, making him think that it was a pain in the ass. And there were those bastards too, the knights of Randolph I County. The man's name was Raphael, 26 years old, level 61, with a job of knight beginner sword expert, and he belonged to Randolph County. Raphael's nickname was the fourth young master of Randall County, his potential ability was B, his strength was 61, his agility was 65, his stamina was 58, his intelligence was 61, his willpower was 53, his mana was 60 and his senses were 55. Also, his unique traits were royal lineage grade B and agile grade C. He didn't know about Raphael's skills, but he wondered why the fourth young master of Randall County, whose sign itself was a weapon, was there. He guessed that Raphael might be there because of what happened at Mira, but still, Raphael wouldn't be able to move blatantly. Lastly, the fifth one was the traitors of the family who were the culprits behind all the commotion and who would come to the front and take the lead when things went wrong. The man's name was Titus, 27 years old, level 65, with a job of knight intermediate sword expert. 
He belonged to the Reuben Kingdom, Jadon Viscountcy, Brennan Republic, and the Jadon family. Titus's potential ability was a, his strength was 70, his agility was 64, his stamina was 68, his intelligence was 62, his willpower was 65, his mana was 63, and his senses were 58. Also, his unique traits were Royal Lineage Grade A, Straight-Headed Instinct Grade A, and Twisted Fighting Spirit Grade B. He also knew that Titus was his elder cousin and the eldest son of Viscount Jadon, who was his uncle. He knew that his father, Count Melvin D. Ashton, had two brothers, his older brother Jadon and his younger brother Austin. Of the three, Melvin was the most talented, but because of primogeniture, Jadon was expected to be the next count. Jadon was arrogant and violent, so if anything bothered him, he would hurt or kill them. One day, Melvin achieved intermediate expert status and gained more support than Jadon to be the next count. Jadon felt threatened and jealous, and he tried to assassinate Melvin. However, the attempt was stopped, and Jadon lost his privileges. Time passed, and Melvin became the count. Jadon still received the title of Viscount and a large amount of land. But he couldn't accept the fact that he had lost the title of count to his younger brother. Jadon ended up selling his assets to a rival family, Marquis McNeil, and left the kingdom with his followers. All of this happened 15 years ago when Raoul Ashton was born, so seeing Viscount Jadon's son there, Raoul could tell where Baron Jendar stood. He knew that the people there didn't lose anything from the incident 15 years ago, so they didn't have any negative feelings toward Viscount Jadon. They probably thought they had a chance to push them off and take the spot. He remembered that in his past life, the Ashton County split up into multiple factions and fell apart. He guessed that maybe they made the right choice, but that only applied if he wasn't there, and he swore that he'd teach them they had made a big mistake. He signaled to Philip, to which Philip nodded in agreement while he thought that he knew what was going on there, so it was time to make his move. Then Philip struck the stainless drum, creating a loud sound that made everyone silent in shock. He told them that he had heard enough from them and that he would like to say something now. Then he called Bernard and Pierce to hand out books to them, and Bernard and Pierce began to distribute books to everyone in the room. The people looked at the books confused and saw that the book title was a report on the management and financial operations of Count Ashton's estate with attached evidence and investigation materials regarding Baron Jendar's embezzlement and misappropriation. The people began to open the books and all of them were shocked, including Baron who was shaking in anger. Then Baron slammed the book hard on the ground while shouting that it was not real and it was a fake. However, the people thought the book seemed legitimate, though it was hard to believe. Baron angrily told him that he had come there yesterday, yet he claimed to have done all of this while he was there. But he just smiled and asked everyone if they should have some real talk. Then he told Baron that it said that 200 trainees were getting free lessons there and asked Baron where they are now. Baron replied that they gave up and ran away with the equipment. He asked Baron if all 200 had run away and if he was saying that they were all from somewhere else. He found it strange how Baron had chosen every trainee from outside the capital when the point of the free lessons was to gain popularity in the capital. Baron shouted in reply that they all ran away and who he picked was up to him. He calmly agreed and told Baron that there were addresses in the book, so they would find out more about it once they started investigating. They should move on to the next point. Then he told Baron that it said he gave 100 gold swords as presents to other barons. However, according to the investigated report, they had all received 10 gold replicas. It also mentioned that he hired 100 C-rank mercenaries as mansion guards, but he wondered where they were because there was no way 20 rank F mercenaries were all he had. Additionally, there were frequent parties at the main building, such as a celebration for the Baron's son, the Baron's wife's birthday party, the Baron's hunting ceremony, and more. He didn't understand what all those had to do with estate expenses. He closed the book, amazed that he had listed them all, and he had to stay up pretty late to find all of those discrepancies. He remembered that last night, he found out that some of the papers were fake, so he had to sneak into the Baron's house. They found the real book of accounts using his analysis and Pierce's observation skills. Then Bernard organized them all and put them in a book. He used his document copying skill to make multiple copies, so everyone there should now know how much the Baron had embezzled until now. Then he asked everyone if they could see that it seemed like more than half of the estate expenses had been embezzled and if anyone disagreed with firing Baron Jendar. However, no one spoke a word. Then Baron clapped and shouted that it was amazing. Then Baron angrily told him that he really amazed him and asked how long he had prepared for it, if it was one year or two years. He told him that he was a really cunning person. He sighed, wondering what Baron was trying to achieve now. 
and Baron grabbed the book while asking everyone if they sensed something fishy about it. Then Baron shouted that he had never seen such a thoroughly organized temporary report in his life. He explained that a formal investigation might get maybe two or three pages of the report, but Raoul had made a book with 30 pages. Baron shouted to everyone that his nephew was claiming he had made that in a day, but it made no sense, and it was clearly something Raoul had prepared beforehand to try to fire him and restrain the family in the capital. Then the people began to shout that Baron was right, and it had to be political intrigue. Ashton was trying to save his budget, and they were going to decline support for other families if Baron Jendar got fired. Baron shouted at him that they were not going to let it happen and called Jackson. Jackson immediately walked forward with a paper and told him that it was a paper with a list of their requests. If he signed it and left, they would excuse him for today's disrespect. He ordered Jake to check it, and Jake grabbed the paper from Jackson. Then Jake began to read. First, the ownership of the estate had to be transferred to a joint title under the names of Baron Jendar and the other family members. Second, the management of the estate, including stewardship, would be determined by the family members in the capital. Third, they wanted to allow the sword skill exclusively shared within the main family to be shared without restrictions among the members of the branch family. Jake cursed in shock and shouted at everyone that they had all lost their minds. They were all having parties with the money they made from killing monsters, and he told everyone to go fuck themselves. Baron told Jake that he had no right to speak to him and asked if it was really what the main family wanted. Jake squeezed the paper and told Baron that, as he said, he could go away. He also said they were not giving up that house, and that was the most ridiculous idea he had ever heard. Baron grabbed something from his coat and pointed his dagger at Jake while asking how he dared to insult them. Then Pierce and Philip pulled out their weapons, and the other knights on Baron's side drew their swords too. The two sides pointed their weapons at each other. He ordered Jake to stop, and Jake immediately threw the paper. Baron couldn't believe that Jake didn't care that he had pulled out a knife, but he knew that Jake had only pulled it out to threaten him. Those three right there were the best knights in Golden Bear, so he stood no chance. Baron told him that Jake had insulted them, and if he didn't execute Jake and apologize, he would consider him the same. He also said he should apologize if he wanted to avoid bloodshed but he just smiled and told Baron that he meant Jake didn't say anything wrong. Then he stepped on the paper and asked Baron why he didn't stop pretending. He told them that he didn't expect it to be solved with those papers, but he thought Baron would be embarrassed at least. Then he pulled his sword out, raised it, and stabbed it on the stage, telling Baron that he guessed he was a greater person than he thought he was. He asked Baron if he knew that he would never sign that paper over his objections, so he should say what he really wanted. Baron remembered that he had heard the youngest was the weakest and talentless, making him surprised at how strong Raoul was. But he swore that he was not backing out now. Then Baron shouted at him that there was no use trying to bluff, and he couldn't leave that place unless he signed the paper. Then the knight closed the door shut, and Baron confidently told him again that he couldn't leave that place unless he signed the paper, so he should think carefully. He looks at Baron in silence for a moment and tells Baron that he must know that his actions are akin to declaring war against the county. The nobles begin to shout at Baron that it was not what they agreed upon and ask him if he was crazy to go to war against the county. Then the other noble tells him that they are out and they should let them leave. Baron just calls them foolish and tells them that it is too late because they are all in the same boat. Then he asks them if they really think Count Melvin will forgive them. He asks them if they are done talking and asks Baron what his move is because he's not signing the paper. Baron shouts at him, saying that maybe he doesn't understand what is going on there, and that hundreds of knights and guards will run at him on his call. He asks him if he thinks Golden Bear can take them all. Then Baron smirks, thinking that he prepared a secret weapon just in case, and even Golden Bear won't be able to stand against it. Raoul notices that as he expected, some of them are just watching, so it means there is nothing stopping him. Then he asks Baron, so what? While pointing his sword at him, making Baron wonder why Raoul is so confident when he thought he could threaten Raoul with the armed soldiers. Then Baron looks back, knowing that the secret weapon he prepared is the last resort and thinks that if he uses it, it is going to be war. Then he takes out the badge, knowing that he'll have to use it, and it would be easier if Raoul were as weak as the rumor said. Then he shows it to everyone while shouting insults at him with fake documents and disrespecting him in front of many people, he'll find justice. Then Baron throws his badge toward him while calling his full name to request proof of lineage. The people whisper that it was the dual request they could only use once in a lifetime. It was the only way to fight against the superiors, and the opponent was his nephew, which is very forced. He asks Baron if he is serious and why would he accept his request. Baron tells him to consider it as his last mercy and that it will be better than having his seal taken away forcefully. Then he continues by telling Baron that next, he'll get the honor of taking away his nephew's seal through an honorable duel. Baron angrily tells him to decide, and if he declines, he'll have to use force. He thinks for a moment while Baron thinks that he knows his answer even though he acted all strong. 
He asks Baron what the conditions are and tells Baron that he assumes he was not the one dueling. Baron tells him that three from each side and one versus one duel from each side, and the last one standing wins. Also, since it was proof of lineage, he'll have to pick three from the lineage. Philip shouts that there is only Raoul on Ashton's side. And it is not fair, but Baron tells Philip that there are many others of the lineages there, so if they think Raoul is right, they can stand on Raoul's side. And it's not his responsibility if no one stands by Raoul. Philip is about to attack Baron in anger, but Raoul stops him and asks Baron what the bet of the duel is. Then he tells Baron that he'll sign the paper if he loses and asks Baron what he is betting. Baron replies that he didn't think it mattered and asks him if he wants anything from him. He replies that it was a fair duel, so the bets should be fair too, and if he wins, he'd take every family's house that has signed the paper, making the nobles unable to believe it. Then he tells Baron that if he doesn't agree, there is no duel and asks Baron what he says. Baron wonders what he is thinking, knowing that it will only make the other families stand against Raoul, but it is not bad for him, and if he can't get Raoul to sign the paper, those houses are meaningless. So Baron tells him that he agrees and asks him if he is accepting the duel. Philip tells him that there are different ways to do it, and he knows that Philip is right. But he has already decided to accept the duel, and he even got a quest for it, so he was not backing down. While looking at the system showing him the sudden quest named Proof of Lineage, which is grade C, its objective is to win the duel, its extra objective is to win the duel alone. Its description says families in the capital are being unreasonable, so he should shut them down with skill, and the rewards are experience points, coins, and unknown. Then he asked Philip if he thought he was going to lose, and Philip replied that it was not what he meant, and he was just worried that there might be unexpected variables. He tells Philip in the chat system not to worry if he thinks there is going to be a problem because he can break in and interrupt, to which Philip replies that he bets they are thinking the same. He knows that the duel is just for show, and they won't accept the consequences even if they lose, but he still tells Baron that he'll accept the duel and asks who is going to be the judge. Also, he tells Baron that he doesn't want him to be unreasonable after he loses. Baron tells him not to worry and that he has a special guest there. Then Baron asks someone to be the judge, and the man replied that he guessed he had to now. The nobles look at the man wondering who he was and if he was not a guard. Baron introduces the man known for his sword and character in the capital, the rising star of Reuben Kingdom, Raphael de Randall, the Randall Viscounty's fourth son. The knights pointed their swords at Raphael while the nobles asked why Randall's son was there, and Jake called Randall scumbags. Raphael laughingly tells everyone to calm down and explains that he was only there because he was invited and he came to greet Raoul, but he didn't expect that fun and clarified that he meant a tragic event to happen. He tells Raphael that he believes he will be a fair judge, and Raphael replies, of course. Then Raphael called the representatives to stand in the center. He looked around, and as he expected, no one was standing by his side. But he thought it was good for him because he didn't have to decide which one was the better garbage. Then Raphael tells everyone that they should begin the first match and calls Jendar family's third son, Aaron. Aaron thinks Raoul screwed over his party and believes Raoul was the weakest of Ashton. But Raoul was all confident about winning a countryside tournament, so Aaron swears that he'll make Raoul beg. Raphael shouted that the duel started, and Aaron immediately jumped toward him, then launched an attack while telling him that he was done. However, Raoul just used his detection eyesight and attacked Aaron. Raphael raised his hand and shouted that the winner in the first round was Raoul, making everyone shocked that Aaron was down in one shot, while the others asked what happened because they didn't even see it. Baron shakes in anger and calls his son Aaron stupid because he lost his chance to regain their family's honor. Raphael asks if they should start the next match, and Raoul nods his head in agreement. Then a man tells Raphael that he'll go, and Raphael sees a man with long earrings, knowing that the man's name is Baron Kespi, one of the decent swordsmen in the capital, making him excited for the next match. Kespi tells him that they should start right away and attacks him immediately, but Raoul blocks it using his sword. Kespi raises his sword shakily and tells him that his basics were nice. Then they attack and block each other using their swords, while Kespi tells him that he is very steady and his reflexes are on point too, making him understand why Aaron lost in one strike. Kespi furiously lifts up his sword while thinking that it is not something he should use against a kid 20 years younger than him, but he also has a lot on the line. Then Kespi activates his bear strike skill and tells him to take it. Kespi attacks him with it, causing a loud explosion. But Kespi is shocked to see that he blocks the bear strike skill. He wonders what Kespi was thinking using his clumsy iteration of his family's sword arts on him. If Kespi doesn't know that when it comes to the same sword art, he, who learned it systematically, has more advantage. And who would have thought that blocking a mana sword would be that easy? Kespi tells him that he can't believe that the bear strike technique didn't work on him. 
No matter how rotten he was, he wonders if it was because it was Raoul family's technique. Then Kespi raised his sword while asking, how about it? And swung it toward him continuously. But he blocked all of Kespi's attacks using his sword while noticing that it looked like Kespi integrated another sword art he learned in the capital. But at least it was a bit better. Then he heard Noble shouting that he won't last long because he was just a kid with no actual combat experience and he must think that his family's sword arts would work in the capital too. He looks at them knowing that they are losers who gave up their jobs due to an inferiority complex and jealousy, leaving their hometowns to stay in the capital. But he also knows that there are blood relatives who have aptitudes other than swordsmanship and who headed to the capital with bigger dreams. However, those worthy people aren't there because, unlike those losers, they drew a line between the family and themselves and started their own families. Then he held his sword tightly and swung it at Kespi. He tells Kespi that it was such a pity and if he had delved more into the family's sword art instead of trying to make an amalgamation of different sword arts, he might have overcome the wall. Kespi angrily asked him what a young brat like him knew to be blabbering like it and furiously shouted to him that he couldn't think he was advising him who had been mastering the bear crush for the past 15 years, calling him arrogant. Then Kespi attacked him with the Tempest Wolf technique, and a huge wolf appeared in front of him, ready to attack him. The nobles excitedly shouted that Kespi must have learned master sword arts while in the guard troop, and Kespi would really win this time. But when the wolf technique was near him, he glared at it and slashed it in half, making Kespi shocked. Then he ran forward to attack Kespi and tells Kespi that what is important isn't what kind of sword art he learned, but it was how well he learned that sword art. Kespi forwards his sword to block his attack while calling him a fool and asking him if he thinks he can fight him with such a basic sword form. His sword was near to stabbing Kespi, but then he speedily got down and hit Kespi's leg. Kespi wonders what was that sword form and notices that Raoul changed the direction of motion in a flash. Then Kespi wonders what is it now and guesses that it was the fifth form of the bear crush swordsmanship, comb and pierce, while he was launching an attack. Then he swung his sword to attack Kespi, but Kespi blocked it and realized that it was the eighth form, horizontal slash. Then Kespi looked at him, wondering what the next one was, if it was the third form, twist and pierce, or is it vertical slash, the sixth form. Then Kespi blocks his attack once again, thinking that he can't tell what he is going to attack because he was switching sword form so quickly that he can't react. Even though Kespi blocked his attack, Kespi still got slashed in the hand. Kespi endures it while wondering if connecting sword forms like that was possible, knowing that a sword art consists of sword forms. The sword forms are a path that combines basic sword styles such as horizontal slash, vertical slash, and stabbing. However, it was easy to see through those sword forms, so when using swordsmanship, it was common to change them by linking several sword techniques, but that connection happened several times in a short period of time. Moreover, it was so perfect that it was unpredictable, making him wonder if it was the difference in talent. Then Kespi shouted in pain when Raoul hit his hand deeply, making him let go of his sword on the ground. Raoul pointed the tip of his sword at Kespi's neck and told Kespi that just the standard combination of sword forms was enough. Then he asked Kespi if he still thinks that the family's sword arts are lacking after this. Kespi called him a monster bastard and collapsed on the ground on his knee while telling Raoul in his mind that if he has that level of visual acuity, reaction speed, and judgment, the sword arts aren't important. Then Kespi collapsed on the ground. Then Raphael shouted that Raoul was the winner. The nobles couldn't believe that Kespi had been defeated and told Baron that the situation was getting weirder there, and they definitely heard that Adrian hadn't learned swordsmanship properly. Baron told everyone not to worry because Raoul is just a young kid at the level of a sword user and asked if doesn't everyone know who the last contestant was. The nobles cheered that if it was him, no matter how amazing the family's sword arts were, that's all they were. Then Raphael told everyone that he was calling the last contestant to the front and thought that it was pretty entertaining because he gets to watch those Ashton bastards, who are such a thorn in their eyes, eat away at their own flesh. He'd like the little kid to lose, but honestly speaking, who wins has nothing to do with him. Suddenly, a man said it was finally his turn, making Raphael wonder if it was Dave, and he wasn't exactly a memorable one. Also, he was the eldest son of Baron Jendar, a bit older than him. Then Raphael smiled, thinking it didn't matter, and told Raoul to struggle until the end. Then Raphael told everyone that the third match begins. Then the man entered the center, breaking the ground in the process, and Baron Dave, the third representative of the Jendar family, entered. He was surprised to see Dave and asked himself who would have thought they'd put in that much effort. Dave called him little kid and told him that he won't say it twice so he should give up on the match while he is being nice. If he doesn't, he will cut off his limbs with that sword. Also, if he plans on dealing with him with those stupid sword arts, it'll be a good idea to quit. The nobles cheerfully told everyone to look at that clear mana blade of Dave, and as they expected from Dave, experts are certainly different. He told Dave to stop saying useless nonsense and bring it on. 
Dave jumped toward him and told him that he'll give him what he wants, but he shouldn't resent him later. Then Dave swung his sword toward him, but he just easily slashed it in half. Then he jumped and launched his sword at Dave to attack back. But Dave blocked it and swung him away, making him push back, while Dave told him that he was so good at attacking while making noises and asked him why he didn't keep it up. He looked at Dave's mana blade, wondering if the physical increase was that much and wondered how long the effect would last while he continuously blocked Dave's attacks using his sword. Then he noticed something, and as he thought, it didn't last long while looking at Dave's mana blade that slowly decreased. Dave swung his sword backward to get force and asked him if he was just going to keep blocking, making him surprised. He managed to block Dave's attack, but he still got hurt, and he noticed that it had cracked his blade. He knew that if the user's intermediate mana sword collides with an expert's mana blade, an average sword is bound to break. But as he thought, it wasn't a real mana blade, and now that he had seen everything, he wondered if he should wrap it up. Then he jumped, making Dave surprised, and appeared beside Dave, calling Dave a fake expert and an empire's dog. Dave raised his sword to attack him while calling him arrogant, but he just swung his sword forward to counter-attack. When he hit Dave's sword, his sword shattered into pieces because of the force, and it made Dave push back a little. Then he launched his fist forward and punched Dave in the face. Dave managed to compose himself to avoid falling, but he launched his fist again and told Dave to rest in peace. Then he punched Dave in the face, sending Dave flying away and slam into the stairs hard, making Dave release blood from his nose while he was calling the judge. Raphael tells everyone that the winner is Raul and declares Raul to be the winner. Then he walks silently back onto the stage with his people and grabs his destroyed sword while saying it was unfortunate because he liked that sword. Philip respectfully tells him that he did nice work, but he just tells Philip that it wasn't that hard. Also, he orders Philip that when that is over, he should arrest the one he just went against because he thinks Dave has the Empire's stigma on his body, making Philip surprised and agree with him. Then he tells him that Dave's movements also seemed unusual from his perspective. Then Pierce tells him that he brought an extra sword. He grabs the sword Pierce gives him and asks everyone what he should do. Baron wonders how it happened, knowing that Dave did bend the rules, but Dave is still a sword expert, and why is his son lying down there instead of that kid Raoul? Then Baron shouted that Raoul was a fraud and Raoul must have done something, so the duel was cancelled and it didn't count. Then Baron looks around, thinking that it is useless and everything is falling apart. Then he remembers the papers and thinks he has to hold on to those papers because it is the only way he can stand next to Jadon or the Randall family. Then Baron orders his people to take the papers from Raoul and asks them what they are doing. Then he tells everyone that there is no going back and orders them to charge him. He smiles because he expected it and tells his knights that they should play along with them for now, making Jake excitedly shout that he was waiting for it. Suddenly, someone shouted to the enemy not to go near Raoul. He looked at the people in front of him, thinking that it was unexpected, and the servants there were supporting them. Then the fight begins, the nobles on Baron's side fight with the servants of the mansion, which is on Raoul's side. He knows that he has to figure out what is going on, and then the system pops in front of him, making him understand that it seems like he stumbled into an unexpected treasure. Baron called the servants inferior vermin and asked them how dare they stab them in the back, and if it was how they return their favor. But one of the servants asked Baron what he meant by favor when he was the one who took away the donations meant for them, and they hated the county only because they didn't know he was the one stealing it. Also, if it wasn't for Raoul, they would have been enslaved by him forever. He knows that those are the people who were recommended by Ashton County to enter the Royal Academy. They did well in the coming-of-age tournament and received a scholarship from the county to attend the academy. Since the academy's dorms are closed during the break, they had to stay in the mansion, and their living expenses were supposed to be subsidized during the break. However, Baron Jendar took them all, and Baron even used them as servants to save on servant employment costs. Jake tells him that it was crazy and Baron did so much just to steal. No wonder Baron was in charge there. He tells Jake that, in the end, they gave power to the wrong person, and he doesn't think Baron was like this from the beginning. Jake asks him what they should do because someone will get hurt if they really start fighting. He tells Jake not to worry because he is about to get there, making Jake ask him who he is talking about. Suddenly, the door opens, shocking everyone, and a huge man orders the guard to move and asks them who they think he is. Baron asks the guard what is going on and who it is. One of the guards reports to Baron that they are in trouble, but then one of the guards shouts in pain when someone steps on him, and the huge man asks them who it was who is swinging a sword inside Ashton County's mansion. The people are shocked to see an inhuman-sized body and notice that the man's arm is the size of a man man's waist, making them realize that he must be Dylan and ask why the Count's heir is there. Dylan walks forward with a lot of top knights behind him. One of Baron's guards is stunned in shock, and Dylan angrily looks at the man, then throws the man hard against the window. Dylan orders them to stay down and asks where that kid is while the people around him ask how it's possible, and the others reply that Dylan is the strongest in the kingdom. 
Then Dylan sees Raoul on the stage, so Dylan pierces his sword into the ground and grabs Raoul while sweetly calling him his youngest brother. Then Dylan lifts him up while asking him how he's doing, if anyone bullies him, and if he is eating and sleeping well. Dylan also asks him if he's okay, and he tells Dylan that he is getting dizzy, so he should let him go, making Dylan laugh and put him down. Dylan tells him that he has grown a lot in the last two months, but it's not enough because if he were a man, he'd have to grow nice muscles like his. He asks Dylan if by any chance, he came all the way from home like that, and Dylan laughingly replies that of course he did because clothes feel uncomfortable nowadays, and it feels nice to show his muscular body to everyone in the capital. This makes him frustrated, thinking that the Count's heir is walking around the capital without a shirt on. Then Dylan pats his head while telling him that, whatever it is, a man has to stay healthy, and if he had a wonderful body like his, those clowns over there wouldn't even have tried to pull out their swords against him. Then Dylan pulls his sword while asking if they shall end it and asks everyone there how dare they, shitters, pull out a sword in Ashton Mansion. Then the knights with Dylan raise their swords to the nobles. Raoul knows that it should be over now, but he wonders what Dylan is thinking about by bringing the vice captain and all high-ranking knights. He noticed that there were 25 intermediate sword experts and they could easily overpower the Baron's family. Baron fearfully cursed in his mind, realizing that he was trying to turn the tables, but he was done for now. Baron noticed that Randall's fourth son, Raphael, was busy hiding, and the Brennan Republic knights that he had as his secret weapon had turned away. Dylan started to walk around, saying that they should see who was there. Then, Dylan immediately looked to his side and saw Raphael. He ordered Raphael to greet his brother. Raphael greeted Dylan, saying it had been a long time since they'd seen each other, and Dylan put his hand on Raphael's shoulder while telling him that he still looked the same. Dylan asked Raphael which son he was, and Raphael replied, fourth. Dylan asked Raphael if he still bullies kids with the third and the sixth. Raphael replied, shoutingly, no, and added that it was a long time ago. Dylan angrily asked Raphael if he was getting mad at him, and Raphael shook in fear while replying, of course not. Dylan dusted Raphael's shoulder while telling him that it seemed like he had his fun today, and he wouldn't be able to talk with him again if he stayed like that. He mentioned that it was a family problem now, and he wanted Raphael to stay out of it. Then Dylan asked Raphael if that's what he wanted, and if he wanted to stay and talk with him. Raphael shatteringly replied that he had things to do at home and Dylan told him to go ahead. Raphael walked away, holding his hurting shoulder, while Dylan told him to tell the first son of Randall to come see him if he ever wanted to duel. Then Dylan ordered everyone to leave because it was a family matter, but anyone who had pulled out their weapon had to stay because they needed to talk. Then he asked them what was good and asked Baron where the paper he wanted to be signed was. On the same night, he thanked Dylan for coming and asked if he didn't think it was too much. Dylan laughingly asked him back if he thought so, and he replied that he had brought the vice captain and many other knights, so there were many people. He also asked Dylan about his wife and son. Dylan laughingly told him that he had asked for help, so of course, he had to bring his best. He also told Dylan that he still thought it was too much, and he had contacted him late last night, so Dylan must have hurried to gather everyone and come to the capital. Dylan told him that he knew why he did all of it and asked him why he thought their father gave him the stamp. He then told him that it was easier to sort it out because he came. He knows that Dylan was right, and if it wasn't for the air coming there, it would have been much harder. Dylan got there very quickly through the portal. He thought it must have cost Dylan around 3,000 gold coins to get everyone there through the portal, but he decided to stop thinking about it. He asks Dylan what he is going to do about them when there are around 30 people, and Dylan angrily replies that they will pay for their sins, and he won't let them get away. He tells Dylan that they are still their father's brothers and asks if he thinks their father will be okay with it. Dylan smilingly tells him that their father didn't say anything, so it's their chance to get rid of them. They've forgiven them for so long, and their funds grew scarce because of them. He noticed that it seemed like it was Dylan who planned it, not their father. The Cafe Link also said Dylan Ashton is very political and good at calculations, making him think that with brains along with brawn, Dylan was definitely overpowered. Dylan patted his head while telling him that he didn't look good and asked him if it was because he might kill them. He then tells him not to worry because he was just going to cut their funds, and he was proud of him for doing good work today. He tells Dylan that he didn't do anything and he just ran straight at them because they were being annoying. Suddenly, Dylan hugged him sweetly while shouting that he was a cutie and asked him what he meant by doing nothing when he came up with the report and beat them in the duel. He tells Dylan to do it to Livy instead because he is a full-grown adult now. Dylan shakes him while telling him that he wants to do it to Livy, but his sister-in-law doesn't let him touch Livy. He wonders why, when he is Livy's father, but he doesn't think Dylan will land those big hands on Livy anytime soon. Then he tells Dylan that he has something to tell him. 
he gives a paper to Dylan and explains that it is the paper record of him and Baron Jendar's proof of lineage and asks Dylan what he should do with it. Dylan looks at the records and tells him that the houses of all 27 people who asked for his stamp are now in his possession, and they are his now, so he can do as he wants. Then he asks him if he needs his help. He is surprised to hear it, knowing that it is worth at least 100k gold, and he thought the family would take care of it since it is a family dispute. Dylan tells him that it is the reward he earned by fairly dueling against them, and they are rightfully his, so he doesn't have to worry about him or the family. Then he reminds him that he always tells him that a man has to be confident, and he is a son of Ashton, so he has to be even more confident because he deserves it. He grabs the paper while telling Dylan that he understands, and he'll try to be a confident man. Then he asks Dylan if he can ask him a favor and if he can take care of it for him. But he can leave Baron Jendar's house because he wants to use it. He knows that the paper's value is different depending on who is holding it, and it is going to be a lot of work to sell them all. Dylan replied that he got it and he would take care of them. He assured him that he wouldn't lose a single bit of it and promised to teach him something as a reward too. He told him to meet him at the field in the morning. He asked Dylan what the reward would be, and Dylan stood up to flex his muscles, telling him that he would teach him how to build those perfect muscles. Then he asked if he was excited and if he was thrilled to learn, to which he shockingly replied that he most definitely was. Dylan told him that, of course, he was excited, and their father and Lawrence were also curious, but he would only teach him. This made him wonder if Dylan really had a secret way to build muscles because he was curious too. Then he spent a hellish month with his brother and swore to never train with Dylan again. Finally, the day of the academy admission came. Bernard told him to be safe and wished for his great results on his placement exam. He waved goodbye to Bernard while saying he would go easy on it because there was no need to go too hard on a children's test, and he would be back. Dylan asked him if he was really going to go easy, to which he replied yes, and asked Dylan if there was a need to try hard. Dylan told him that he would go back when his admission was over, and he shouldn't worry about him. He was confused because he thought Dylan would tell him to try his best. He thought he could go easy on the exam and just graduate from the academy because the academy was just an excuse to get away from home and not his true purpose. Also, trying to fit in with the kids would only tire him out, so he told himself to just go easy. Later, they arrived at the academy and saw a lot of people walking toward it. He told Dylan that it was pretty busy out there, and he didn't expect admission day to be that busy. Dylan told him that this year was special, and people who delayed their admission were all there now. He wondered if something had happened, knowing that the Café Link didn't have any information about the Academy. He even got the list of nobles who were expected to enter that year, so there must be something happening. However, he was not expecting too much from Academy life, so it shouldn't matter. But then he was shocked to see banners congratulating Gerald D. Rubin, Templeton family's proud young master Dalton, Caleb D. Randall, and his name for their admission. He asked Philip what it was when he said there would be no lineages of warrior families this year, and why there were so many names of lineages, even the prince was there. Philip replied that there was no news about it when they left Mira. He sighed, realizing that he didn't get any news because he spent a month training with his brother Dylan, and even Bernard was busy taking care of the housing problem. But then he noticed his brother trying not to laugh, making him ask Dylan if he could explain what was going on and if he knew about it. However, Dylan just winked at him while telling him that he would soon find out and that he should go easy on the exams. Then he sweetly congratulated him for his admission. He looked at Dylan suspiciously, knowing that something was going to go wrong. But he decided to go inside, and they began to walk in. He called Jake and Pierce to ask if they could go around and gather information and let him know what the test center was like. They both replied yes while Dylan was walking out of the academy. He thought it was a pain in the ass, and there were supposed to be only easy ones there. Also, he could tell there were many higher-up nobles present. He said that he didn't want to contend with kids his age, making Philip ask him what he was saying. But he told Philip not to worry about it because he was just talking to himself. He decided not to worry about it because he could still proceed with his plan. Suddenly, someone shouted for everyone to pay attention because the admission ceremony would begin shortly. Then a man told everyone that he sincerely welcomed them to the Reuben Kingdom Academy, and next, they would be introducing the staff members. He knew that he had already researched the staff members, so he wouldn't have to pay attention. However, he was shocked to see someone appear on the stage while the host said that he would be the Academy's temporary vice president as well as the Magic and Administration Department president. Then, the man introduced Alfredo Gray. He knew that Gray was one of three sages on the continent, an eighth circle archwizard, making him wonder why Alfredo was there. Gray greeted them and introduced himself as Gray, the temporary vice president of the Academy, and a member of the prestigious and venerable Reuben Kingdom Academy. 
Raoul knew that the 8th Circle Archwizard, Grey, with his unparalleled illusion and vision magic skills, was also known for his alchemy. This made him wonder what had brought Grey to the Academy. Grey was known for wandering around and was even known as the Nomadic Sage. Even the Grey Tower had to request their own master's location from the Information Guild. This made him question if the person on stage was truly the Vice President of the Academy. It was different from what he had expected because Grey was supposed to show himself after the alliances were formed. Grey told everyone that the Academy would include vision magic training in the curriculum, and that they would be demonstrating it in the placement exam. Then, Spence D. Templeton, the president of the Academy, told everyone that, as Vice President Gray had mentioned, there would be changes in that year's curriculum, and the placement exam materials had been updated accordingly. Students should pay attention to the shared material. He thought it was probably still around the same level and had already planned on taking it easy. Spence told everyone that there would be a special reward for one outstanding student in the placement exam, and wished everyone good luck. Then, the system popped up in front of him while he was thinking. He had believed that the test was just for dividing classes, and he had never heard about a reward. But what shocked him more was that the system presented a scenario quest called Placement Exam, with an unknown grade. The objective was to get into the S class through the Placement Exam, and the extra objective was to top the Placement Exam. The penalty stated that if he failed to get into the S class, 5% of skill mastery would be deducted while attending the academy. The description mentioned that there were many prodigies entering the academy that year, making it his chance to increase his family's prestige. The rewards included experience points, coins, and an extra reward depending on the result, making him think that the quest wasn't that difficult. He knew that the Academy's sword department had five classes, S, A, B, C, and D. The top 60 out of the 600 students could get into the S class, so it would be easy. However, the important part was whether he should aim for the top. He thought he didn't even know the reward for being at the top, so there might not be a need for it. Then Jake reported to him that they said it's a special reward but it didn't seem that special, while handing him the paper. He grabbed the paper and wrote down the top student's perks, which included access to every floor of the Academy Library, a personal training center with vision magic training facilities, and personal items from the Academy Workshop. He thought it was incredible and that he had to aim for the top because they were offering training centers, access to the library, and personal items from the Academy Workshop. He knew that the Academy's lectures increased skill mastery, but he couldn't gain experience or any rewards from them. The reason he had chosen to come to the academy was to meet an important person outside his homeland. He also admitted that hunting monsters and exploring dungeons were more worth his time than listening to lectures. However, if there was vision magic installed in the training center, things would be different, and every summoned monster might be fake. But he could still gain experience points. The only problem is the cost to maintain the magic, but if it were free, he wouldn't have to worry about it. The other reward was the library, which was full of hidden pieces, and he could get hidden quests and skill books with the right information. He also knew that the library's floors were divided by years, but he could access all of them. He thought he would have to wait at least three years to fully use the academy facilities, but if he got to the top, it would save him a lot of time. Then Spence told everyone that the test was starting soon and called all the freshmen to gather at the plaza. He clenched his hand in confidence, thinking that it would be easy. He walked toward the plaza with other freshmen, but then someone called him from behind. The man asked him if he was the Ashton Kid. He knew it was another Randall and asked the man who he was. Then he told the man that he looked more like a kid than him. The man angrily said that he was as arrogant as the rumors said and that it was why people called the Ashtons rude and creepy. He just turned around, telling the man that he didn't know who he was and that he was busy, so he would go. The man tried to stop him and grab him, but then a hand blocked the man, and Jake told the man that he didn't know which family he was from, but he should stop. The man angrily asked Jake who he was and ordered Jake to move. But Jake just told the man that he didn't want to make a scene there. Then the man whispered to the man that there were too many people watching making the man cuss and shout that Ashton kids always creeped him out. Then he called Raoul an arrogant person and said he would teach him his place, but Raoul just turned around and walked away in silence while Philip and Jake glared at the man in anger. Later, the freshmen were lined up in the center of the plaza, and he noticed students who came to cheer for their families. He could also see big names like the best knight in the kingdom, Duke Marquis Templeton, the Marquis McNeil's family with an intermediate axe master, Marquis Clifford, and the rising Randall Viscounty. He knew that these three families had many students already attending and had great influence inside the academy, giving him an idea of how the place was run. Jake excitedly told him that it was like a festival because he could see many ladies, and he understood why Philip wanted to come there. Philip glared at Jake, making Jake clarify that he already knew their young master, Raoul, would be at the top, and he really wanted to see their faces when Raoul was at the top. Then Jake noticed Raoul's fans struggling and asked if they weren't from their family. 
Jake sighed, saying that he couldn't believe they were falling behind in a situation like this, and wished him good luck because he'd go take care of them. Philip bowed respectfully to him, and he told them that he would see them later, as he looked at the paper to check the exam instructions and the list of freshmen. He saw familiar names that made him wonder why they were all there. Many of these names were well known in his past life, especially Dalton from Templeton and James from McNeil, who were expected to reach the master level in 10 years. He realized that it wouldn't be as easy as he thought. Someone then announced that the first test would begin soon, and they should move to the small auditorium. He smiled, thinking that they were still just kids, and in his mind, he apologized to them because the top spot was already his. Later, the placement exam began, and the first test was a written exam. He knew that he didn't have to study for a written test since Cafe Link and the system community had all the information he needed. The written test was completed quickly. The second test was the physical strength test, and the man instructed them to enter the gym in groups and follow the invigilator's instructions inside. He entered the gym and was shocked to realize that it was a mono restriction field. The instructor shouted that it was solely for testing physical strength, and they couldn't use mana under any circumstances. He ordered them to step up when they heard their names and follow the instructions. He looked at the machine in the center, thinking it might be a punching machine, but the data indicated it was a strength meter. However, it definitely looked like a punching machine. The instructor called someone and told them to hit the machine. The person positioned their feet, launched their fist forward, and hit the machine with force. The instructor announced that student number 202 had scored 1,418 points and called the next one. He noticed that they recorded the highest score of two attempts, and the average seemed to be between 1,000 and 1,500 points. He thought the scores were not very high. However, he was shocked to see the man in front of him. The man had a stamina stat of 43 and a strength stat of 50. The man was also in the top 5 of his group, so he decided to see what the man had. When the man launches his fist and hit the machine, he reached a score of 2,250 points. The instructor exclaimed that it was an outstanding score for someone from McNeil, and it was remarkably high. He realized that this man was the first to score over 2,000 points, and now he had a sense of the competition level. Meanwhile, in some private room, the higher-ups are watching the test on CCTV while someone is saying that, as they are the kingdom of knights, those scores are generally high, and the quality of freshmen that year is pretty high compared to past years. Also, everyone applied to the academy after hearing about Gray. Gray tells everyone that students below the age of 20 are scoring over 1,000, and the students at Leslie Kingdom Academy would be frightened. The man laughingly tells Gray that they are flattered, and the academy at Leslie mainly deals with magic. The bald man also tells Gray that he is still curious about what made him come to that academy when, even a month ago, the tower said that they shouldn't be expecting anyone. Gray replied that, like he said, he wanted to see how his newly developed magic circle works in person and it makes it sound like he was using the students as experimental subjects. The higher-ups awkwardly tell him no and that they are thankful that he allowed them to implement his new magic circle, then tell him that he is even funding the training magic circle for the top student. He tells them that looking at all those young students makes him feel glad that he came and he heard there are many students from warrior families. Spence replied yes and told him that it was what everyone was there for. Also, he introduced him earlier, then Randall's son stepped up to take the test, making Spence tell Gray that it was he was talking about, and Gray asked the man if that kid was the 13th son of Randall. The Kenny D. Randall, Viscount Randall, replied that his 13th son's name was Caleb, and the Lord trained Caleb since his talent was outstanding. McKenny also tells Gray that Caleb asked him to let him into the academy, to which Gray replied that he understood and was looking forward to it. Then Caleb launched his fist forward and hit the machine hard. Then the machine showed that Caleb got 3,005 points, making the higher-ups surprised and shout that Caleb was different, and they saw why McKenny favors Caleb so much. The man next to Gray thinks that Randalls are indeed different and there's a long way before they catch up to them while McKenny is laughing proudly, and Spence tells everyone that the next one is interesting. Then Spence introduces James, from Macquies McNeil's family, the current Lord Clifford's direct grandson. Gray asks Spence if James is the one the Order of Chivalry wants, and Spence replies yes, then tells Gray that he heard James's talent is beyond the level of the Academy. Then James swung his fist speedily and hit the machine, but James continued punching the machine while his points from 3,500 increased to 3,612, making the higher-ups cuss in shock that James went past 3,500 both times, and they all knew that it was the highest score ever recorded by a freshman. Gray claps while telling them that it was amazing. When that machine came out, even the knights barely scored above 3,000. Then Spence tells everyone that the next one is forwarding, 
Someone asked Spence if that kid was Dalton, and Spence replied that he heard Dalton was a Swordmaster's grandson, and it was Dalton's first public appearance. Dalton hits the machine and scores 2,900 points, making them shocked, but one of them asks what was wrong with their reaction when it was lower than the last student's score. The pink-haired man explains that Dalton hit it with one arm behind his back. Then Dalton glares at them from CCTV, making them silent. In the second score of Dalton, he gets 3,008 points. Spence laughingly tells everyone that he forced Dalton to join the academy, and Dalton doesn't seem happy about it. The men ask if Dalton really got that score with one arm behind his back and what would happen if Dalton hit seriously, but they expected it from Templeton, the title of the strongest fist. McKenny irritably asks them why don't they go for a meal because they all know the ranking already, and there is no need to keep watching, but Gray tells McKenny that he is pretty sure there is one more left from the famous families. McKenny tells Gray that they don't need to watch him because the rumors say that Raul wouldn't have made it there without his family's recommendation, and Raul is only 15, making everyone surprised knowing that most of the freshmen there are around 19 and asks how Raul is going to compete against them. McKenny explains to them that he meant there were students who gave up on graduation from the academy, and only came for the experience. Also, it is a very unfortunate case for a son of a warrior family. Suddenly, someone makes a sleeping sound, making everyone look at the door and see Dylan laughing. Dylan tells them that he was trying to stay quiet, and McKenny is surprised to see Dylan there, but Gray just tells Dylan that he is the man from Ashton who he spoke to earlier, and he was well-mannered and convincing, unlike his appearance. Dylan walks closer toward them while telling Gray that it was an honor for him, and Gray asks him how could he forget that amazing body and intimidating face. Then Gray tells Dylan that he was curious about why he laughed and asks him if he can tell them why. Dylan looks at McKenny while replying that it was funny hearing old men talking and believing in only what one already knows is called egotism. But if it was he remembered correctly, making McKenny angrily ask him what he said. Dylan asks McKenny if he said Raul is there just for the experience because Raul came to the academy at the age of 15, and if he had ever thought about it the other way around that maybe Raul came early because Raul had nothing to learn from the academy. McKenny shouts, telling Dylan to stop his nonsense because no one has ever graduated from the academy before 20, and there is no way that a 15-year-old kid can do it. But Dylan calmly tells McKenny that there is no guarantee that it won't happen because it has never happened. McKenny tells Dylan that he was so arrogant and asks him if he was saying that his brother can leave a mark in the academy's history. Dylan replies that he doesn't know because he is not a prophet, but Dylan is curious too about what Raoul was actually thinking. McKenny tells Dylan that he was all talk and no substance, which is typical of Ashton. Spence tells them that it is enough and they should not embarrass themselves in front of their guests. Then Spence asks who the freshman from Ashton is, and the man points at the screen while asking if it was him. Then they are all surprised to see that Raoul's face is glowing and ask if they are sure they are brothers. Dylan proudly replies that the kid on the screen was definitely his youngest brother, Raoul, and Raoul is their family's gem. The men notice Raoul's figure and think that with Raoul's figure, the lack of sword skills is excused and ask if there is anyone single in their family, making McKenny pissed and shout to everyone to be quiet because there is no need to talk so much about a man's face. Dylan knows that McKenny is trying so hard because he knows about Raoul's skills because of the Baron Jendar incident, so McKenny is trying to turn their attention toward his 13th son, which is hilarious. Then Dylan looks at his youngest brother approaching the machine while wondering if Raoul really going to go easy and hopes that Raoul tries his best because of the situation there. Also, he was worried since he said too much. Raoul positioned himself, exhaled, and swung his fist forward, then hit the machine hard, making Spence shout that it was perfect and thought that if he could rate Raoul himself, he would give Raoul a perfect score. Then Raoul's first score was 2,999 points, making everyone shout that it was close, but Spence thinks it is still impressive for a 15-year-old kid, and if only Raoul came a year later, it would be better. Then they saw that Raoul was getting ready for the next hit, while Raoul thinks that it was good because it was going as he planned. The few higher-ups cheered for Raoul to get him 3,000 points and tell him not to be discouraged by his age and hit it with courage. Then Raoul positioned his feet once more and launches his fist forward for his next score, and then hit the machine hard, which made a few of the higher-ups cheered for him. Dylan clenched his fist proudly because Raoul scored 3,615 points, exactly three points higher than the highest score, making him think that Raoul is a clever guy and Raoul really planned it out. The students around Raoul are stunned, looking at him, and the instructor tells him that it was good, and he should get back to his seat, to which he does and exhales because everything went as he planned. Then he walks toward his seat while the students are silently staring at him. He sits down, sighing, and opens the system to see that he has the highest score in test site numbers with 2,820 points, test site number 2 with 3,612 points, the same as test site numbers 4 and 5. 
then the system tells him to stay tuned and make sure to record the scores. Also, when the test is over, report the students with scores above 2,500 in order, then he exits it. He looks around, wondering if anyone has noticed, and he knows that when he reaches the level of an expert, his physical strength grows exponentially, and the hell training his brother made him go through raised his strength stats to 68, so he could have gotten 4,000 easily but he had to match the freshman level, which is why he had to gather information and pretend to do his best, and use psychokinesis to reduce the impact when he punched. Also, he had to use the calculator from the game system to make sure he hit the right spot. He doesn't know if he had to do all of it, but the real threat is still unknown, so he thinks it is better to hide as much as he can. He decided to hide it until the other players showed up, knowing that his power, in particular, were ones that people would find strange because when he showed off his power as rank 1 in his last life. As a result, the guilds analyzed his skills and hunted him down, so he had to run away constantly and eventually lost his life. He swears that he was not doing that stupid shit again, so he'll hide himself and kill the show-offs because he was the hunter now. Suddenly, the instructor tells them that the first test is almost over, so they should prepare for the next one, making him surprised and realize that he was thinking too much. Then he decided to check his status before the test ended, and the system showed him that he was currently level 5556 hardcore mode, his class is a knight with beginner sword expert, and intermediate psychokinetic. Also, his other stats got stronger a bit. Then he saw in the textbook that the next test was the obstacle course, and he knew that it would be mainly about strength and agility, so he'd have to control himself. Then he hoped that Dalton and James do their best this time because he wanted to see where he was at. It was a blessing to be a descendant of the Swordmaster, Duke Marquis, family, but it comes with a fair share of responsibilities. Duke Marquis never forced his children to learn the way of the sword, but his children wanted to keep the number one title, so they did their best. Dalton is unhappy when people tell him to make sure to do his best so as not to tarnish his grandfather's reputation, and as the Swordmaster's grandson, he better win that tournament because of Dalton's talent, he was forced to be the best. Dalton became better than most people his age, but it stressed Dalton out because he had a carefree personality, so he chose to enter the academy to get away from the boring training. Dalton looked at the scoreboard, wondering why there was a test on the first day of admission, and why everyone was so loud right now. He thought that he should have just stayed home and slept, but Dalton was shocked to see the final scoreboard because it was not what he was expecting. Dalton couldn't believe that James was in second place and knew that he had won against James every time, but James was the best he had ever gone against, making him unable to believe that there was someone better than James. Dalton thought it was interesting while the instructor oriented them that they would now move to the next testing site, so they should line up. Then the students stood up while Dalton looked around, wondering if the first place was a guy named Raoul, and remembered that he saw Raoul somewhere. Then Dalton asked him if he is Raoul, he looks at Dalton and asks him who he is, making Dalton confused, and replies that he is Dalton. Dalton feels like he just saw a glimpse of a golden shine in Raoul's eyes and admits that Raoul is good looking, but Raoul is not on his level. He turns around and tells Dalton that if there is nothing, he'll excuse himself, making Dalton surprised. Dalton knows that it's been a while since he has been rejected like that, and there is no way Raoul doesn't know who he is because people tend to talk to him more when they know who he is, which makes it a fresh reaction for him and makes him more curious. Dalton wonders what kind of face Raoul will make when he loses to him on the test. A few minutes later, in the second test site, Raoul knows that the test is simple because they will only check how fast they can go through the obstacles. But the problem is they have to run with a full body set of steel armor, and there are a few traps placed in the course. Then the instructor shouted that student numbers 20 and 30 are out, making the left student surprised and asking how many have been disqualified already. He noticed that they were low-ranking students, but 100 people already failed the test, so there must have been something while he heard someone saying that he heard that they changed something in the test when vice President Gray came, and the others asked what they had changed because now no one's passing. Then he saw on the screen that the people passed with 13 minutes 33 seconds and 12 minutes 52 seconds. A little later, he saw someone finished in 9 minutes and 12 seconds, making him notice that it was the best time. Then he stands up to see how fast they go now, while Dalton just woke up, knowing that it's almost his turn, so he should get ready. Dalton yawningly asked if it was his turn already. He asked their group chat if anything special, and someone replied that nothing special yet, and the best score right now was 7 minutes and some change. He ordered them to check every single one and let him know, also, keep him updated on his group. To which they replied yes while he was noticing that there were too many tests going on at the same time, making it hard to match the time, so he planned to try his best to monitor all of them. 
The instructor called Raoul and told him that he'd explain the rules, to which he replied yes. Then the instructor explained to him that all the traps and obstacles were illusion spells, but the damage would be the same as if it were real. Also, it would be recorded, and if the damage recorded is beyond the damage his armor can take, he was out, to which he replied that he understood. Then the instructor told him to begin, and he immediately ran. He noticed that the armor was old and heavy, which was hard to move, making him understand why so many failed at the beginning. But it was not too much for him because he grew stronger after reaching the expert level. Suddenly, he saw obstacle number one, Torrent, and he ran on, noticing that it was an illusion spell. But it looked very real, making him wonder how many mana stones they used and if they installed all those just for the admission tests. Then he jumped off the obstacles, thinking that it was a waste, and entered obstacle number two, Forest Traps. He stepped on one of the traps, and arrows flew toward him. But he easily dodged them and continued running and dodging the sharp traps in the forest. He blocked the knife heading toward him with his sword while he was noticing that it was about time for new ones, and then the system popped up while he was blocking the knife. Then he put his sword back on his back and speedily jumped away to avoid the groundbreaking. He jumped tree by tree to safely dodge the ground collapsing beneath him while he was busy reading his men's report that James and Dalton are going really fast, and they will pass the test in around 5 minutes. He asked his men if there is anyone else special, and someone replied that Caleb from Randall is going fast, but Caleb is not on James and Dalton's level. Then some of his men also reported to him that he sees some good ones there and he can tell they are relaxed by the way they are dodging the traps, like they seem not to care about their records. He ordered his men to record them separately and keep updating him on James and Dalton's progress. Then he stopped to see a swinging bridge in front of him. Then he noticed that those were fireball shooters, making him think that it would be annoying. But it won't stop him, so he pulled out his sword and he continued running. Then he lifted his feet up and jumped onto the bridge, speeding forward. He knew that if he maintained that speed, he could run fast across the bridge. However, he felt the strong wind and the bridge shaking, causing him to lose his balance. Fireballs were then released, flying toward him and taking him by surprise. He knew he was going to fall, but he composed himself and sliced the fireballs with his sword. He knew it would be easier if he used a mana blade, but he couldn't reveal it yet. So, he ran forward, slashing at the fireballs coming at him, thinking that it should be enough. Seconds later, he made it out of the bridge and continued running, knowing that the only thing left was the cave part of the course. He entered the cave, aware that the traps inside would be harder to dodge and therefore more dangerous. However, he couldn't stop because there was always a way. On the other hand, arrows flew toward James, but he blocked them using his shield and broke them, finding it annoying. He questioned why he was there. James was irritated, thinking that attending an academy at his age was already annoying, especially being around what he considered inferior people. James had already won in a tournament mostly participated in by people in their 20s and had experience as a capital guard. He believed it was a waste of time for him, as he was soon to be a knight. James was frustrated because he wouldn't have come there if it weren't for his lord's direct orders. There was even a kid from Dalton and a kid from Ashton, making everything more annoying. However, he knew that by putting the task aside, if he lost the top position to them, he would be a total failure. Then he wondered when that cave was going to end. James saw the end of the cave, ran toward it, broke the arrows heading toward him, and jumped out of the cave, landing in front of the screen showing his time was 5 minutes and 15 seconds. He thought he was the winner. James turned around, thinking it would definitely put him in the top spot. However, one of the students told everyone to look at the screen. When he did, he was surprised to see Dalton in first place with a time of 4 minutes and 58 seconds, wondering how it happened. The students asked how and shouted that they wouldn't be able to get that score even if the course was a straight line. Dalton walked toward them, thinking he was warmed up now. James thinks Dalton a bastard in anger because his plan was all messed up. The students told each other that Dalton wasn't even tired. Dalton said he didn't see Raoul and asked where Raoul was. James wondered why Dalton was looking for the Ashton kid when Dalton never cared during their duel. He pondered Dalton's interest in the Ashton kid and what Dalton was thinking. However, James decided he couldn't be bothered because he did his best, and his record wasn't that far from Dalton's. There was no way a 15-year-old kid who wasn't even an expert could beat their record, and the top spot would be either his or Dalton's. Suddenly, James was shocked to see something and couldn't believe it, making Dalton look back in confusion too. They all saw that Raoul was in first place with a time of 4 minutes and 55 seconds. The students shouted that Raoul had surpassed Dalton again by a little and asked how he was doing it while Raoul walked toward them. 
He looked at the scene and was glad that he matched the record well, while James shook in anger, wondering how Raul did it when he wasn't even an expert. Dalton thought it was very interesting, and academy life wouldn't be as boring as he thought. Meanwhile, in the room, one of the higher-ups said that Raul was in first place in the last test as well, which meant Raul would be taking first place. Then they congratulated Dylan and told him that it was amazing, to which Dylan thanked them while McKenny angrily walked away. Spence told him that it was very interesting, especially Raul's movements, and asked him if Ashton County taught ranger techniques at a young age. Then the man told Dylan that he expected Raul to be more straightforward than James. Dylan laughingly told them that Raul is a special one in their family and that Raul has learned various skills. Dylan knew that he had to answer them, but even he wasn't expecting Raul to get through those courses like that. He saw that James, the son of McNeil, went through the obstacles by breaking them apart, and Dalton's precise movements with his long sword were reminiscent of Swordmaster Marquis. They both used what their family was known for to get through the course. Also, Raoul used a two-handed greatsword like any other Ashton would, but Raoul's extremely precise movements were beyond anyone's expectations, and most importantly, Raoul didn't trigger a single trap while passing through the cave. Dylan knew that the movements Raoul showed were impossible unless someone is an experienced rogue or a ranger. He also noticed that Raoul didn't even use a mana blade like James and Dalton did, making him think that Raoul hid the fact that he reached the expert stage, and he knew how to use a ranger's navigation skills. Dylan clenched his fist while telling Raoul that they were going to need to have some body talk for lying to him about it, but still, he was so proud of him. The second test concluded, and the academy placement exam finished. After the long tests were over, his fellow brethren congratulated him on his victory, and he went into the carriage to avoid attracting more attention. He felt exhausted and knew that he had tried to go easy, so he hoped they fell for it. He also knows that everything is going well for now, so he just needs to lay low and take some rest. Then he dreams about the cave and sees himself furiously asking someone why he did it while holding a lady on his arm. Han Gilju, the decent guildmaster, replied that he was acting as if his family had died but he shouldn't mind it because he didn't have one, he was an orphan. Then, Gilju told him that he had asked him to join them nicely, and if he had listened, it would have never happened. Also, he knew that he was ranked one and asked him if he really thought he could beat all of them. He glared at Gilju in anger, but Gilju teasingly told him he was so scary and asked him why he was looking at them like that for killing an NPC. Furiously, he thought that Gilju didn't know about them, but she meant everything to him. They had met during the main quest, and she had been his guide ever since. He had spent more than a year protecting that girl from everything, and she was basically his family. However, he lost her to a guild that was irrelevant to the quest. Gilju teasingly told him to go ahead and try because he was thinking of killing him anyway. Then Gilju ordered his men to kill him, and the men ran toward him to attack. Still seated, he attacked them with his power and killed them without moving. He grabbed the knives around him using his psychokinesis and raised them up in the air, gathering all of them in a circle. Gilju asked how and told him that he knew he was ranked one, but it was overpowered. He put her down on the ground. Then, Gilju cursed the gacha company because he only got crappy skills after spending so much. The anger in Gilju's expression changed into fear when he saw that he was pointing the blade in front of him. He told Gilju that he wanted to know why his guild was killing guide NPCs. Furiously, he ordered Gilju to explain right now. He asked Gilju if he wasn't scared of the penalty. Killing a quest NPC is extremely disadvantageous for players, and the player's account gets permanently deleted with any related accounts banned. Furiously, he told Gilju that the quest goes on with new NPCs, no matter how many times they kill them, and asked why they killed them despite the risk of the penalty. Gilju teasingly asked what he meant by penalty and if he really thought he was scared of it. Then, Gilju told him that only peasants like him cared about it and that he should face the truth that many people were willing to kill NPCs for 10,000. He grabbed Gilju by the collar, calling him a bastard and telling him to stop the nonsense and answer his question. Gilju just asked him why he would stop when he was going to kill him anyway and told him that even if he killed him, he'd just buy a revive with some pocket change. He cursed, remembering that he had heard about Gilju being the grandson of a family that owns one of Korea's top five companies, Disun, while Gilju told him to try as much as he wanted. He said the person with the most money wins in real life in the game. But he just grabbed Gilju's head, thinking it didn't change his mind, and snapped Gilju's head, killing him in an instant. That day, he swore in front of the girl he couldn't protect. He tearfully asked her why not and told her that they should do it. Then, furiously, he told Gilju that he would kill him until he got sick of dying in that game, swearing that he would get rid of the Desung Guild from that game. Then he woke up, thinking that it was the first time he had dreamt about his past life, feeling that something was off. An envelope popped up while he was thinking that he couldn't keep the promise he made with that girl. 
he clicked the envelope icon, wondering what it was and if it was something related to the notification he just heard. Then he opened it, and it thanked every player using their Connect system, announcing their new update and schedule. It showed the pre-scenario v10 update, a hidden ancient dungeon opening, a dimension gate system, some NPCs turning into quest NPCs, and a guild system update. The date of the update was a month from now, which in Connect time was 521, May 28th. Also, depending on the progress of the pre-scenario, there would be a larger update in the future with open beta service. He was shocked to see it, knowing that it would happen eventually, but he wasn't expecting it to be that early. He knew that it meant he would see Gilju again soon and swore that he would protect her this time. The only problem was that he couldn't predict the exact time of the update, so he was not prepared enough. He realized that he had a month left, and nothing would happen right after the update, but he knew that if he lost that chance, his plan would be delayed a lot. So, he had to hurry. He thought that he had to dominate the scenarios and get as much as he could before any other players joined because the future decisions depended on how he used the time he had. He scratched his head, realizing that he would have to level up and expand his guild first. He had to visit the academy library as soon as possible and wondered when he could visit the other free cities. He asked himself if he even had enough time for all of these tasks and decided to plan as much as he could that night. Raul stayed up all night, planning everything and creating the most efficient and concrete plan. Meanwhile, in someone's house, Silver Zero, the Imperial Hound leader, told everyone that they should begin. Someone reported about the royal house first. The man began by telling everyone that the king hadn't shown himself at any time except during regular meetings, and the Sword Emperor did not appear at his grandson's admission, but rather at President Marquis e. McNeil's freshman. Silver Zero praised them for their hard work and told them that morning, the home base passed the order, so exactly a month from that day, the grand plan would begin. The people in the meeting cheered and shouted that their hard work would finally pay off, but Silver Zero slammed his hand on the table, telling them to be quiet. He emphasized that it was just the first step, and they should understand that their roles were way more important now. Then Silver Zero called Number 7 to ask if he had finished his investigation about Mira. Number 7 replied that the initial investigation was done, but he wasn't sure. The kingdom was involved as well, so it was hard to get close to the field. Silver Zero asked Number 7, so what? And Number 7 replied that he was sure Randall was involved. One of the men shouted that it was nonsense because there were no movements from Randall, and he asked Number 7 if he was suggesting that those exiled to Mira invaded their camp. Number 7 replied that the circumstances suggested so, and the Randalls did declare their conquest in Mira on the same day. Most importantly, the power armor and other gears with tracker spells clearly pointed at Randall. The man furiously told Number 7 that what he was wondering was how they could do it with their strength. Silver Zero told them that it was enough and asked Number 7 if there was anything else other than Randall. Number 7 replied that Ashton County's youngest son also showed himself, and they didn't show up near their base but were present in the city. Silver Zero asked Number 7 if he thought they might have worked together, and Number 7 replied that he believed not. Silver Zero told Number 7 to exclude them from it and asked if there was anything else. Number 7 replied that the next one was not sure, but one of their guys saw a person that might be gray. Silver Zero told them to stop the investigation for now because there was no need to care about minor stuff when the grand plan was about to start. They should end it with a warning to Randall for now, to which they replied as he said. Then Silver Zero asked Number 3 about what happened at the academy and told Number 3 that he thought James was supposed to take the top spot according to the plan. Number 3 replied that there was an unknown variable, and they kept Dalton in check, but Ashton County's youngest son, Raul, came out of nowhere. Silver Zero called Number 6 to ask what was going on because he thought he was in charge of Ashton. Number 6 replied that honestly, he didn't know what to say. Raul showed no talent last year, but he started showing great skill this year. Still, Raul was within their control, but he wasn't sure if Raul was hiding anything. Silver Zero asked Number 6 if Raul could affect their plan and number 6 replied that he believed there was no chance of it because Raul is still a 15-year-old kid. He told Silver Zero that he is planning on using Raul in the end. But if it doesn't work, he also has an alternate plan. Silver Zero realized that Raul is showing up everywhere, but they have no time to spend on a kid when the grand plan is approaching. He told them that Grey is more important than Raul, and they should figure out why Grey has shown up now. Also, using the top entrant to approach Grey has failed, so they should start the next plan. Then Silver Zero asked Number 8 if he was almost done with the Underworld, and Number 8 replied that there is one guild causing trouble, but it is almost done, and he will make sure it is resolved before the grand plan begins. Silver Zero told Number 8 that he understood it and informed everyone that he would say it for the last time. A month from now, they should make sure there is no trouble and not lose their guard until then. Also, they should remember that one small variable can ruin their entire plan. The next day, in the academy, he waved goodbye to his men, 
thinking that staying up is tiring, but at least there won't be any trouble in the future. He remembered that he chose to commute instead of staying in a dorm to easily get jobs done, and he scheduled his classes to be three days a week, focusing only on core classes. He walked inside, and students asked if he was the top entrant that year. They whispered that they heard he was only 15 years old and there were a lot of talented people that year, but he got the top spot. He also got the top spot on the writing test, and he had brains, skills, and looks, making them say that God is unfair. He walked down the corridor and overheard a man asking his friend if Raoul wasn't from one of the big families and why he was at the academy when he didn't need the diploma there. Then someone shouted that if he had learned the advanced sword skills as Raoul did, he would be a knight by now. He sighed, knowing that there was no need to care about them because the academy is only a small part of him, and he was only there for a few things that he needs. Suddenly, he saw the board a little far from him, and the system showed him that it was the placement exam result and class assignment for S class, 1st to 30th. He noticed he was first on the list, followed by James in second and Dalton in third, and so on. He wondered if there was anything else, and then the system popped up again, showing him a scenario quest called Placement Exam, which is grade D. The result was successfully making it to S class and achieving the top spot. The rewards included small experience points, 500 coins, and an unknown extra reward. He guessed it wasn't that difficult because the rewards were cheap and wondered what the extra reward might be. Curious, he thought it wouldn't be much since it was a grade D quest, and he decided to go to his class. Later, in their classroom, he sat at his table, sighing while contemplating that academy classes were not as helpful as he expected. The core classes were all basic, and his classmates seemed to be avoiding him. He had anticipated that Caleb, Dalton, or James would bother him but they were also keeping their distance. He decided to let them be and mentally urged them to keep ignoring him. Overall, he thought it wasn't a bad first day. As he pondered, someone called his name, prompting him to stand up and acknowledge that he was Raoul. The person informed him about the perks he received as the top entrant and explained that if he showed the information at the library or during training, he would be registered. Additionally, Vice President Gray was looking for him, so he should visit Gray right away. The system revealed that his extra reward was meeting Grand Sage Gray, a revelation that left him in disbelief. He recognized Alfredo Gray as the historical hero who fought against the Empire, and the prospect of meeting him both excited and worried him. Knocking on Gray's door, he waited for the invitation to enter. Gray asked him to come in and requested a moment to attend to some paperwork. He excused himself politely, marveling at how Gray resembled the images and videos shared by other players. Despite Gray's noble appearance, there was an unknown aura about him that intrigued him, prompting him to sneak a peek. To his shock, he discovered that Gray's level was in the triple digits, marked as unknown. Gray's class was a Grand Sage, an eight-circle magician, and a master alchemist. His affiliations included Rubin Academy Vice President, Gray Tower Master, and two unknown affiliations. Gray held titles such as Nomadic Sage, Tower Master, and two unknown titles, with his stats also listed as unknown. Gray's unique talent, marked as Great SS, was Master of Mana, and he possessed four other unknown unique talents. Raoul found it surprising that he couldn't see Gray's information, as the displayed details were already well known. Suddenly, Gray asked him if he could see certain things, catching Raoul off guard. He realized Gray was looking at a paper, but it seemed as though Gray knew all his movements. Feeling a bit uneasy, he excused himself, mentioning that he had heard Gray was challenging to meet, and he would leave. However, Gray reassured him that it was okay and explained that he would be at the academy for a while. Gray asked if he could wait a little longer, expressing his interest in getting to know more about Raoul, including those intriguing eyes. Stunned and shocked, Raoul wondered who this mysterious person was. He also wonders if Gray knows about his eyes or if it is just a guess. Then Gray apologizes to him for making him wait so long but he's done now and tells him that he looks even better up close. He realizes that Gray is making him nervous, and he knows that he'll have to be careful about what he says now, while Gray tells him that he'll bring them some tea, so he'll be right back. A moment later, Gray comes back, giving him the tea, and he thanks Gray for it, thinking that he thought Gray would brew tea with his spell, but he realizes that his guess was wrong. Then Gray congratulates him on getting the top spot and laughingly tells him that his performance was exciting. He wanted to see him to ask a few questions and tells him not to be nervous. He remembers that they met for the first time at the testing site and is pretty sure he didn't do anything extraordinary, making him wonder what Gray is so curious about him. Then, he decides to try to talk his way out of it and tells Gray that he wonders why a Grand Sage like him is curious about him. But Gray just asks him back if he knows of an organization called Imperial Hound, which surprises him. Fifty years ago, the continent of Connect was in chaos due to the Cranon Empire's invasion. Four kingdoms were close to their demise, but there are always heroes at the most difficult times. The heroes put their lives on the line to stop the Empire and push them away behind the Monster Mountain. 
there has been peace for the 50 years that have followed. Conflicts between the kingdoms were resolved during their fight with the Empire, but they didn't forget to prepare for the next possible invasion. Alfredo Gray built a tower to train people with talent and wandered around the continent. One of the people Gray was looking after was an alchemist named Nakia, whom Raoul had saved. Gray had the ability to help Nakia with her expulsion from the association but he couldn't since he was taking care of important business. Gray heard about Nakia being pardoned and went to Mira. Gray stayed in Mira to look after Nakia and witnessed Raoul and his people's generosity. Gray figured out the truth behind the Imperial Hound conquest and the fact that Randall took advantage of Raoul's work. At that time, Gray figured out that Raoul gave away the merit to a different family to avoid the Empire's attention, and thinks that Raoul was young but chose to prepare for the future rather than basking in the honor in front of him. Raoul doesn't want any compensation for helping the civilians either, making Gray think that Raoul is the perfect man to be that world's hero, and Gray wanted to watch Raoul up close. And that is how Gray ended up in the academy, but Raoul will only find out about it in the future. Back in the present, Raoul doesn't know why he is there, but he knows that he has to stay sharp. He wonders how to respond to Gray's question. He is aware that Gray is known for constantly generating quests related to the Crane and Empire, but he also knows that he can't mention the Empire yet because there is no need for him to be involved with the Empire at this point. Gray tells him that he has noticed his cautiousness, advising that if anyone else asks him about it, it would be good to stay silent as he is now, since it is too dangerous for him to handle. Gray admits that he has been watching him since his time in Mira, telling him that he saw how well he handled conflicts with his outstanding skills, but mentions that Randall is going to struggle a bit. Raoul is surprised to hear this and wonders how Gray knows about it. He realizes that if Randall finds out about this, he could be in trouble. Gray laughingly tells him not to worry because he hasn't and won't tell everyone about it. Gray also tells him that he made the right choice to stay anonymous, noting that he is at an age when people are eager to show off, but he made an amazing choice. Raoul asks Gray how much he knows and why he is staying quiet about it. Gray counters by asking if he knows why the Crane and Empire is dangerous. Raoul replies that it might be because of their military strength. Gray agrees but urges him to think deeper, asking if he thinks the Empire's land and population overwhelm the other kingdoms. Raoul knows that this isn't entirely true because, although they have a large amount of land, most of it is desolate, and their population is about the same as one of the kingdoms, due to the harsh climate. Gray explains that he thinks the only way the Empire can be a threat is through their information. They are exposed to the Empire, but they don't know much about them. Raoul remembers that the Empire is behind the Monster Mountain and the Forbidden Barrier, so the only way to the Empire is through the Rift. They built a wall near the entrance and have an army there to prevent an invasion. But the Empire still manages to send spies through, which means the Empire has a full advantage over them. If they invade now, they'll do it knowing they have a good chance to win. Raoul finds this frightening, recalling that the Empire used players to start the war, and was close to victory around the time when he died in his previous life. Gray tells him that they need more people like him because young people like him are their wildcards against the Empire. This makes Raoul wonder if Gray is related to Nakia's growth in his past life and thinks that if that's the case, Gray's attention might be helpful. He doesn't need to struggle after declining Gray's offer. Also, he can accelerate his growth and defeat the Empire. Then, Gray tells him that he only has one thing to say, something is happening out there, so he needs him to lay low and make smart decisions, to which he replies that he will make sure of it. Gray then mentions that it's getting late, so they should get up. Gray takes something from his coat while telling him that he would like to give him a gift for listening to him for so long. Gray gives him a small box and tells him that he will need it in the future. The instructions on how to use it are in the box as well, so he should read them carefully later. He opened it and saw a flaming ring inside. He noticed that it looked really expensive and could feel mana emanating from it. He asked Gray if he was sure he could keep it, and Gray laughingly replied that it was a reward. This left him confused, knowing he hadn't done anything to deserve a reward but it still felt nice. He stood up and respectfully thanked Gray for everything. Gray thanked him too for spending time with him and expressed hope that the rest of their academy life would go well. Then, he came out of Gray's room, looking at the ring and thinking that, although he was nervous, it went better than expected, and he even received a gift. He wondered what the ring was, as he could feel mana flowing through it. He cursed in surprise when he realized that the ring was Gray's polymorph ring, a unique item with the effect of allowing the wearer to undergo a perfect body transformation into a designated form. Its limitation is that, while in a polymorph state, all stats decrease by 30%, so the wearer should be cautious, as running out of mana will revert them to their original form. Additionally, its effects allow the wearer to summon the creator, Gray, once. He was excited to have received such an overpowered item, thinking it was crazy because it was exactly what he needed. He knew there were many limitations due to his position, as he had to bring guards everywhere and watch every move. He had been looking for an item that could hide his identity, 
and this ring not only concealed his identity but also his appearance. He also knew that only a few magicians could use polymorph spells, as it was a sixth circle spell, and was even more excited because he could summon the Grand Sage Grey. However, he felt pressured by Grey's expectations. Then, he confidently thought that he didn't need to worry about it now because Grey would be helpful to him in every way. He swore to Grey that he would use the ring wisely. Two weeks later, Raoul's academy life was going pretty well. No one was hostile toward him as he stayed quiet, but Dalton stuck to him 24-7. Dalton asked him if he was free today because he found a good armory, but Raoul reminded Dalton that he had already told him he was busy, so Dalton should go by himself. Nevertheless, Dalton persisted, asking if Raoul couldn't just accompany him and telling him that if he went back right now, he would have to train with his teachers, so he should consider it as saving his friend. Raoul thought his academy life would be quiet, but an unexpected variable showed up, Dalton. Dalton started sitting next to him and began bothering him incessantly. Dalton wasn't even looking for other friends besides Raoul. At first, Raoul found Dalton annoying, but he noticed that Dalton hadn't hurt anyone and realized that no one else bothered him because Dalton was always there. Dalton asks him why he is so busy, mentioning that they trained and listened to lectures all day, so they should take a break. Raoul tells Dalton that he has things to do and is going to the library, so Dalton should find someone else to hang out with. In frustration, Dalton curses the library and laments that he should have aimed for the top spot to avoid library visits. Then Dalton half-jokingly wishes Raoul sees a ghost in the library, but Raoul just advises Dalton to read a book if he's bored. Dalton turns around to leave, questioning what Raoul means by reading a book, and remarks that he would rather swing a sword all day. Relieved, Raoul thinks he is finally alone and then enters the huge library. He looks up at the closed sections, knowing that as the first-ranked student, he has access to every floor, but realistically, he can only enter up to the fourth floor, as only royals and a few professors can access the fifth floor. Still, he acknowledges that the fourth floor is impressive, given that only about 50 students have access to the third floor. With that in mind, he plans to start finding some useful books. A moment later, inside the library, a winged creature is flying around. She has seen everyone there before but notices no new students or books. She wonders if there might be new books inside their bags, but then her attention is drawn to a lady studying intently. The creature pats the lady on the head, admiring her dedication. The lady looks up, smiling. The creature finds it nice to see hard-working students, but then she spots a man sleeping on a book. She scolds him for daring to sleep in the library and slaps his head, waking him up. The man looks back in anger, but upon seeing her, he runs away, shouting that she is a ghost. The fairy-like lady warns them not to sleep on the books again, or they'll see what happens. She declares that she won't forgive them for disrespecting the sacred library. On the other hand, on the second floor of the library, Raoul noticed that there were more useful skill books compared to the first floor. Suddenly, he heard a man laughing and asking a lady if she had seen what just happened. The lady replied that she did see a man running away after being slapped by a ghost. The man then told the lady that he would have to watch himself to avoid getting slapped. Raoul wondered what they meant by ghost, knowing that there was a protection spell cast around the library, which should preclude any such presence. He guessed it might have been a ghost story, but decided it didn't matter to him and chose to continue looking for skill books. On the other hand, the fairy was flying around the first floor, thinking that there were too many students bothering her today and they were tiring her out. Suddenly, she felt pain and looked at the flaming book, thinking it had only been half a year since she moved there. Then, she flew toward it to check it out. She lay on the book and realized it couldn't relieve her fatigue anymore, making her wonder if she had to move to another book again. She knew that the great spell book could sustain her for around a thousand years, making her wonder if she needed a book of a similar level to stay in. She looked around but only saw low-quality books filling up the library, and she knew she couldn't survive a year with those. This made her wonder if it was her end, but she refused to accept that, as she still had an unrequited, long-cherished wish, and she could feel that something special was approaching her. Just as she was about to make a wish, she felt something strong behind her. She immediately looked back, wondering what it was and where it had come from. Then she saw Raoul with a pile of books. She positioned herself on the wall and kicked off it to gain momentum while shouting at the books to be the one she needed. On the other hand, Raoul was among the shelves, sighing because he couldn't find what he was looking for. He realized that finding a unique skill book was too difficult. He knew that he couldn't use the unique skill book he had already found. He wanted to find at least one psychokinetic skill book and was trying to find it using information he got from another psychokinetic user, but it was still hard for him to find one. He realized he should have asked more about it. Still, he decided to keep looking and saw a book that seemed okay. He picked it up and saw that it was a rank C acrobatic horse equitation, a combat skill book. 
He smiled, knowing that he had found the artistic brush touch and art skill earlier, which made up for his current finds. He then decided to register the new combat skill book in his decks. He saw that his decks had a set number of skill slots, so he naturally had to delete one of his skills to learn a new one, but he could register the unused skills in his skill decks. He placed his hand on his decks book to activate it and put the new combat skill book on it, ordering his decks to take it all in. The words from the combat skill book flew out and were consumed by his decks. He knew that after being registered, a skill book becomes a normal book. This process also happens when any other player obtains them, so he thought he'd have to find as many as he could there. He walked away to find another one, not noticing the fairy watching him. The fairy thought he was a strange human because he was taking multiple similarly titled books and reading the same part over and over. She noticed that the books he was reading, like the author's will, the power of time, and unique handwriting, were different from the others. She sensed something special about him because he could differentiate between the books. She noticed that he was somewhat good-looking, but it still didn't interest her enough. She knew that humans couldn't help her, they had to be at least a grand sage or arch wizard to communicate with her, but even they hadn't been helpful. Her existence, she knew, was the result of many sacrifices, harsh fate, and coincidences, and it was getting hard for her to maintain it. She felt that hoping for a human's help was exhausting and thought that even if these books were special, they weren't good enough for her to live in. The fairy thought she felt something and guessed she might be losing her senses too. But when Raoul touched his decks, she wondered why he was handling the book like that. Then, she was surprised to notice that the book was ordinary on the surface, but the symbol engraved on it wasn't. She felt something under the cover calling to her. When she saw Raoul put another book on the decks and it began to absorb it, she was shocked. She realized that the power was being transferred from one book to another, but she didn't see a difference in the one that absorbed the power. She knew she had never seen anything like it before, making her want to take a closer look. As Raoul walked away from the book, she flew toward it and examined it carefully, realizing it was a book she hadn't tried before and guessing it might be the one she had been looking for. She reached out to touch the decks, wondering what it was. When she touched it, she was confused because nothing happened. The great spell book and seven religious books had told her their story and allowed her to stay, but this was different. She thought it was not possible and tried again. While she was trying her best to open the decks and wondering why it wasn't working, Raoul came back, causing her to look up in shock. He asked her what she was doing on top of his book. He looked at her, wondering who she was, a ghost or a fairy, and why she was translucent, as if she were about to disappear. She flew up and asked him how he could see her. But before he could answer, she flew away from him, leaving him surprised. He was curious about her but knew there was no need to chase after her because finding skill books was more important. He thought that since she seemed interested in the skill decks, she would come back to him eventually. Then the system showed him that the rank C skill acrobatic equitation had been registered to the skill decks, increasing his skill enhancing efficiency by 10.5%. He was happy that the absorption was finished and decided to take a look. He saw that he had around 700 skills registered now, but he was frustrated because it looked pretty messy. He remembered that even in his past life, there was no one who collected skills as much as he did, but he knew that his skill dex was still only of rare grade. This made him wonder how many skill books he needed to collect to see its true power. Suddenly, the fairy called him human and asked him what the book was, surprising him because she came back faster than he expected. Thinking he should be assertive at first, he asked the fairy if she shouldn't apologize first for touching his belongings and why he had to answer her question. She apologized for touching his book and asked if he could actually hear her, as it was rare. Then, she landed on the table and gracefully introduced herself as Ravelina Harriet Merdian, telling him he could call her Ravel. She also told him that she was a fairy, a forest fairy who loves harmony and order. He introduced himself as Raoul and told her that he had enrolled in the academy that year. He mentioned that she didn't seem like a normal fairy, to which she replied that she was more of a ghost, so humans called her the library ghost. He asked if she was like a specter, making her angrily ask if she looked like a monster to him. She explained that she was just a soul on the border between life and death, a being that defies the ordinary. He agreed with her and asked why she was interested in that book, pointing at his dex. She replied that his dex was special, even among special ones. He asked if she even knew what the book was, and she admitted she didn't, as the book didn't talk to her, but she was sure it was special. Then, she asked him, almost pleadingly, if he could let her take a look. Raoul didn't know much about the skill dex, and there wasn't much information about it in his past life either. He guessed that maybe Ravel could upgrade the skill dex for him. Knowing that the dex was bound to him and she couldn't run away with it, he told Ravel that he would let her, but she had to promise to tell him everything she learned about the book. Ravel jumped in happiness, agreeing to his condition, and thanked him. Then he opened the book for her, and she put her hands inside it. 
She happily told him that there was a lot of energy flowing through it, but then she felt a spark, making her surprised, and she wondered how that was possible. Suddenly, she was thrown away by the power of the decks. Shaking, she looked at it, asking how it was possible and if he really predicted something like this. But she knew that the decks appearing now was against the rules. He asked worriedly if she was okay, but she excitedly asked where he had found that book. He told her to calm down and reminded her that she was the one who was supposed to tell him about the book. Shoutingly, she told him that his book contained the power of the creator god, and not just any god, but an ancient creator god who was known to have disappeared. Confused, he asked her what she meant by ancient creator god. He also asks her if the ancient creator god's power really exists in that book. He thinks it's not very appealing since he doesn't know anything about it. When Ravel saw his grumpy look, she was pissed and asked him if he wasn't amazed. He tells her that he doesn't care about the god part and orders her to just tell him more about the book. She tells him that she doesn't know the details either because she can only get a glimpse of it, but she is sure that his book is forbidden. However, for some reason, it seems to have lost its power. He asks her how he brought out its true form, but she counters by asking him how she would know when that cranky book refuses to talk to her. He dismissively calls it useless, making Ravel angrily ask him if he really expects her to find everything out in such a short time. She tells him to let her go inside the book if he wants to know more. But then, the system pops up in front of him and shows him an urgent quest called the Skill Dex's Administrator. It shows him that the Forest Fairy Ravel's spirit requests to move into the Skill Dex and explains that a spirit living in the Skill Dex is automatically considered the Skill Dex's librarian. It explains that appointing a librarian may upgrade the Skill Dex's grade, function, and efficiency. Once he appoints a librarian, he can't fire them without mutual agreement. Then it asks him if he would like to appoint Ravel as the Skill Dex's librarian. He is amazed upon seeing this and realizes that Ravel tried to sneak into his Dex book. He knows it's not disadvantageous for him, but he can't let strangers enter his book for free, so he closes his Dex shut. Ravel is shocked and asks him why he is looking at her like that. He replies that he didn't think he needed anything from her because he already knew about the skill decks having some problems, and he thought he could solve them by himself. Then he turns around, telling Ravel that he should head back now because it's getting late. This makes her ask him in surprise. Then she flies in front of him to stop him and begs him to listen to her. He tells her that he's busy, so they should talk later, but he doesn't know if he'll ever be back. She sadly asks him if she annoyed him and apologizes if she did. Then she explains to him that it's been a while since she last talked to a human. He thinks he has to be a little more assertive, so he angrily reminds her that he said he was busy and asks her if she did not hear him. She promises him that she'll be helpful and that his book is really important to him. Then she begs him to hear her out. After seeing Ravel panicking, he thinks it should be enough and that he should be able to negotiate now. Suddenly, Ravel cries and tells him that she is desperate. She then asks him why he doesn't trust her. He panics and tells her that it's not that, trying to calm her down. But she just cries more and loudly while shouting at him that he's so mean. A moment later, when Ravel calmed down, he apologized to her, explaining that he didn't mean to make her cry, which she poutingly accepted. Still, he tells her that he can't just let her enter the book because it is very important to him. He wants to know her story first and asks her how she ended up like this and why she is so desperate. Then he explained to her that after she answers, he would decide what to do next. She agreed to his condition and told him that she would tell him because she trusted him, but warned him that it was a long story. A very long time ago, there was a great war across Connect. The war involved various races including gods, demons, and even extraterrestrial entities. The war brought the continent to the brink of destruction. The forest fairies were close to extinction, and the fairies tried to evacuate Ravel, the last heir, into a book as a last resort. But due to the chaotic mana and dimensional fluctuations, Ravel's spirit got stuck in the book while her kind disappeared into a dimensional crack. Ravel slept for a long time after it and, when she woke up, she found herself needing to move around books to stay alive. Then Ravel tells him that every time she wakes up, she loses a portion of her memory, but she knows she has some sort of duty. He asked her what duty she was talking about, and she tearfully replied that she needed to find her kind who were scattered around the world because she believed there were more fairies alive besides her. Then she tells him that she has to deliver their family's wisdom and essence, so she can't die before it, but she is stuck inside books so she couldn't even leave the library and she was running out of books that could contain her. Then she pointed to his decks while telling him that it had the same scent as the first book that contained her, and she thought that book might even be better than the first book she was from before. Then she begs him to let her enter his book. He thinks it should be enough and tells her that she may enter it, but she'll have to be the book's librarian. It might bind her to him and he asks her if she is okay with it. She happily replied of course, as long as he lets her enter the book. But then she asked him what he was trying to do with that book. He replied that he was using it to protect his family and homeland. Then he tells her that it might mean nothing to her, but it means a lot to him. 
She tells him that it was a great reason and accepts his hand while telling him that they should do it together. He opens his decks, while Ravel tells him that she won't be able to help him right away since she needs some time to settle and she will be asleep for around a month, but the decks should still work normally. He tells her there is no need to hurry and hopes she wakes up fine. She lays on the book, thanking him, and telling him that once she wakes up, she'll help him as much as she can. Then she waves goodbye to him, telling him she'd see him in a month. Then she begins to sleep inside Raoul's decks, and it was how Raoul found a fairy companion. Time passed fast after Raoul met Ravel, and there was a week left before the update. He knows that he still has a lot to prepare, but he was short on time. Dylan told him that he was proud of him because he saw him working hard, and he was right that there was an oracle from a shrine. Then Dylan asks him how did he know about it, but he just asks Dylan back what the prophet said. Dylan replied that it was quite strange because the prophet said that a week from now, things that had disappeared would return, and connections that had been severed would be restored and to stop the inception of evil, one must open the door and harvest the void fruit from within. He thinks the oracle is very vague, but he knows that he can't just ignore it either, so he asks Dylan how the shrine reacts. Dylan replied that they just got more troops to prepare for the great danger. He asked Dylan what about the nobles because he could kind of imagine their reactions and Dylan replied that as he might imagine. Most of them ignored it or considered it a joke. Dylan tells him that he would have ignored it as well if it wasn't for him and there are a few precedents too. He knows that it was not a few, but a lot of precedents exist because the Holy Empire is ruled by the Pope. The Holy Empire is a small city-state alliance consisting of Garnelia and several mid-sized cities. Despite its small scale, it holds the imperial title due to its religious influence and it's designated to be an impermeable domain. Also, they announce many oracles. He tells Dylan that he was worried that it'll be too late if it does end up happening. But Dylan tells him not to worry because they'll do as much as they can and he already gave out word about how to react to their people and the other families close to them. Then Dylan laughingly tells him that they should stop worrying and work out together because he should show him his strange skills too making him realize that their family never forgets something they are interested in, especially his father and brother which is the reason why Dylan took his words seriously. And when he told Dylan about the update, he tells him that it was an oracle, but since Dylan also found out about his psychokinesis, Dylan has been pestering him to show it to him. A moment later, in the training ground, he was being attacked by Dylan who passionate about the training, reminded him that he had told him to stop depending on his skill and focus on his physical growth. This made him feel that he could never get used to that training. He remembers starting training with Dylan because Dylan kept insisting. Because of it, his muscles grew and his psychokinesis body enhancement leveled up to his past life's level. So, he figured out that Dylan's only interested in the physical body, which is why, despite Dylan's inhumane body, there are many weaknesses in Dylan's combat skills. He knows that the enemies they will face once the war starts won't be easy, so Dylan has to get stronger to face them. He thinks if Dylan uses proper combat skills with his inhumane body, it will be much better. He looks at Dylan, knowing that Dylan knows the gap between them is getting smaller every time they duel. Dylan notices that he can't overpower him with just his body, and that's when he'll find Dylan a proper skill. He knows that he will be able to find more skill books once the dungeons open, and it can't just be him, he has to make the people around him stronger as well, making him think that his plan is indeed interesting. Later, while they are outside and he is in the carriage, he is busy thinking that he is almost done with tasks that need to be done before the update. But it bothers him how everyone's acting so normal despite the Oracle's public announcement. He notices that no lords are trying to prepare for things that haven't happened yet, making him think that he will need a lot of help from the kingdom to progress through the scenario. Monsters invading through the gate and war with the empire, there will be times when a large number of troops will be needed. The kingdom's troops have to be preserved and grown to prepare for it. But he knows there are limits on what he can do, even if he is the Count's son and knows about the future. After all, he is still just a 15-year-old kid. Raoul chooses to focus on what he can do. He listens to lectures in the academy and searches for skill books in the library. Raoul even visited three other beginner cities when he had no classes, Mira to the south, Kesson to the east, Bryant to the west, and Zusek to the north, making four in total. Raoul used a letter of recommendation he got from Mira and met the mayors of the other three cities. When Raoul offered to invest in their cities, they gladly accepted it since their situation wasn't much different from Mira's. Raoul initiated large-scale civil engineering projects in the city's core land and established branches of the first guild. It cost him around 3.5 million gold, but Raoul thinks it was worth it, and he knows that he has to finish the construction before the players start joining. Raoul also issued a mercenary recruitment notice in the four free cities and the capital's mercenary guild. 
he looked for individual mercenaries of C rank or higher and small-scale mercenary groups of up to 10 members. The contract stated that Raul would pay double for their first month and offer them a chance to join the guild or become a trainee knight if they proved meritorious. There were many applicants since the offer was amazing, and Raul managed to recruit 50 rank B mercenaries and 950 rank C mercenaries. Rank C mercenaries consist of trained soldiers from other territories or individuals with over three years of experience, while rank B mercenaries can be swordsmen or hold key positions in small mercenary groups. Raul spent around 30,000 gold hiring all the mercenaries, and although it will cost more to keep them, he believes they are worth it. He thinks he won't have to worry even if a high-level battle occurs, while the people can't believe that he is that wealthy and wonder what if nothing happens or if Raul is planning something else. He asks Philip if he called the guild members, and Philip replies that all 45 members are there, except for the executives. He then explains that they were divided into 10 groups and have finished training. Additionally, he called the regular knights who were already there as well. Raul praises Philip for his excellent work and tells him not to let his guard down, reminding him that they have a mission tonight, which Philip respectfully acknowledges. Raul knows that many things have changed, the six trainee knights have reached the expert level and were promoted to regular knights, and a total of nine knights, including Philip, Jake, and Pierce, have become regular members of the first knight. The trainee knights and other soldiers are affiliated with the first knights, so now his first guild will make its first public move as the first knights. He looks at his first guild status, which is ranked as beginner level 10 with the strength of a local influential guild. The guild master is himself, the vice guild master is Philip, the administrative officer is Bernard, and it has a total of 50 members, 9 regular knights, 35 trainee knights, and 5 administrators. Also, his first guild's buffs are experience points 10% and proficiency 10%. Then he decides to look at his guild members' stats and looks at his people, knowing that he picked potential talent rank B or higher. They were better than he thought, making him curious about how much stronger they'd get. He was sure that he had done all he could to prepare for the update and all he had to do now was hope that everything goes as he planned, while looking at the remaining time before the update starts. Meanwhile, in some room, Silver orders his members to report. One of them reports that the royal family has not taken action, all they've done is increase their patrols. Similarly, the Templeton family is in a similar position, and the McNeils are doing the same. He calls member number 6 to inquire if Ashton County is normally religious. Number 6 replies that they are not, but explains that the Ashtons have a good relationship with the shrine. They aren't particularly religious, but have been preparing even before the oracle was announced, leading him to assume they have a different source of information. He asks Six if Grey has made any moves. Six replies that nothing is out of the ordinary and that Grey is currently focused on the academy. Then, he calls Number 8 to inquire about his success infiltrating the mercenary squad. Number 8 apologizes, explaining that their attempts were unsuccessful. The other members are surprised, given that the mercenaries were looking for a thousand men, yet not even one of theirs could make it in. Number 8 explains that they passed the pretest but failed the main test, suspecting Raoul has some sort of special ability. Silver listens silently to his members. One of them asks if they should be concerned about Raoul, noting that Raoul has no apparent benefit from interfering. Another member agrees, assuring the group that the nobles couldn't stop their grand plan. Silver concurs with his members and decides to keep Raoul under surveillance for the time being. He then inquires about the status of their agents. One member responds that everyone is already in place. He reminds them that the grand plan is about to begin, and the day to overthrow the pig nobles is almost upon them. They should remain focused. They all reply in unison, yes, for the emperor, while Silver continues to ponder about Raoul. Meanwhile, on the street, a boy walking with his mother points to the sky and asks what it is. The woman looks up and sees a swarm of meteors, wondering aloud what they are and why there are so many. Suddenly, a loud noise ensues, and the ground shakes, causing panic among the people who shout about an earthquake. The woman hugs her child, telling him to hold on and stay close. The boy cries in his mother's arms, and as the shaking slowly subsides, he opens his eyes to see a portal in front of them. Everyone stares at the portal in surprise and confusion. Then, a hand emerges, followed by a swarm of monsters. The woman screams in fear as the monsters approach her and her child. But fortunately, someone appears and decapitates the monster just in time. Jake, in disbelief, orders everyone to evacuate to safety, declaring the area dangerous. The woman immediately picks up her child and runs away, thanking Jake for his help. 
he reported that he found a gate in Outer Wall 4, Area B, Section 32, and that they were engaging defense mechanisms. Then, he ordered his knights to evacuate the civilians and keep their guards up. Meanwhile, in Outer Wall 3, Area F, Section 21, Pierce reported that he found a gate from which a few monsters had emerged, but there had been no damage to civilians. Meanwhile, in Outer Wall 1, Philip reports that a gate appeared in the Noble Area, Section 3. They will control the area and hand it over to the guards. Meanwhile, in the mansion, Raoul praised everyone and told them to keep reporting. He was inside the mansion, looking at the map, while someone requested backup from him. He replied that he understood and ordered everyone at Section 14 to head over to Section 32 to provide support. Then, Pierce reported to him that a group of goblins had come through the gate, and they were engaging, making Raoul realize that the update had begun. He called Bernard, and Bernard appeared immediately. He ordered Bernard to decide who to dispatch from the squad and send them to each section, to which Bernard replied that he understood and left. Raoul knew this was coming, but he hadn't expected it to happen everywhere. He also knew they had prepared as much as they could, but it was still a close call for them. There wasn't enough information about that quest in the first place. The only thing he knew was that the kingdom was badly damaged in Connect Year 521 due to the appearance of gates, but he didn't know the number, location, or rank of the gates. This made him wish he could just clear the gates by himself, but he knew he was not alone now and had to minimize civilian damage using the force of his entire guild. He thought if he knew the gate's ranks, he could place his troops more efficiently. He was deep in thought when the system popped up, showing him a limited quest titled Gate Rush with a rank of X. Its objective was to clear as many gates as he could within a deadline of 30 days. The description stated that unknown dimensional gates had taken over the world of Connect, so he should clear as many gates as possible to calm the civilians. The reward for the mission was based on the ranking, and the number one guild or individual might receive a special gift. It also reminded him that the gates refresh every midnight. Surprised, he asked what it meant by refresh. He wondered if this was inevitable. He had his suspicions, but he never expected it like this. The scenario in Connect has a defensive system that can halt any play that might adversely affect the scenario. It can also add special requirements to a quest, as it has done now. Usually, it issues players sudden quests or follow-up quests. Raoul knows that no matter how many gates he clears, it won't be easy, but he can't afford to give up yet. He realizes he must find a way to minimize damage. While he is deep in thought, formulating a plan, someone reports to him that they've found the golden gate he mentioned in Outer Wall 2, Area 3, Section 17. Currently, nothing is happening there, but the force is intensifying. He orders them not to engage and cautions them that the gate they are facing can suck in anything, so they should be extremely careful. Then, he orders the deployment of three rank B mercenaries, placing that area under special watch. Philip responds that he understands. Raoul grabs his sword from his storage, knowing he can't just stay back in command anymore, especially with the appearance of a rank D gate. He decides to deal with it personally. Meanwhile, in Outer Wall 2, Area 3, Section 17, a man named Josh, 21 years old and a rank C mercenary, came from a small farm. Josh had worked his way up from rank F to where he was now. A noble, seeking mercenaries and offering a chance to become a knight, had enticed Josh with a cozy house and a meal so incredible that Josh had never experienced anything like it before. Josh thought he could just enjoy a normal life by catering to the noble's mood. He hadn't expected to face huge monsters emerging from the gold gate. The monsters rushed towards him, but he exhaled and slashed at every monster in his path. However, more monsters continuously emerged from the gate, making him realize this battle might never end, and he might exhaust himself before the monsters did. Suddenly, a huge monster emerged from the gold gate. Josh couldn't believe the number of monsters, and now there was an even bigger one. He realized he couldn't just fend them off anymore and had to focus on the large one. As Josh ran toward it, thinking he had to take down the big one first to intimidate the smaller ones, someone ran past him. Weapons on the ground began to float and directly pierce the monsters. Raoul, with his glaring blue eyes, approached the huge monster and easily decapitated it with his sword. Then, he landed on the ground as Josh watched from behind. Raoul apologized to Josh, asking if he had interrupted. Then he told Josh he looked familiar and asked if he was part of the first guild. Josh replied affirmatively, introducing himself as Rank C Mercenary, Josh. Raoul commented on Josh's ambition, noting it was too risky because Ratmen weren't easily scared. He acknowledged Josh's rank but advised that Rank D gates were too challenging for him and suggested he join them for now. However, Josh just asked him who he was as Jake approached them. Jake informed Josh that he might be new, but ignorance of his master's identity was no excuse. He then introduced him as the master of the first guild, Raoul Ashton. Jake was surprised that Raoul was the master, but Jake warned Josh not to expect an easy time just because the guild was founded by a count's son. 
He told Josh that if he was looking for an easy path, he had come to the wrong place, as their guild was only for the qualified. He advised Josh to stay alert and follow them. Then Raoul orders everyone to engage and wishes them good luck, to which they all agree. Josh looks at him, thinking that it is a guild only for the qualified, and after a moment's hesitation, he rushes to follow them. Meanwhile, inside the gold gate, the Ratmen were approaching the gate to exit, but the Ratmen was surprised upon seeing Raoul enter. Raoul swiftly slashed through the Ratmen in his path, killing them instantly. However, he quickly noticed the large number of Ratmen waiting behind, realizing there were more than he expected. It was fortunate he had decided to come himself. He made his way through, aware that he wouldn't have enough time to clear every gate and needed to act quickly. Jake informs him that this was just the entrance, but notes the large number of Ratmen. He asks Raoul if he thinks their base is nearby. Raoul replies that it might be and orders Jake to dispatch a scout to search the area. As Raoul is busy instructing Jake to prioritize the rescue of civilians, Josh dashes past him, charging at the Ratmen ahead. Josh raises his sword and begins to decimate the Ratmen, cutting off heads and slashing them in half with relentless strikes. Jake observes Josh's actions and comments on his special abilities, noting that while Josh's sword skills are unrefined, his senses are sharp. Josh, proud of his performance, gives a thumbs up, making Raoul think that Josh would improve significantly if he learned to wield mana. The knight reports to Raoul that they've located the Ratmen base behind the forest. However, no civilians were seen at the base, which was large and devoid of other monsters. Jake adds that they've ensured no civilians were near the gate, so the likelihood of finding many civilians at the base is low. Nevertheless, Raoul instructs Jake to conduct a thorough search, emphasizing that no civilians can be lost today. Jake acknowledges the order. Raoul then reminds everyone that while clearing the gate is important, rescuing civilians is the priority. He orders Josh to accompany him to the base, to which Josh immediately agrees. Finally, Raoul announces to the group that they are in for a long night and urges everyone to be prepared. The next morning, in the mansion, Dylan observes that he looks very tired after just one night and asks if he was exhausted. He then suggests that they should work out together more. Responding seriously, he tells Dylan that it's not a good time for jokes and inquires about the events of the night. Dylan, seemingly unconcerned, asks why he is so worried and reassures him that they are well prepared with all the necessary information. He then questions Dylan about the number of gates that appeared at their home. Dylan casually replies that there were about 100 gates, with 10 of them ranked D, which made it an easy task. Shocked by this revelation, he exclaims that the situation was worse than expected. However, Dylan looks at him confusedly and counters that he thought it was less severe than anticipated. He suggests going home to assist, but Dylan dismisses the idea, informing him that all the gates have already been cleared, leaving him looking at Dylan in disbelief. Dylan elaborates that it took them only half a day to clear all the gates, and even their father enjoyed the opportunity to stretch a little. He describes how Golden Bear High, Master Trevor, and Commander Ernest were all excited as if it were a festival, bored with ordinary life, which elicits an awkward laugh from him. Dylan then laughingly remarks how amusing it was to see the old men so energized, prompting him to realize that his family is far from normal. He acknowledges to Dylan that although the situation ended safely, it was reckless, reminding Dylan of his earlier instruction to leave the rank D gates alone due to their danger. Dylan, however, challenges this notion, questioning if he was expected to wait for his arrival to resolve the situation with his mysterious power. Dylan then seriously reminds him that Ashton County is strong, and that their father and he are not weak. He assures him that they are always prepared for any enemy, and the number of gates is inconsequential to them. Dylan also asserts that Ashton doesn't need the help of his knights, confidently stating that even a few hundred gates are easily manageable for them. Suddenly, Dylan calls out his name loudly, startling him. Dylan then advises him not to worry about home and to focus on his own tasks, assuring him that their father and brothers will handle any aftermath. He sighs with a smile, conceding that Dylan is right and admitting his own arrogance. Dylan then questions if he now understands, teasingly saying that he is nowhere close to being strong enough to act tough in front of him. Changing the subject, Dylan mentions that some of the gates did not disappear after being cleared, puzzling both of them. A moment later, in the meeting room, he informs his team that clearing the gates did not destroy them, and his brother Dylan reported that the rank E and D gates that appeared at their home haven't disappeared. Although there wasn't significant damage, their concerns had materialized. Jake questions if this isn't a major problem and suggests keeping an eye on them, but acknowledges their surveillance capacity is limited. Philip points out that increasing surveillance could stretch their defense squad thin and urges a swift resolution. He proposes they investigate why the gates are not vanishing to explore alternative solutions. Bernard inquires if they should mobilize their men, but he declines, deciding that only a few elite members will accompany him on this mission. Himself, Philip, Jake, and Pierce. Philip expresses concern about the small size of the team, 
but he explains that with the retired veterans actively involved back home, they cannot afford to merely observe. He then instructs Bernard to prepare a 10-man scouting team to investigate the gates, emphasizing the possibility of encountering civilians. Bernard acknowledges the order. Jake, lightening the mood, jokingly suggests preparing lunch boxes, reminiscing about the old days. Pierce, however, questions Jake about referring to events that occurred just two months ago as the old days. Philip reminds Jake that this is not a leisure trip and urges him not to lower his guard, leading to Jake clarifying that his comment was in jest. Later, inside the gold gate, they are confronted by various monsters. He checks if they are tired, but Jake, surrounded by a horde of defeated monsters, declares he's just getting warmed up. He emphasizes the need for speed, as they can't afford to waste time. As monsters leap towards them, he and Philip efficiently dispatch the creatures on their respective sides. Jake, engaged in combat, half-jokingly tells the monsters to move aside, unaware of a goblin sneaking up behind him. Just in time, an arrow strikes and kills the goblin, saving Jake who is visibly shocked. Pierce comments that there is no need for thanks, but Jake, annoyed, insists he didn't need the help, asserting he was managing fine. Pierce, sighing, turns away. Jake, still agitated, challenges Pierce to a competition for more kills, but Philip interjects, reminding Jake they are not there for games. Meanwhile, Raoul surveys the area, noting nothing remarkable except for the rugged terrain. Josh then arrives to report, and he prompts Josh to proceed. Josh informs him that the rough terrain is somewhat challenging but nothing extraordinary was found, and it appears there are no civilians in the area. He reflects on the nature of the gates, aware they are designed so that only players can approach them. He recalls that, although NPCs and Connect are significantly stronger than players and could easily clear a gate or dungeon, there are stringent restrictions to prevent this, as players would not approve of NPCs handling these challenges. NPCs are prohibited from entering gate guardian or dungeon boss rooms. Regardless of their strength, if they are not a player, they cannot close the gate. As he contemplates a solution, the system notification appears, indicating that the gate clear conditions have been met. It alerts him to a newly discovered hidden space and triggers a hidden quest name guardian elimination. The notification warns that the quest will automatically expire after 30 minutes if not accepted. The quest details reveal that guardian elimination is a grade D plus quest with the objective to eliminate the gate guardian. The description states that a powerful guardian is protecting the gate, and he must neutralize the guardian and the gate to complete the quest. The rewards include experience points, gold, and a low tier random item box. Normally, he would be excited about a hidden quest but he acknowledges the time constraints they are under. He then inquires if the others have also seen the hidden quest, to which they affirmatively respond. Philip wonders if they need to locate the gate guardian themselves, expressing doubt that any of the creatures they've already encountered could be the guardian. Suddenly, Josh points out something behind him, asking if by chance the guardians they were discussing are the ones appearing behind him. Turning around, he sees a figure with a huge foot emerging. The ranky gate guardian, a dark corrupted goblin, reveals itself to them. Philip tells them that he guessed it was the place's guardian. Jake asks the goblin if it came to them by itself and tells it that it was worthy of its size. Philip tells them that they didn't look for it, which is convenient. Josh tells them to leave the guardian to him because he'll take care of it. But Raoul tells Josh no, because he is going to take the goblin alone and orders them to step aside. Josh fearfully steps aside and replies that he understood. Jake asks Philip what is up with Raoul, but Philip just asks Jake back what he means, when Raoul always leads the battles. On the other hand, Raoul sighed, knowing that he ordered them to step aside because there are no rewards given when NPCs eliminate the Guardian, and he doesn't expect much from a rank E gate. But he asked himself why not do it himself when he wants to see if the gate will stay open if he eliminates the Guardian himself. The goblin launched its Morning Star weapon at him, but he just blocked it with his sword. The goblin tried to forcefully push his sword down, which caused sparks. Still, he tried his best to block it, and when the goblin's force was all in his weapon, he released his sword from blocking its weapon, which made it unbalanced. Then he immediately swung his sword up and slashed the goblin's body in half. Jake tells them that it was too easy for Raoul, and Philip responds that the Guardian is nothing for their young master. But Josh can't believe it and thinks Raoul is crazy because he parried the heavy attack and created space at the same time, making Josh wonder if that's how skilled the guild master was. After the fight, Raoul realizes what ranky guardians are like and understands that a ranky guardian can be difficult for unskilled mercenaries to fight against. He knows that the gate should disappear now that the Guardian has been defeated, and then the system pops up as he expected and shows him that the Guardian elimination was detected, so the gate will disappear soon. 
Then it warned him of an error because the compulsion was activated, shutting down the gate collapse sequence. It also showed him that the current gate is a scenario gate and the entrance will be shut and reopened at midnight, making him look at it confused. A moment later, he ordered them to pay attention to the core of ore and explain to them that it was the heart of power armor. Core ore is a grady and it is a rare mineral that is only found in gates and dungeons. Also, it can be used to make power armor if processed right. He tells them that they have to collect as much as they can find because, with enough of those, they can make a power armor factory. Jake asks him if he means that thing is super valuable, making Pierce ask Jake if he is not listening. He looks back at the gate and realizes that he defeated the Guardian. Yet the gate didn't disappear, but he knows that he can't go against the scenario. He thinks it's not bad because he was going to follow the scenario anyway and swears that he will get infinitely stronger with those infinitely respawning gates. Then he tells them that they are now going to clear every single d rank gate that has appeared in the capital and they are not going to rest, so they should stay awake. Jake replies that he has been waiting for this. He tells them that they need one more mercenary to join them and asks Josh if he can come with them, making Josh surprised and ask if he really means him. He tells Josh that he took his opportunity to shine this time, so he'll let him have this one, to which Josh excites replies that he understands. Then he tells them that they should go. Later, they enter another rank D gate. He is surprised as he walks inside, wondering if it's just a normal cave because that place would be completely dark without the gate. He wasn't expecting it, but he thought it was good that he brought one of those, then he opens his storage to get something. Jake walks inside, shouting about how dark it is, and asks where they are. He just orders Jake to stay close to the gate since it's dangerous. He takes out a lamp from his storage and tells them that they should look around using it. Jake is amazed to see the magic lamp and tells them that he heard those lamps are rare. Philip tells them that it's the first time he has actually seen a lamp and thinks that it's really nice. He tells them that they can see what's around them, but they should make sure to stay close and try not to spread out thin and fight together. Then he asks them if they understand, which they confirm that they do. Then he gives the lamp to Josh and tells him that his first mission is to take care of that lamp. Josh asks him if he is really the one who should take care of that precious lamp, and he replies that he is giving it to him because he trusts him, so he should try his best since he is their guild's rookie. Josh is surprised to hear that he's called a rookie and swears to him that he'll protect that lamp with his life. He peeks at Josh, knowing that there's no way Josh had known that he was the lucky one, because Josh would soon become a rank S mercenary and be hailed as a possible candidate for the position of mercenary king. Then he sees that Josh's level is 38 with classes of free mercenary and first guild, which is temporary. Josh's potential talent is grade A, strength is 53, agility is 56, stamina is 59, intelligence is 32, willpower is 48, and senses are 62. Josh's unique traits are beast sense, which is grade A+, competitive, which is grade B, and desire for success, which is grade C+. Then Raul asks Pierce how things are up there and if he sees anything. Pierce replies that he saw multiple movements in the dark and is sure of one thing, they were exuding a hostile aura. Suddenly, Pierce spots something and immediately releases his arrows toward it. Pierce hits something in the dark, and Jake, panicky, asks Pierce if he found something and if he hit it. Pierce confidently replies that he could hit something with his eyes closed and tells them that they are surrounded, glaring back at the bat. Suddenly, a swarm of bats flies down toward them. He shouts to his team that they are giant bats and they attack where they see light. Josh looks at the lamp he's holding when he hears the mention of light, and then the bats begin to attack him. Jake tells him that the bats are all gathering around the lamp, and he orders Josh to drop the lamp. However, Josh angrily swings his swords at the bats, asking them in anger if they dare to challenge him, the rookie. Josh slashes at the bats near him while still holding the lamp. The bats, being chopped into pieces, scream in pain while Josh continuously slashes at them, shouting to the bats that they are not touching the lamp. Jake tells him that Josh is going crazy and that he hyped him up too much. He tells Jake that it's good to have someone energetic and they should just say it was a type of admission test. Josh, still fighting the bats, asks them if they are just going to keep watching. But Jake just tells Josh that he is too slow. Philip reminds Josh that he said he was the rookie, so he can do it alone, without them noticing the huge monster behind them watching. After defeating the bats, they proceed to walk further. Jake comments that they are in pretty deep but still haven't seen anything significant, questioning if the cave is just full of bats. Philip warns Jake not to let his guard down because the cave is still a D rank gate, and their master is also staying vigilant, so they should keep up. Josh, looking at Raoul from behind, asks Philip how strong their master is. Philip replies that it depends on what his definition of strong is. He mentions that Raoul is getting stronger every day and lacks nothing as a member of the Ashton family. However, judging by pure sword skills, Raoul is probably weaker than Jake. Suddenly, Jake shouts from behind, exclaiming about the size of the bugs, prompting Philip to tell Josh that despite Jake's appearance, his sword skill is amazing. 
Suddenly, Raoul senses something and Philip approaches him. Raoul acknowledges he was aware of it and then addresses the monsters in front of him, indicating they've finally come out. He observes the armored scorpions, which are level 45, rank D, with traits of acid poison and steel armor. Jake shouts about their ugliness, but Philip cautions them about the large number of scorpions and the need for caution. Raoul knows that the giant bats couldn't be the main enemies in a D rank gate, and that these scorpions only appear in gates and dungeons, guessing it's his members' first time facing such a monster. He draws his sword and instructs his members that whatever the situation, if it's a quest, they must get through it. He advises them about the scorpion's steel hard armor and poisonous stinger, then asks if they are ready to eliminate them all. Suddenly, the system pops up, displaying a quest titled D rank Dimension Gate with the objective to eliminate 50 armored scorpions. The quest has no time limit, and the rewards include experience points, gold, and a low tier random material box. Raoul realizes it's not a conquest but an elimination quest, asking him to clear the quest, not to destroy the gate. As the scorpions jump at him, he decides to ponder this after dealing with the immediate threat. He raises his sword to confront the oncoming scorpions. Meanwhile, Philip and Jake are also fighting off the scorpions. The scorpions leap towards Josh, who is still clinging to the lamp for dear life. Josh curses the scorpions, wondering why they are targeting him, oblivious to the scorpion behind him. Just as the scorpion is about to strike him with its tail, Josh manages to turn around in time and slash it. However, another scorpion appears behind him, launching its tail, making him realize he can't dodge it. Fortunately, swords strike the scorpion just in time, and Josh is surprised to see the swords floating. Raoul, who was controlling the swords, asks Josh if protecting a lamp and fighting simultaneously is challenging. He expresses his concern that he might be stealing Josh's chance to shine, when all he wants is for Josh to focus on protecting the lamp. Then he releases the swords directly at the scorpions in front of him, piercing their bodies and killing hundreds in just a minute. Jake comments that Raoul took care of most of the scorpions and thought he could have stretched a little this time, while Josh's mouth hangs open in shock. Josh looks at Raoul, thinking he isn't real. He had heard Raoul is only 15 years old and realizes that Raoul isn't just role-playing a noble knight, Raoul is the master he will serve. Raoul looks at the scorpions killed on the ground and notices that he has killed 50 of them, meeting the minimum requirement to clear the gate. He then tells them they should go deeper. Jake says he thought the quest was over, but Raoul tells him they have to make sure since they are already there, and a rank D gate is dangerous if left uncleared. Jake mumbles that he thought they could finally get out of the cave, but Philip tells Jake to stop mumbling. Raoul looks around, knowing they met the requirement, yet the hidden quest to destroy the gate didn't pop up, making him realize they had to find the Guardian themselves. He knows it is dangerous to leave the Guardian alone, so he has to find it, even if it takes time. Suddenly, Pierce asks him if he can hear him. Raoul replies yes and asks Pierce if he found anything. Pierce says he found the end of the cave but thought it'd be better if Raoul took a look at it himself, glancing at the huge arena in front of him. A moment later, they arrive at the end and see a circular arena in the middle of the cave. Jake guesses the one in the middle is the Guardian, and Raoul agrees that it probably is. Jake asks why it isn't moving and suggests it looks like it's waiting for them. The d rank Guardian, Scorpion Champion, who is level 64, grade C+, stands in the center of the arena, glaring at them. Raoul comments that it's funny and the Scorpion Champion is inviting them, so they have to accept the invitation. He jumps down into the arena, followed by his members. He safely lands, feeling bad for his members, but then walks toward the Scorpion Champion, thinking he can't yield this one and it's not just for the reward. He tells the Scorpion Champion that he made him wait, so it should come at him with all it has got. This makes the Scorpion Champion angry and growl at him. Then the Scorpion Champion raises its hand and tail to attack, and Raoul swings his sword forward in response. The Scorpion Champion swings its sword at him, but he blocks it with his sword. Then, the Scorpion Champion launches its stinger, but fortunately, he jumps away in time to dodge it. He swings his sword down at the Scorpion Champion, only to be surprised when it blocks his attack with its claw, then throws him away, causing him to slide backwards. The Scorpion Champion furiously runs toward him, and he charges to meet it in the center. Their swords collide, glaring at each other. They begin to swing their swords back and forth, trying to strike each other. From above, Philip notices that the Scorpion Champion is holding its own against Raoul. Jake guesses that the Rank D Gate Guardians aren't easy. Josh wonders if they should help if Raoul is struggling. But Jake responds, pointing out that Raoul has a definite advantage. He notes that the Scorpion Champion is using a sword, claws, and a poisonous tail, yet Raoul has only used his sword from the beginning, indicating that Raoul is relaxed and seems to be enjoying the fight. On the other hand, Raoul remembers how long it's been since he last felt this way. He's finally free from training, real estate, and guild management, 
able to focus solely on the fight. However, he knows he can't enjoy this forever. He uses his mana to enhance his sword and tells the Scorpion Champion that he's busy at the moment, so they should move on to the next phase. He did enjoy fighting, but unfortunately, he's short on time, so it's time to end their fight. The Scorpion Champion smiles at him and uses a mana blade too, surprising him. Suddenly, it throws poison at him. Shocked, he manages to jump to the side in time to avoid the poison. When the poison lands on the ground, it melts the surface. He can't believe the Scorpion Champion can shoot poison too. As he's preoccupied with this thought and the need to be cautious, he sees the Scorpion Champion swing its sword to attack him. He manages to block it just in time, and their swords clash with a force that causes a loud explosion sound in the cave. From above, his members cover their faces to protect themselves from the force of the clash. Pierce notes that the Scorpion Champion can use a mana blade, which is unexpected. Josh, worriedly, shouts to them that he thought this was now an emergency and asks if they are sure they don't need to help Raul. Jake tells Josh to stop overreacting and questions if he's really considering interfering in Raul's fight. Then Philip tells Josh that they would only distract Raul if they tried to help him, so they should just believe in Raul. On the other hand, Raul is asking himself how he could forget and lie without this thrill. He remembers the days when he lived to fight and fought only to live. He realizes that he had forgotten about the thrill of a life and death situation and the intensity of combat. He decides to use the Scorpion Champion as much as he can, as Crash, the Paramount solo player. He looks at the Scorpion Champion and realizes that it's not easy at all, considering it has a mana blade, ranged attacks, and high strength and agility. However, its moves are simple and large, so he knows he can use that to his advantage. He runs toward it with his sword in front, wondering what it will use this time, sword, claw, or tail. The Scorpion Champion opens its claws to attack him but he sees it coming and jumps away in time, making its claw stuck in the ground. Shocked, the Scorpion Champion tries to pull its claw out, but Raul sees this as an opportunity. He immediately jumps above it and cuts its tail off with one swing of his sword. It screams in pain, but he doesn't let it recover and quickly jumps back at it. He swings his sword to cut it in half. He tells the Scorpion Champion that it was nice having a nostalgia trip through him and bids it farewell. Jake asks if Raul just keeps getting stronger, to which Philip agrees and tells them it hasn't been long since Raul reached the expert stage, but he's already at the intermediate level. Philip then tells Jake that it's only a matter of time until Raul surpasses his level of skill with the sword, making Jake frown. Jake shoutingly tells Raul that they should move on to the next gate, but he calls dibs on the next gate guardian, leaving Raul wondering what is wrong with Jake. The notification pops up, showing that his sword skill bear crush grade A plus has reached intermediate level 4. His class changes to knight intermediate sword expert. The elimination of the gate guardian is approved, and the hidden quest is complete. Smiling, he thinks to himself that it was nice. He then apologizes to his members for taking some time and mentions that it must have been boring just to watch. Josh excitedly replies that it was amazing and that his combat just cleansed his eyes, making him awkwardly thank Josh. Philip praises him for his nice work and asks what they're going to do about the next gate. He replies that they're running late as per their schedule, so they should get to it. Then he begins to walk, reminding them that he already told them today was going to be a long day, so they should be ready. Jake replies that it's exactly what he wanted. They clear gates without rest, and after spending 7 hours just clearing gates, they end up clearing 4 rank D gates. Fully rested mercenary units are deployed on rank E gates under Bernard's command, and they finish every mission safely, concluding every single gate that appears in the capital, Turium. There were approximately 500 casualties on the first day, and they rescued around 700 people. He knows that most people think that it's over, but he also knows that this is just a little skirmish before the real war. People in the street begin to talk about the gates, how some people are dragged into them, and monsters coming out from them. They figure out why they saw many mercenaries and knights, and how they predicted and are preparing for it. A lady chuckling heard that they were from the prestigious Ashton County, and the youngest son was in command. They talk about Rahul Ashton, who was sleeping in his sofa mansion, tired. Meanwhile, in Randall County Mansion, a man faces the county of Randall who is reading the newspaper about neutralizing gates in the capital, Turium. The prestigious warrior family, Ashton County, is back, selected by Turium citizens as a man of the hour, Raoul Ashton, and Ashton County's great leap forward may be a sign of getting involved in politics. The county tears the newspaper into pieces, shouting that everything they prepared was blown away in a week. He then asks Brian if he thinks it makes sense. Brian, fearfully calling the county his father, tells him that there's no need to worry. But the county becomes more furious, releasing a strong aura which causes Brian to kneel down on the ground, enduring it in pain. The county tells Brian that he made over 30 sons until he turned 60, yet all of them are useless. He then thinks that, on the other hand, the sons of Ashton are all worthy. The chandelier shakes because of the force the county is releasing. 
but then it stops moving when the county calms down. Brian stands up, and the county asks him how he calls himself an expert knight when he can't even withstand that much pressure. Brian apologizes to the county, but Hudson D. Randall, the county of Randall, firmly orders Brian to report everything that happened after he started training in seclusion for a month. Brian begins to report that about two weeks ago, there was an official document sent out by the shrine. He takes out a paper from his coat, which Hudson opens to read. The letter states that the confirmed number of gates is 73, with around 40 cleared in the week, but the number is still increasing. The casualties are around 3,200 civilians missing or deceased. 15 knights and about 1,300 troops are missing or deceased, and knights are scared to enter the gate, leading to an increased number of casualties among the troops. For now, gates have been blocked and surveillance has been placed around them. Hudson angrily puts down the letter, causing Brian to look at his father in horror. From outside Hudson's office, Brian is thrown away, breaking the office door in the process and slamming hard against the wall outside. Hudson walks closer to his son, who is begging him, but he coldly tells Brian to get out, declaring there's no place for him in Randall anymore. He warns Brian not to think about stepping into Randall territory until called for. Hudson adds that if he sees Brian again, he won't hesitate to kill him, regardless of their relationship. He orders Brian to tell the third oldest to come to his office on his way out. A knight helps Brian out of the room, while Hudson fumes in anger, thinking about the Ashtons. Meanwhile, at Kingdom Academy, a maid asks her friend if the person they see is Raoul, the young master of Ashton County. She tells her friend that she heard Raoul led his knights and made a significant contribution. She comments on Raoul's handsomeness as students whisper about him being the youngest ever to achieve the top rank and the good pay his knights receive. Caleb, fuming in anger, calls everyone who praises Raoul stupid, claiming that Raoul didn't actually do anything. A friend of Caleb angrily bets that Raoul's family did everything for him and that Raoul is just showing off for saving a few civilians from the gate. Caleb tells everyone that once reinforcements from his family arrive, he will prove he is better than Raoul. On the other hand, Raoul is getting tired of all the attention, feeling like an animal at the zoo, and wonders why they don't just talk to him. Suddenly, Dalton places his hand on Raoul's shoulder and remarks that he has become a celebrity in just a week. Dalton also mentions that he guessed Raoul did great since the entire capital is talking about him. Raoul, however, tells Dalton that he doesn't want to know about it. Dalton then asks if the rumors are true about Raoul being the real heir to Ashton County. This makes Raoul ask Dalton, in surprise, what he just said. Dalton explains that this is what the rumors suggest and questions what family would give so many troops to a son who is not an heir. Raoul tells Dalton to cut the nonsense, stating that his older brother is the heir, and that he himself has no interest in being the heir. To clarify, he also tells Dalton that he recruited his own knight order and had no support from his family. Dalton, surprised by this revelation, asks how that could be. Raoul replies that he had some money. Dalton then says he understands now and suggests that maybe he should visit that gate thing with Raoul. However, Raoul suddenly realizes something and stares at Dalton, making Dalton ask why he is staring at him. Raoul is just internally cursing because he realizes he has inadvertently caught someone. Raoul's admission to the academy may have seemed like an excuse for him to get out of the house, but in reality, he had another goal, to find skill books in the library and uncover hidden prospects within the academy. Although the list of new students was altered due to Gray's sudden appearance, candidates for recruitment had already been selected based on information Raoul found on the Link Cafe, and the brat Dalton was one of them. He knew that the strongest person in the kingdom was Swordmaster Marquis D. Templeton. In the world of Connect, where contact with high-ranking noble NPCs was almost impossible, it was an incredible opportunity for him to get to know Templeton's grandson, Dalton. He knew that not just anyone was allowed to enter the gate, they must obtain official permission or have at least 50 troops and three official knights, making it impossible for Dalton to enter the gate alone. However, even if Dalton was at the level of an expert, he had never confirmed his skills himself, leading Raoul to guess that Dalton must be desperate for a chance to gain real battle experience, such as a gate subjugation. He smiled at the thought and asked Dalton if he wanted to undertake the task together, explaining that if it was an f rank gate, there wouldn't be any danger. Dalton excitedly turned back to him, agreeing that getting closer to him was a good decision. However, Raoul mentioned he had a few conditions, confusing Dalton, who then inquired about them. Raoul specified that first, he would be the only one he'd be bringing into the gate, so no servants or guards could accompany them. Dalton replied that it didn't matter to him, and on the contrary, he preferred to have fewer annoying people joining. Raoul then stated that the second condition was keeping the fact that they were going into the gate together a secret to avoid gossip. Dalton agreed, expressing his dislike for getting involved in family matters. Raoul wondered if Dalton wasn't worried about the potential for bad intentions, 
but knew no one would dare to cross a major noble family like the Templeton Duchy. Lastly, Raoul told Dalton that he must get permission from the Duke, which shocked Dalton and made him stutteringly ask if it was really necessary. Raoul responded by questioning if it wasn't obvious and expressed concern for Dalton's safety. He explained they needed someone to handle the situation if something were to happen, emphasizing that the excursion was not for fun but an official visit. Additionally, Raoul mentioned his responsibilities with a night troop, indicating he couldn't be bothered with personal affairs. Dalton, unsure but acknowledging the truth in Raoul's words, turned to leave, saying they should talk again once he obtained permission from the Duke. Frustrated, Dalton scratched his head, wondering how he would convince the old man. Later, in Ashton's mansion, Bernard asks him if anything has happened at the academy. Raoul replies that the attention is somewhat tiring, but he's fine with it because he started this hoping for it to happen. Bernard then advises maintaining public opinion at its current level. Raoul inquires how many people have been deployed so far, and Bernard answers that, in the past two days, 100 soldiers have been deployed as decoys, and an additional 10 wandering mercenaries have been hired as well. Additionally, there are around 20 active spies in the main branch who have completed their basic training. Raoul acknowledges it was a war of public opinion and, amidst the fierce political battle between the nobles, it was essential work needed to solidify their position. As expected, searching for a voice from Reuben was a good decision, and thanks to them providing information about the gates unconditionally, a friendly reputation has spread throughout the kingdom. He is aware that if one questions how a single media outlet can exert such influence, they don't understand the media's position and connect. The media and Connect is an elite organization that primarily consists of magicians. Moreover, one of the continent's three great sages, Jean is white, is the president of the press association, and their status is high even among the high-status individuals. Among them, the most influential media is none other than the voice of Reuben. He realizes they don't have to fight wars with swords alone because they must use everything at their disposal. He then orders Philip to double the number of wandering mercenaries and have mercenaries with a good sense of humor on standby because, sooner or later, people from all over will come to keep them in check. Surprised by his words, Philip asks who would keep them in check. Bernard responds to Philip's question by suggesting they are likely greedy noblemen and explains that since the gate situation has stabilized somewhat, they'll try to get a foothold one step at a time. Raoul admits he'd welcome them if it were a simple gate subjugation. But as expected, that's not feasible. Bernard warns they are likely trying to find his faults and tarnish his reputation, necessitating that he leave even more obvious clues for them. Raoul sighs, noting they can only strive for these crumbs in the first place because no one besides the Chosen can close a gate. He then instructs Philip to keep this secret for the time being because if the information spreads, many lords will feign ignorance about the gates, to which Philip acknowledges his understanding. He concludes that even if he has to exploit the Lord's greed, he must gather soldiers in the kingdom because it's the only way to address the impending crisis facing the kingdom. Meanwhile, somewhere in the street, a man runs at speed, his cape and shirt in tatters. The man curses, unable to believe they continue to be hunted despite entering a gate, and wonders just what their deal is. For now, he decides he must lure as many of those bastards as possible, buying time for his comrades to get away. However, the man is shocked and stops running when he sees the men chasing him in front of him. One of the men calls out, identifying him as the guild leader of the information organization, Wings of Freedom, alias Faceless, and tells him it's nice to meet him this way. Faceless tells them they are the ones who have been hunting down underworld guilds for half a year. The man replies that, as expected from the head of the kingdom's best information organization, he was quick-witted. He asks Faceless what brings them there and if they are trying to hunt him down this time. The man replies that initially, he planned to do just that, but instead, he'll make an offer. Faceless grips his dagger behind his back while asking what the offer is. The man proposes that Faceless surrender, arguing it would be a waste to kill someone as powerful in the underworld as him, and if he promises to join them, they will spare his life. The man then asks what Faceless says to his offer, but Faceless, without a word, takes out his dagger and leaps toward them while shouting for the man to stop spouting nonsense. However, the man blocks his attack with his armor, leaving Faceless shocked and stuttering, asking if it was power armor. He then jumps away and shouts that he was on the fence about it, but they indeed were bastards from the Empire. The man comments that it was a refreshing deduction and asks if he should call it a dangerous suspicion. Then, the other men with the man dash towards Faceless, while the man says that now that it has come to this, he leaves him no choice and orders the men to kill him. As the men get closer and are about to attack, he vanishes. The men look around, shouting that he disappeared and questioning if it was stealth magic. The other man thinks Faceless used an artifact and couldn't have gotten far, so they should search the surroundings, not noticing him on one of the house's roofs. Faceless can't believe that the mysterious organization hunting guilds was from the Empire, 
and wonders what the hell is going on in that kingdom. The next day, in Ashton's mansion, the guard captain reports to Raoul that, as just announced, the first knight's rank F gate permit has now been cancelled, making Jake pissed and shout that it makes no sense. However, Philip stops Jake. He replies that he guessed it had to be that way and asks about the rank E and rank D gates. The guard captain replies that he was still permitted to enter those ranks. He tells the guard captain that it is better and asks who will be taking care of the rank F gates from now on. The guard captain replies that he is not sure, but multiple families are expected to take part in it. He expected it to happen because rank F is less dangerous and therefore better for showing off. So, if everything goes well, they could earn a lot too. He notices that the guard captain seems confused by it too and thinks that it'd be better to earn the guard captain's trust there. So, he laughingly tells the guard captain that he understood it and that if there is any problem, he should pay them a visit and they will have a team ready anytime. The guard captain, stutteringly, asks him if he really means it, surprised and relieved, while telling him that he is a righteous person and wishes the other nobles were like him. He tells the guard captain that it is a noble's duty to protect the city and the civilians, so they should work together. The guard captain then hesitantly tells him that he has to be careful about saying it, but there is a rumor that Randall is behind all of it. In his opinion, the Ministry of Finance was the one who led it. But it was just his entirely personal guess because a lot of people from that department are close with the Randalls, including the minister. The guard captain also tells him that he wanted him to know since it seems unusual. He replies that he understood and thanked the guard captain for telling them. Later, he asks them if he is right that everyone heard it and tells them that they are expecting it, so it shouldn't be much of a surprise. But Jake asks him if it isn't too much and what did they do to lose the permit. He replies that it was a direct order from the royal palace. So they have to obey, and there is no need to be sad about it because they didn't lose anything from it, making Jake ask him how it was so. He explains to them that rank F gates can be cleared with normal troops, so deploying mercenaries they hired with their money is a waste, and all they can get from them are mediocre items. It was better to focus on rank E and higher gates, which Jake agreed with. Philip then asks him what they should do with their men once they are pulled out of the rank F gates, and he orders Philip to assign them to gates outside the wall for training because they should use that opportunity to clear some leftover gates outside. He tells them that those who are blind to the items won't last long, and it might come back to haunt them sooner or later because controlling the gate isn't an easy job, and what they need the most right now is merit, fame, and growth. So, they should forget about what is happening outside and focus on themselves. He then orders them to focus on commanding the mercenaries and their personal growth, which they all reply that they understood. He knows that a week from now, the official night investiture ceremony, which occurs once a year, will take place, and it was the first night's time to shine. He also knows that they have to work hard until the ceremony to catch everyone's attention, so that people outside the kingdom hear about them too. Later, at the rank F gate, the soldiers are asking each other if they are sure the nobles are coming and what they should do if something bad happens there. But another soldier replies that they have to take care of it because he and his comrade are both worthless unless they obey those nobles. Then they heard a horse approaching behind them and saw a noble, with the soldier shouting for everyone to back off. The nobleman was Austin D. Carrington, the Carrington Viscounty's fourth son, and the soldier introduced himself as Bill, the person currently in charge of controlling the gate, to Austin politely. Austin asks Bill if it is the gate, and Bill, confusedly, replies yes. But Austin just asks again if that is the gate or whatever while looking at the flaming gate, and Bill replies yes. Austin tells Bill that his men are on the way, so he should ask them all to get out, making Bill ask Austin if he was saying that he'll be going in right now. But Austin just shouts to his comrade that they are going straight in and they should follow him. Bill asks Austin what about his horse, making Austin pissed, and Bill calmly tells Austin that if he hasn't hired any men to take care of their horses, they will take care of them. But Austin just kicks Bill away and angrily shouts at Bill to know his place. Austin also asks Bill how dare he ask him to get off his horse, and Bill explains that he didn't mean anything by it and was about to explain. But Austin shouts at him to shut up and that he will ask his captain about it. Austin called them fucking peasants and told his comrades that they should go. Another guard asked Bill if he was okay, to which Bill cursed in response. Bill also says that he clearly told Austin, so it was not his fault if their horses went crazy inside the gate. Bill realizes that Austin doesn't know that horses are not allowed there because of the high mana density, and even if they are lucky enough to survive, they will suffer a lot, making Bill guess that they'll be busy moving bodies tonight. When Austin entered the gate, he asked his knight if this was what was inside the gate and said that he didn't see anything. The knight replied that there were only orcs or goblins there, so there was no need for him to be nervous. Austin cursed because he thought that he would find some treasure there and clenched his fist, thinking that if only that fraud hadn't shown off. Austin was pissed, thinking that Raoul became a star in the capital for killing some monster using his wealth and swore that he will clear every single gate left open to bring Raoul down. 
He then orders his men to clear the gate because they have to eliminate every monster and divide into units to eliminate the monsters. Marco, the Praetorian guard, tells Austin that dividing the troops inside a gate is very dangerous, and they should keep their men together and use scouts to look around. But Austin just asks Marco what he is so scared of and angrily shouts to Marco that they can't clear all the gates like that. Austin also asked Marco what people are going to think of them if they couldn't even clear a gate like it. But Marco didn't respond when he heard a growling sound. Marco looked back and was shocked to see something. Marco then shouts to Austin to get behind him while a monster is staring at them, growling. The monsters come out of the forest and walk toward them, making them panic. Austin shakes in fear when he sees the monsters, but Marco shouts to them to stay calm and hold their positions. They should also prepare for combat, which they all did, and lift their spears up to the huge monsters. Later, in Ashton's mansion, he asks the guard captain what he means by missing, what he is referring to, and if he is talking about the people who entered the rank F gate. The guard captain replies yes and states it makes no sense, but every team that went in has gone missing. He asks the guard captain to clarify what he means by every team and the guard captain replies that within the past two days, ten teams have disappeared, even though they all met the requirements to clear the gate. He wonders if the gate transforms, causing the teams to be annihilated, but he knows that such phenomena only occur in higher rank gates, making him wonder if there is something else inside the gate. Bernard calls him worriedly, and he orders Bernard to gather the High Knights, including Homer, making Bernard ask if he means the training instructor as well and what is happening. He replies that they are going on a rescue mission to the gate. Later, inside the same rank F gate, a frog jumps to attack but is slashed in half by someone. Dalton covers his face while shouting that it was all over him. Dalton then asks if gates are usually like this and complains that it is boring and nasty. He asks Dalton what he was expecting and tells him that they can't predict the terrain inside a gate. He also reminds Dalton that he had already told him they weren't coming here to play around, which Dalton agrees to. He noticed that the gate rank was low for Dalton's level but considering Dalton's lack of experience, it was the best place for him. Philip reports that the scouts are back, and he asks Philip what they said. Philip replies that, as they expected, monster sightings have reduced, and he tells Philip that they are well prepared. He already knew information about the rank F gate because the system showed him that it was a rank F dimension gate with a max capacity of 300. The concurrent access limit is unknown. The current occupancy is 132 out of 300, its current stack is 0 out of 2, and its type is elimination. He knows that no one else should have entered besides the conquest teams, but they say that there are many more and it was a trap. However, he bets they aren't expecting to be the ones trapped instead. A moment later, somewhere inside the gate, he thinks right there should be a good spot and tells Homer that he thinks it is a good spot, to which Homer agrees. The first guild knight, Homer, tells him that they can look down toward the flat area facing the swamp, making him also think that it was a good area. He then tells them that they should start working and informs Homer that the place will be their base. He sets everyone in their train positions, which Homer agrees to. Dalton asks him what he is trying to do on that hill, and he replies that they are building a fort, making Dalton surprised. Dalton asks him what he means by a fort out of nowhere, but he simply gathers some of his power in his palm while telling Dalton to keep his eyes open because he might learn something. He then raises his palm, making Dalton shocked as the ground shakes. He orders Homer to begin, and Homer commands his knights to activate the artifact. The knights, all together, activate the artifact they are holding, and he casts a huge circle above them, leaving Dalton stunned in surprise. He then releases a swarm of blocks, making Dalton shout, asking what those are, but he just orders them to proceed as they trained and form into Formation A, because they are going straight in. He then layers the blocks and begins to form something in a rush. Dalton covers his face because of the dust and asks him what he did. When Dalton opened his eyes, he couldn't believe that a fort was made in just a few minutes. He tells Dalton that it was made in a rush but will serve its purpose and is better than sleeping under a tent. He explains to Dalton that it is 3 meters tall and 20 meters wide, so at least 100 people could fit inside, and it is the perfect base to wait for the enemies in. Dalton asks if he is planning a siege and if the gate is dangerous enough to warrant building a fort. He replies that gates are dangerous places, but they only need a fort for this one. He knows that many artifacts were needed to reduce the brick's weight and size, but he believes it was worth it. He remembers that a method he had used a few times, called Simple Fortress, is usually used in high-rank gates or to reduce dungeon clear time. He also remembers that he trained the guild member who could use artifacts for this moment but didn't expect to use it this early. Dalton, in confusion, tells him that he has a lot of questions but will only ask one, making him ask Dalton what it is. Dalton then asks why he needs that fort and tells him that he thought they were trying to rescue the missing people. He replies that this is why they need it, making Dalton more confused and telling him that forts are for defending against enemy attacks. He then asks what he was preparing to spend on a rescue mission, but he just tells Dalton that he will see. 
He thinks that the enemies probably think they are ready for it and probably aren't even anticipating a single chance of failure, but he was willing to see whose preparation is more thorough. On the other hand, down the hill, Jack, the Imperial Hound and commander of Reuben Kingdom's district team number 8, was peacefully sitting in his chair, smiling victoriously. A man respectfully reports to Jack that they have taken hostages as instructed. Jack inquires whether the rescue team has arrived, and the man confirms. He then reports to Jack that they have located a rescue team similar in size to the one they captured, and the scout team is watching them closely. Jack, gripping his sword at his side, expresses his hope that they can provide some entertainment this time and begins to walk, remarking on the nobility of that kingdom being so weak that he hasn't had any fun. Jack then suggests they go out for a hunt, assuming they must follow the captain's orders. However, another man urgently interjects with a report that the scout observing the rescue team has noted they are inside a fortress, doing nothing, which surprises Jack. He asks for clarification on what is meant by a fortress. Meanwhile, inside the fortress, Dalton lies on the ground, yawning, questioning if their adversaries are truly coming for them, as he is bored and didn't come for idleness. He is told not to get comfortable and that their opponents will arrive any moment. Dalton, acknowledging the strategic purpose behind building the fortress, inquires about who they are expecting. He is told that there was no intention to keep it a secret and is encouraged to see for himself. Confused, Dalton looks outside, spotting Jack and a swarm of masked men. When Dalton asks if these are their adversaries, the answer is affirmative. Jack, seizing one of his men, angrily questions what the fortress is doing there and how it was built, but the man stutters that he is unsure. He raises his hand to command, noting to Dalton that their enemies likely thought they had trapped them perfectly, which must be confusing for them. The knights aim their arrows at the enemy, while he comments that the enemies have realized they are the ones actually trapped. Philip tells the knights to get ready. With his hand raised, he acknowledges that the enemy did not expect a siege at the gate, and is certain they were unprepared for one, which must be frustrating for them. Noticing Jack's short temper, he contemplates whether to provoke him further. He then taunts them, calling them the Empire's dogs, and asks why they are roaming without a leash, infuriating Jack. Observing this, he mocks them for appearing mentally challenged by their heavy armor and teasingly inquires if they are lost. Jack smiled, calling him an arrogant youngster and asked if he was from Ashton. Brandishing his red sword, Jack shouted that while he was arrogant, he certainly had guts, and Jack was going to enjoy slicing and destroying him because he intended to kill him personally. Jack then ordered his men to attack, proclaiming that they would take the fortress. He smiled, knowing they had fallen into his trap. He then grabbed his sword from his inventory, and Dalton did the same, admitting he still didn't understand what was happening but was sure they were from the Empire. He ordered his men to fire, and the knights released their arrows. However, the masked men dodged and blocked the arrows, shouting proudly that their actions were for the Emperor's glory. One of the knights was stunned to see a masked man close to killing him. But the attacker stopped in fear when Dalton appeared in front of him and easily slashed two masked men in the air. Dalton angrily called them dirty empire dogs, commenting that killing those frogs felt less disgusting. Jack, infuriated at seeing another arrogant youngster, declared that things were getting better. He then signaled it was time to show some respect. A masked man blew the horn, and he was shocked to see monsters emerging behind Jack, who laughed. The monsters growled at them, and Jack arrogantly suggested they see how much longer they could keep their mouths open. Dalton asked what those were and if they were monsters. He replied that they were the Empire's Mana soldiers, noting that they seemed to have been upgraded since he last saw them and were probably their best, making him think his plan was perfect. The soldiers panicked as the Empire's Mana soldiers advanced closer to the fortress. The Mana soldier growled at them in anger and screamed loudly. Dalton shouted that it was a monster and that the Empire had really created something formidable. One of the Empire soldiers dashed towards the fortress to attack, and Philip shouted to everyone not to let them get close to the fortress. Philip then ordered the soldiers to fire, and they released their arrows, striking the Empire's soldiers. However, their attack didn't even leave a scratch. Dalton noted that the Empire soldiers were just deflecting the arrows, and he calmly explained to Dalton that ordinary weapons wouldn't even scratch the Empire's soldiers. Dalton asked what they were going to do about them and if he had a plan. He replied that of course he had a plan but needed a bit of help. He asked Dalton what he thought about it and if he was up for it. Dalton replied yes, because that was what he was there for. He then told Dalton that they should proceed with the plan. One of the Empire's soldiers launched its sharp claw, attacking the fortress and causing it to shake, and the soldiers panicked. However, Philip shouted to them to stand their ground and ordered the spearmen to move forward. Jack laughingly observed them and said they really thought they'd be safe just by camping in that fort. Jack then shouted that he would show them what happened when they fought against the Empire, and that he would destroy their fort. However, Jack was stunned in shock when he saw Raoul and Dalton jumping off the fort, and Dalton slashed at the Empire soldier in the front. 
Dalton was shocked to see that the Empire soldier didn't even flinch. The Empire soldiers then shouted in anger while facing them, and Dalton cursed when he realized his sword was no good against them because they were too tough. He agreed with Dalton and said it wouldn't be easy. Jack teasingly asked if they had come there instead of defending their fort and shouted to them that it was a great plan, and he respected their foolishness. Dalton, increasingly annoyed, told him that Jack's words were becoming more annoying than those monsters and asked if they were just going to listen to Jack's trash talk. He calmly replied that they would definitely not be willing to listen, and the Empire soldier was shocked to see his mana sword as he told Dalton that they should shut Jack up. Dalton smiles, activating his sword's mana as well. He then asks if he understood correctly that he was allowed to do whatever he wanted, adding that this was all he needed to know. As an Empire soldier dashes toward them to attack, they both charge to meet it, slashing at the soldier and causing its blood to splatter everywhere while it growls in pain. They then leap towards other Empire soldiers, defeating them instantly, leaving Jack unable to believe what he was witnessing. He dashes to the right, eliminating another Empire soldier with a single slash of his mana sword. Meanwhile, Dalton mirrors his actions, stunning Jack with shock and anger. The soldiers in the fortress cheer for their master's victory over the Empire's mana soldiers. Dalton sighs in relief, remarking on the close call, and taunts the masked men, questioning their silence and if that was all they had. He mocks their cries for the Emperor as mere pretense, suggesting their loyalty wavers without their mana soldiers. Jack, infuriated by the taunt, smiles, saying things were getting interesting and that he was looking forward to some fun. He then tells him he'll be sending his regards to his family, implying a fatal encounter. Dalton recognizes Jack as a commander of the Empire, suggesting he is stronger than the monsters they've faced, and offers his help. However, he declines, stating he can handle Jack himself. He then points out that Dalton has his own opponent to face. Dalton turns to see a huge flail breaking the ground, wielded by a half-man, half-mana soldier. He comments on the man's smaller size but notes he is armed, questioning if Dalton can handle him. Dalton defiantly responds, questioning if him if has forgotten who he is and his family name, assuring him not to worry and to focus on teaching that Jack guy a lesson. He smiles, acknowledging that Dalton is Templeton's grandson and, despite this being Dalton's first real combat experience, he trusts him completely. He then approaches Jack, assuring him his back is covered and asking if they should conclude their battle. Apologizing for the wait, he confidently tells Jack to bring it on. Jack addresses him as the young master of the Ashton family and inquires about his name. He replies that his name is Raoul. Jack remarks that his family is well known throughout the Empire and he had heard that his family used greatswords, but it appears that was not the case. Raoul sighed, thinking Jack talked too much and resembled a gorilla, but he knew he couldn't underestimate Jack. Despite Jack's appearance, his stats and level were on par with a typical advanced sword expert, making him the strongest enemy Raoul had faced so far. He observed that Jack was 44 years old, level 81, an advanced sword expert with potential talent grade A, strengths including 79 in strength, 77 in agility, 73 in stamina, 71 in intelligence, 61 in willpower, 73 in mana, 68 in senses, and unique traits like narcissism with grade C+, bloodbath with grade A-, and quick-witted with grade B. Jack exclaimed that encountering two noble families' young masters was a jackpot, and suggested they see what they've got. After assessing Jack's status, Raoul recognized Jack's stable stats along with power armor, acknowledging the need to stay alert. Yet, he smiled, thinking about his steady level ups and the investments in his gear. He then thought proudly about demonstrating what a reincarnated and overgeared player could achieve. Jack commended Raoul for his proficiency with the Mana Blade, suggesting he was not just a pampered young master and that the duel might be thrilling. Jack then infused his sword with Mana, taunting Raoul not to expect any leniency. He leaped towards Raoul, derisively calling him Noble Kid and warning him not to cry when defeated by a single swing. However, Raoul calmly met Jack's attack with a swing of his own blade, resulting in a loud explosion. Meanwhile, the soldier with the flail launched a powerful attack at Dalton, who managed to block it with his swords, albeit shaken by the force. As the soldier prepared to attack again, Dalton noted the soldier's strength, but countered with a forward swing of his sword. Unexpectedly, the soldier blocked his attack with a shield, leaving Dalton surprised and pondering if the soldier knew his shield would shatter upon blocking a mana blade. The soldier swung its flail at him, but fortunately, he jumped away in time to dodge it. Cursing, he realized the soldier possessed some intelligence and that this battle wouldn't be easy. Glaring at the soldier, he thought about the consequences of fleeing rather than facing the Empire, certain that the old man wouldn't leave him alone. His gaze then shifted to Raoul, who was engaged in a face-to-face -face battle with Jack, wondering if Raoul was managing alright and noticing that Raoul's fight seemed more challenging than his own. Meanwhile, Raoul's sword clashed with Jack's, prompting Jack to laughingly commend him for not being bad and being quite good at imitation. 
but suggesting that was the extent of it. Jack forcefully pushed him away. He realized Jack's fast and strong attacks meant any gap shown could be his downfall. Jack quickly dashes in front of him for another attack, shocking Raoul, but he managed to block Jack's sword at the last second, exerting all his strength not to be pushed back. Raoul then slightly released his sword and quickly maneuvered around to push Jack back, but Jack only laughed with excitement, exclaiming that the fight was far better than expected, almost lamenting the need to kill him. Jack taunted Raoul to resist harder, mocking the kingdom folks for only being able to resist. Raoul couldn't believe Jack was still talking, feeling mentally taxed. But he recognized that the main issue was the longer and more brutal the fight became, the more his weapon, Rignator, shook. Releasing Rignator could defeat Jack instantly, but it risked harming his allies due to his inability to fully control it. Thus, Raoul knew he needed to bide time and keep them engaged until their plan was fully executed. Then, Bernard's voice came through the system, asking Raoul if he could hear him and reporting that the situation was resolved. They had successfully rescued the hostages and defeated the enemy. The plan was a success. Raoul smiled at this news, leading Jack to angrily inquire why he was smiling, questioning if he had given up and what had happened to his rescue plan, especially when they seemed to be hiding behind the fort. However, Jack was taken aback when Raoul released a strong blue aura, halting Jack in confusion. Raoul informed Jack that the rescue plan had been in progress all along and, with its success, it was time for them to engage in a real fight. He teasingly challenged Jack to try again, calling him an empire's fool. Previously, in the f rank gate, Marco was catching his breath, exhausted, when a man in a mask remarked that he had heard the kingdom's nobles were cowards, except for a few families, and he guessed it was true. The man mocked Austin for shaking like a rat despite being surrounded by his knights, calling it a beautiful view. Marco urged Austin to stay calm and focused in such moments, but inwardly, Marco was cursing because he hadn't anticipated the Empire's involvement and realized they had fallen into a trap. Marco also doubted their chances of survival. The masked man declared they wouldn't kill them if they didn't resist. Yet their choice to resist made Marco glare at him in anger. The man then coldly stated Austin was sufficient as a hostage and they could kill everyone else, shocking Austin. He ordered his men to capture Austin and kill the rest. As the men advanced, Austin was horrified, but Marco was determined to fight. Suddenly, a swarm of arrows struck down every masked man approaching them. In surprise, the masked man, Austin, and Marco looked back to see Pierce, Bernard, Josh, and Philip calling out the masked men as the Empire's dogs, questioning their audacity to intrude into their kingdom. The masked man, taken aback, stutteringly inquired about their identities. Josh cut down a man in his path, Pierce took out another from afar with his arrows, Bernard utilized his psychokinesis to lift men into the air, and Jake was engaged in slaying every Empire soldier with his sword. The masked man was astonished at how effortlessly they defeated the mana soldier, noting Jake didn't even wield a mana blade. Jake admitted to overheating and unintentionally killing them all, questioning if that meant he could eliminate the rest. Marco informed Austin that Jake was from the Bear Knights, suggesting the first knights had arrived for their rescue. Austin, overwhelmed with fear and kneeling on the ground, stutteringly asked Marco about the first knights. Then, someone inquired from behind Austin what was wrong with him and why his knees were weak causing Austin to turn in shock and see Josh criticizing Austin's lack of courage to Pierce, labeling it pathetic. He remarked that not every young master was like theirs, to which Pierce suggested finding a more worthy comparison. Austin was astonished that with only a few soldiers, they had taken down those monstrous creatures and the Empire's elites equipped with power armor, leading him to ponder if these were indeed Rawl Ashton's first knights. It was at this moment Bernard reported to Raoul that the rescue operation was successful, and the enemy had been defeated, the plan had worked perfectly. Back on the hill, Jack inquired about what he had just said. He explained that the hostages had already been rescued, and it was straightforward since Jack had concentrated all his forces there. He mocked Jack for capturing the hostages only to then focus on attacking the fortress, sarcastically questioning if Jack had forgotten their true objective. He further taunted Jack, asking if he really thought he had perfectly planned everything, revealing the truth that Jack was the one who had fallen into a trap. Jack, irritated but smiling, acknowledged his realization. Jack then pierced his sword into the ground, declaring that meticulous planning wasn't his style. He began removing his armor, questioning the fun in hiding and setting traps. As he raised his sword, a shock went through him upon seeing Jack's bare arms. Jack suggested he stick to his own style and queried his thoughts on the matter. Then, revealing his true power and aura, Jack declared with a shout that they had nothing left to worry about and it was time for a real battle. He noticed Jack unleashing the Shadow Clipper, a formidable great sword skill often used by Imperial Knights. It was a unique technique featuring an ominous blade that slashed in unpredictable, irregular patterns. Eager for Jack to employ this move, he watched as Jack gripped his sword, signaling the start of their duel. 
Jack charged, unleashing a powerful swing. Fortunately, he blocked it, but Jack's relentless assaults forced him to defend himself from every direction. Jack mockingly commented on his defensive stance, questioning where his confidence had gone. He coolly replied with percentages, gradually counting up from 40 to 50 to 70 and finally to 90. When he reached 100%, he unleashed a mighty swing towards Jack, surprising him with the power of his blade. Though Jack managed to block the strike, the power enveloped Jack's sword, causing him to stutteringly question the nature of the attack. He responded that it was a copycat technique and assured Jack he would utilize it effectively. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video, comment part 8 in the comments section. Also, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.